In a world driven by technology, machine learning engineers are like architects of intelligent systems. They specialize in creating algorithms that learn from data, enabling computers to make decisions, predictions without explicit programming. From powerful virtual assistants to detecting fraud and financial transactions, their work touches nearly every aspect of our digital lives. So if you're fascinated by the idea of teaching machines to think and learn, then exploring the field of machine learning engineering could be your gateway to the forefront of innovation. With that being said, hello everyone and welcome to this video on Machine Learning Engineer Full Course by Edureka. Before we get started, let's take a moment to outline the agenda for today's session. We'll start by understanding what machine learning is, followed by supervised, unsupervised and reinforced machine learning techniques. Next, we'll explore the path to becoming machine learning engineer. Then, we'll explore with the essential algorithms like linear regression, logistic regression and decision trees. Moving on, we'll get a hands-on experience with the random forest and k-nearest neighbors which is KNN algorithms. Next, we'll cover the classification techniques such as naive phase classifier and support vector machines. After that, we'll discuss clustering algorithms like k-means and agglomerator. We'll touch upon the key concepts such as linear algebra, probability and statistics in machine learning. We'll also learn how the cloud-based machine learning platforms like Azure and AWS. Lastly, we'll highlight essential skills for machine learning engineer and top tools and frameworks used in this field. Then we'll conclude this full course by frequently asked machine learning interview questions and answers. But before we begin, please consider subscribing to our YouTube channel and hit the bell icon to stay updated on the latest tech content from Edureka. Also visit the Edureka website for the AI and machine learning master's course, the link to which is given in the description box below. As you know, we are living in a world of humans and machines. The humans have been evolving and learning from the past experience since millions of years. On the other hand, the era of machines and robots have just begun. In today's world, these machines or the robots are like they need to be programmed before they actually follow your instructions. But what if the machines started to learn on their own? And this is where machine learning comes into picture. Machine learning is the core of many futuristic technological advancement in our world. Today, you can see various examples or implementation of machine learning around us, such as Tesla's self-driving car, Apple Siri, Sophia AI robot, and many more are there. So what exactly is machine learning? Well, machine learning is a subfield of artificial intelligence that focuses on the design of system that can learn from and make decisions and predictions based on the experience, which is data in the case of machines. Machine learning enables computer to act and make data driven decisions rather than being explicitly programmed to carry out a certain task. These programs are designed to learn and improve over time when exposed to new data. Let's move on and discuss one of the biggest confusion of the people in the world. They think that all the three of them, the AI, the machine learning and the deep learning all are same. You know what? They are wrong. Let me clarify things for you. Artificial intelligence is a broader concept of machines being able to carry out tasks in a smarter way. It covers anything which enables the computer to behave like humans. Think of a famous Turing test to determine whether a computer is capable of thinking like a human being or not. If you're talking to Siri on your phone and you get an answer, you're already very close to it. So this was about the artificial intelligence. Now coming to the machine learning part. So as I already said, machine learning is a subset or a current application of AI. It is based on the idea that we should be able to give machine the access to data and let them learn from themselves. It's a subset of artificial intelligence that deals with the extraction of pattern from data set. This means that the machine can not only find the rules for optimal behavior, but also can adapt to the changes in the world. Many of the algorithms involved have been known for decades, centuries even. Thanks to the advances in the computer science and parallel computing, they can now scale up to massive data volumes. So this was about the machine learning part. Now coming over to deep learning. Deep learning is a subset of machine learning where similar machine learning algorithm are used to train deep neural network so as to achieve better accuracy in those cases where former was not performing up to the mark, right? I hope now you understood that machine learning AI and deep learning all three are different. Okay, moving on ahead. 
Let's see in general how a machine learning work. One of the approaches is where the machine learning algorithm is trained using a labeled or unlabeled training data set to produce a model. New input data is introduced to the machine learning algorithm and it make prediction based on the model. The prediction is evaluated for accuracy and if the accuracy is acceptable, the machine learning algorithm is deployed. Now if the accuracy is not acceptable, the machine learning algorithm is trained again and again with an augmented training data set. This was just an high level example as there are many more factor and other steps involved in it. Now let's move on and subcategorize the machine learning into three different types. The supervised learning, unsupervised learning and reinforcement learning. And let's see what each of them are, how they work and how each of them is used in the field of banking, healthcare, retail and other domains. Don't worry, I'll make sure that I use enough examples and implementation of all three of them to give you a proper understanding of it. So starting with supervised learning. What is it? So let's see a mathematical definition of supervised learning. Supervised learning is where you have input variables X and an output variable Y. And you use an algorithm to learn the mapping function from the input to the output. That is Y equal FX. The goal is to approximate the mapping function so well that whenever you have a new input data X, you could predict the output variable that is Y for that data. Right. I think uh, this was confusing for you. Let me simplify the definition of supervised learning. So we can rephrase the understanding of the mathematical definition as a machine learning method where each instances of a training data set is composed of different input attribute and an expected output. The input attributes of a training data set can be of any kind of data. It can be a pixel of image. It can be a value of a database row or it can even be an audio frequency histogram, right? For each input instance an expected output value is associated. The value can be discrete representing a category or can be a real or continuous value. In either case the algorithm learns the input pattern that generate the expected output. Now once the algorithm is trained it can be used to predict the correct output of a never seen input. You can see an image on your screen right in this image you can see that we are feeding raw inputs as image of Apple to the algorithm. As a part of the algorithm, we have a supervisor who keeps on correcting the machine or who keeps on training the machine. It keeps on telling him that yes, it is an apple and no, it is not an apple. Things like that. So this process keeps on repeating until we get a final trained model. Once the model is ready, it can easily predict the correct output of a never seen input. In this slide, you can see that we are giving an image of a green apple to the machine and the machine can easily identify it as yes, it is an apple and it is giving the correct result, right? Let me make things more clearer to you. Let's discuss another example of it. So in this slide, the image shows an example of a supervised learning process used to produce a model which is capable of recognizing the ducks in the image. The training data set is composed of labeled picture of ducks and non ducks. The result of supervised learning process is a predictive model which is capable of associating a label duck or not duck to the new image presented to the model. Now once trained the resulting predictive model can be deployed to the production environment. You can say a mobile app for example. Once deployed it is ready to recognize the new pictures. Right now you might be wondering why this category of machine learning is named as supervised learning. Well it is called as supervised learning because the process of an algorithm learning from the training data set can be thought of as a teacher supervising the learning process. If we know the correct answers. The algorithm iteratively makes while predicting on the training data and is corrected by the teacher. The learning stops when the algorithm achieves an acceptable level of performance. Now let's move on and see some of the popular supervised learning algorithm. So we have linear regression, random forest and support vector machines. These are just for your information. We'll discuss about these algorithms in our next video. Now let's see some of the popular use cases of supervised learning. So we have Cortana. Cortana or any other speech automation in your mobile phone trains using your voice and once trained it start working based on that training. This is an application of supervised learning. Suppose you are telling OK Google call Sam or you say hey Siri call Sam. You get an answer to it and the action is performed and automatically a call goes to Sam. So these are just an example of supervised learning. Next comes the weather app. Based on some of the prior knowledge like when it is sunny the temperature is higher when it is cloudy humidity is higher any kind of that they predict the parameters for a given time. So this is also an example of supervised learning 
as you are feeding the data to the machine and telling that whenever it is sunny the temperature should be higher whenever it is cloudy the humidity should be higher so it's an example of supervised learning another example is biometric attendance where you train the machine and after a couple of inputs of your biometric identity be it your thumb your iris or your earlobe or anything once trained the machine can validate your future input and can identify you next comes in the field of banking sector in banking sector supervised learning is used to predict the credit worthiness of a credit card holder by building a machine learning model to look for faulty attributes by providing it with a data on delinquent and non delinquent customers next comes the healthcare sector in the healthcare sector it is used to predict the patient's readmission rates by building a regression model by providing data on the patient's treatment administration and readmissions to show variables that best correlate with readmission next comes the retail sector in retail sector it is used to analyze the product that a customer buy together it does this by building a supervised model to identify frequent item sets and association rule from the transactional data now let's learn about the next category of machine learning the unsupervised part mathematically unsupervised learning is where you only have input data x and no corresponding output variable the goal for unsupervised learning is to model the underlying structure or distribution in the data in order to learn more about the data so let me rephrase you this in simple terms in unsupervised learning approach the data instances of a training data set do not have an expected output associated to them instead unsupervised learning algorithm detects pattern based on init characteristics of the input data an example of machine learning task that applies unsupervised learning is clustering in this task similar data instances are grouped together in order to identify clusters of data in this slide you can see that initially we have different varieties of fruits as input now these set of fruits as input x are given to the model now once the model is trained using unsupervised learning algorithm the model will create clusters on the basis of its training it will group the similar fruits and make their cluster let me make things more clearer to you let's take another example of it so in this slide the image below shows an example of unsupervised learning process this algorithm processes an unlabeled training data set and based on the characteristics it groups the picture into three different clusters of data despite the ability of grouping similar data into clusters the algorithm is not capable to add labels to the group the algorithm only knows which data instances are similar but it cannot identify the meaning of this group so now you might be wondering why this category of machine learning is named as unsupervised learning so these are called as unsupervised learning because unlike supervised learning ever there are no correct answer and there is no teacher algorithms are left on their own to discover and present the interesting structure in the data let's move on and see some of the popular unsupervised learning algorithm so we have here k means a priori algorithm and hierarchical clustering again these are just for your information sake we'll discuss about these algorithms in our next video now let's move on and see some of the examples of unsupervised learning suppose a friend invites you to his party and where you meet totally strangers now you'll classify them using unsupervised learning as you don't have any prior knowledge about them and this classification can be done on the basis of gender age group dressing educational qualification or whatever way you might like now why this learning is different from supervised learning since you didn't use any past or prior knowledge about the people you kept on classifying them on the go as they kept on coming you kept on classifying them yeah this category of people belong to this group this category of people belong to that group and so on okay Let's see one more example. Let's suppose you have never seen a football match before and by chance you watch a video on the internet. Now you can easily classify the players on the basis of different criterion like player wearing the same kind of jersey are in one class, player wearing different kind of jersey are in different class. Or you can classify them on the basis of their playing style like the guy is an attacker so he's in one class. He's a defender, he's in another class. Or you can classify them whatever way you observe the things. So this was also an example of unsupervised learning. Let's move on and see how unsupervised learning is used in the sectors of banking, healthcare and retail. So starting with banking sector. So in banking sector it is used to segment customers by behavioral characteristic by surveying prospects and customers to develop multiple segments using clustering. In healthcare sector it is used to categorize the MRI data by normal or abnormal images. 
it uses deep learning techniques to build a model that learns from different features of images to recognize a different pattern next is the retail sector in retail sector it is used to recommend the products to customer based on their past purchases it does this by building a collaborative filtering model based on the past purchases by them i assume you guys now have a proper idea of what unsupervised learning means if you have any slightest doubt don't hesitate and add your doubt to the comment section so let's discuss the third and the last type of machine learning that is reinforcement learning so what is reinforcement learning well reinforcement learning is a type of machine learning algorithm which allows software agents and machine to automatically determine the ideal behavior within a specific context to maximize its performance the reinforcement learning is about interaction between two elements the environment and the learning agent the learning agent leverages two mechanism namely exploration and exploitation when learning agent acts on trial and error basis it is termed as exploration and when it acts based on the knowledge gained from the environment it is referred to as exploitation now this environment rewards the agent for correct actions which is reinforcement signal leveraging the rewards obtained the agent improves its environment knowledge to select the next action in this image you can see that the machine is confused whether it is an apple or it's not an apple then the machine is trained using reinforcement learning if it makes correct decision it get rewards point for it and in case of wrong it gets a penalty for that once the training is done now the machine can easily identify which one of them is an apple Let's see an example. Here we can see that we have an agent who has to judge from the environment to find out which of the two is a duck. The first task he did is to observe the environment. Next, he selects some action using some policy. It seems that the machine has made a wrong decision by choosing a bunny as a duck. So the machine will get penalty for it. For example, minus 50 point for a wrong answer. Right. Now the machine will update its policy and this will continue till the machine gets an optimal policy. from the next time machine will know that bunny is not a duck let's see some of the use cases of reinforcement learning but before that let's see how pavlo trained his dog using reinforcement learning or how he applied the reinforcement method to train his dog pavlo integrated learning in four stages initially pavlo gave meat to his dog and in response to the meat the dog started salivating next what he did he created a sound with the bell for this the dog did not respond anything In the third part he tried to condition the dog by using the bell and then giving him the food seeing the food the dog started salivating eventually a situation came when the dog started salivating just after hearing the bell even if the food was not given to him as the dog was reinforced that whenever the master will ring the bell he will get the food now let's move on and see how reinforcement learning is applied in the field of banking healthcare and retail sector so starting with the banking sector In banking sector reinforcement learning is used to create a next best offer model for a call center by building a predictive model that learns over time as user accept or reject offer made by the sales staff fine now in healthcare sector it is used to allocate the scarce medical resources to handle different type of er cases by building a mark of decision process that learns treatment strategies for each type of er case next and the last comes the retail sector So let's see how reinforcement learning is applied to retail sector. In retail sector, it can be used to reduce excess stock with dynamic pricing by building a dynamic pricing model that adjusts the price based on customer response to the offers. Let's understand how data science came into existence. Do you guys remember when most of the data was stored in excel sheets? There were simpler times because we generated lesser data. and the data was quite structured back then we used simple bi or business intelligent tools to analyze and process the data but times have changed over 2.5 quintillion bytes of data is created every single day and this number is only going to grow from here it is estimated that by 2020 1.7 mb of data will be created every second for every person on earth can you imagine how much data that is how are we going to process this much data Not only that the data generated these days is mostly unstructured or semi structured so in order to process such data we need more complex and effective algorithms we need a more advanced field this is exactly where data science comes in data science is all about uncovering findings from data 
by exploring data at a granular level to mine and understand complex behaviors, trends, and inferences in the data. It's about surfacing hidden insights that can help enable companies to make smarter business decisions. For example, I'm sure all of you have binge watched on Netflix. Now, Netflix data mines movie viewing patterns of its users to understand what drives user interest. And then it uses this data to make decisions on which Netflix series to produce. Similarly, there is Target. Now, Target identifies each customer's shopping behaviors by drawing out patterns from their database. All right, this helps them uh, make better marketing decisions. So, guys, before we start comparing between machine learning and data science, let's try to understand the different fields which are covered under data science. Now, data science covers a wide spectrum of domains, including artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning. Data science uses various AI, machine learning, and deep learning methodologies in order to analyze data and then extract useful insights from it. To make things more clear, let me define these terms for you. So artificial intelligence is basically a subset of data science, which lets machines to stimulate human-like behavior. Okay, so they try to mimic human-like behavior. Machine learning, on the other hand, is a subfield of artificial intelligence which provides machines the ability to learn automatically and then improve from experiences without being explicitly programmed or without any human intervention. Now, deep learning is a part of machine learning that uses various computational measures and algorithms inspired by the structure and function of the brain called the artificial neural networks. So guys, to conclude, data science involves the extraction of knowledge from data. And in order to do so, it uses a bunch of different methods from various disciplines like machine learning, artificial intelligence, and deep learning. A point to note here is that data science is a wider field and does not exclusively rely on these techniques. Okay, there's a lot more to data science. And in fact, there's a lot more to machine learning, AI, and deep learning than just the data science part. All right. Now that you have a clear distinction between AI, machine learning, and deep learning, let's discuss the use case. Okay, here we'll be uh, seeing how data science and machine learning is used in the working of recommendation engines. So before we start off by comparing data science and machine learning, let's look at what exactly a recommendation engine is. So I'm sure all of you have used Amazon for online shopping. Okay, so guys, have you noticed that when you look for a particular item on Amazon, you get recommendations of similar products, right? So how does Amazon know this? How does it show you items which are relevant to your interests? The reason why companies like Amazon, Walmart, and Netflix are doing so well is because of how they handle the user-generated data. All of these companies are data-driven companies. So the key to their business has always been data, and that's the reason why they're growing so much. Now, a recommendation system basically filters down a list of choices for each user based on their browsing history, based on their ratings, based on their profile details, transactional details, card details, and so on. Now, such a system is used to get useful insights about customers' shopping patterns. It provides every user a particular view of the e-commerce website based on their profile, okay? And it allows them to select relevant products. For example, if you're looking uh, for a new laptop on Amazon, there is a possibility that you might want to buy a laptop bag too. Now, Amazon will decide this possibility by studying the details of similar transactions. All right, it maps similar uh, transactions together and then it suggests relevant items to you. All right, now let's see how data science and machine learning are used to build a recommendation engine. So guys, this is the entire data science lifecycle. Now, it starts off with the business requirements. Now, before you even start on a data science project, it is very important that you understand the problem that you're trying to solve. All right, so in this stage, you're just going to identify the central objective of your project. In our case, the objective is to build a recommendation engine that will suggest relevant items to each customer based on the data generated by them. Now, the second stage is data acquisition or data gathering. So after you define the objectives of your project, it's time to start gathering the data. This process is also known as data mining. Data mining is basically the process of gathering your data from different sources. Now, one more thing to note here is that data sources can be of two types. There is explicit data and implicit data. Now, when it comes to a recommendation engine, the explicit data includes all the data which is entered by the users, such as the user's ratings and comments on the products. 
Implicit data is the purchase history, like your card details, your search history, and all of that comes under implicit data. Now, collecting such data is easy because the users uh, don't have to do any extra work since they're already using this application. All right. Now, the next phase after data acquisition is data processing or data cleaning. So, guys, usually you never have data stored directly in a database. Okay. If you're very lucky, only then that's going to happen. Otherwise, you'll need to scrape the data. All right. This is where you transform your data into the desired formats so that you can read it. Now, data cleaning is considered one of the most time consuming tasks in data science. According to a recent survey, it was found out that about 50 to 80 percent of the time goes in data cleaning. All right. This can be a very tedious task because you don't know what are the relevant items and what are the missing values. OK, so you have to remove all the irrelevant items or all of the inconsistent data. OK, these inconsistencies have to be identified and fixed in this stage itself. For example, if you're filtering the needful logs from the less needful ones, or if you're trying to identify fake reviews, or if you're trying to remove unnecessary comments or missing values, all of that is dealt with in this stage. All right. So after you're done with your data cleaning and your data processing, your next stage is the data exploration. This is a very critical stage because here you try to understand the patterns in your data and you try to retrieve any useful insights. Now, in our case, since each user might have a different taste or they might have a different opinion about an item, their respective data sets will be different. OK, so each user will have a different data set depending on his likes and his dislikes. This is how you perform data exploration over here. You need to find patterns or behaviors of a particular customer and such information is used to grow the business. So only after you know what a customer likes or dislikes, you'll be able to suggest or recommend something to them. All right. This is exactly how data exploration works when it comes to a recommendation engine. You're just going to study the shopping behavior of each customer and then try and suggest relevant items to each customer. All right. Now let's move on to the next stage, which is the data modeling stage. So guys, there's this one important thing I want to tell you all. There is no actual distinction between data science and machine learning. In fact, machine learning is a method which is used by data science in order to retrieve useful information. All right. So there's no actual distinction between them, but they do have different processes or they do have different steps in the processes. So the next stage that I'm going to talk about in the data science lifecycle is known as modeling. And at this data modeling stage is where you incorporate machine learning. All right. So basically the entire data modeling stage is the machine learning process. OK, so let's look at the machine learning process. So guys, the five stages that I've defined over here are basically the steps in the data modeling phase. OK, now in the data modeling phase is where machine learning is implemented. So let's look at how machine learning works. OK, step by step. So there are five uh, distinctive stages in machine learning. It begins with importing your data. So guys, the data that we already gathered in the previous stages, you're going to import that data for the machine learning process. Now this data has to be in a readable format. OK, it can be in the table format or you can also use formats like the comma separated versions. All right. After you've imported the data, the next step is data cleaning. Now I know that we already performed data processing and data cleaning. But guys, data cleaning is a very iterative process. You cannot just clean everything at once. You'll have to do this repetitively and iteratively. So after you import the data, you might notice a lot of duplicate values or a lot of missing or null values. So such inconsistencies in the data can cause wrongful predictions. OK, and they have to be dealt with or they have to be removed at this stage itself. Now, the next stage in uh, machine learning is creating a model. Over here, you perform the data splicing. Now, data splicing is basically splitting the data set into two sets. One is for training your model and the other is for testing your model. OK, after this, you build the model by using the training data set. Now, how do you create these models? These models are nothing but your machine learning algorithms like k nearest neighbor algorithm, support vector machines, linear regression and so on. So for a problem statement like a uh, recommendation engine, you can make use of clustering and classification algorithms. All right. You can make use of the K nearest neighbor or the K means algorithm. So after you've built the algorithm and you've built your model, your next stage is going to be model training. So over here, the machine learning model is trained on the training data set. Earlier, I told you that we perform data splicing wherein we split the data set into the training set and the testing set. So in model training, obviously you're going to use the training data set. 
Also, let me tell you that a large portion of the data set is used for training so that the model can learn to map the input to the output on a set of varied values. Next step in machine learning is the model testing. Now, after you've trained the model, it is then evaluated by using the testing data set. At this stage, the model is fed new data points and it must predict the outcome by running the new data points on the machine learning model that was built in the earlier stage. Now, the last stage is improving the efficiency of the model. Right, so after you create the model and you evaluate it using the testing data, its accuracy is calculated. So guys, a lot of methods can be used for improving the accuracy. You can make use of cross validation techniques and all of that. So after you improve the accuracy and the efficiency of your model, you can finally come back to the last phase of the data lifecycle, which is deployment and optimization. Okay, so the aim of this stage is basically to deploy the model into the production environment. So basically, this is your endpoint wherein you deploy the recommendation engine on your e-commerce website or on any sort of data-driven website. All right. So apart from uh, deploying it to production, you must also check the performance of your model. Okay. So the users must validate the performance of the model. And if there are any issues with the model, then the issues have to be fixed in this stage itself. All right. So guys, that was it for our use case. We basically studied the entire data science lifecycle and the machine learning process. So guys, I want to conclude that data science and machine learning are interconnected. Okay, since machine learning is a part of data science, there isn't much comparison between them. Okay, they are separate cycles, but they are used together. Okay, so machine learning aids data science by providing a suit of algorithms for data modeling, for decision making, or even data preparation. Okay, on the other hand, data science, what it does is it stitches together a bunch of ideas or a bunch of algorithms drawn from machine learning to create a basic solution. Who is a machine learning engineer? Machine learning engineers are sophisticated programmers who develop machines and systems that can learn and apply knowledge without any specific direction. So they're basically just enthusiastic computer programmers but their focus goes beyond specifically programming machines to perform tasks. So what they really do is they create programs that will enable machines to take actions without being specifically directed to perform those tasks. Now that we know who a machine learning engineer is, let us talk about what does an ML engineer do? Machine learning engineers are creators of the algorithms that allow a machine to find patterns in its own programming data, teaching it to understand commands and even think for itself. The artificial intelligence seen in automatic vacuums and self-driving cars is the thought children of these engineers. Researching new technologies and implementing them in machine learning programs is one of the many tasks that a machine learning engineer does. Finding the best design and hardware to use when building the robot or computer, developing tangible prototypes to show stakeholders, and also putting the machines through various number of rigorous tests to ensure their function is planned. So by now you must have an idea about what they do and who they are. So now let us understand what are the skills needed to become an ML engineer. The first most important skill is the programming skill. Computer science fundamentals are extremely important for machine learning engineers. They include data structures, algorithms, computability and complexity, and even computer architecture. You must be able to apply, implement, adapt or address them when programming. Practice problems, coding competitions, and hackathons are a great way to hone your skills. So some of the programming languages that you must be familiar with is R language, Python, Java programming. So R language here is basically used for developing statistical software and data analysis, whereas Python lets you create, analyze, and organize large chunks of data with ease. Also, Java helps in data description. Moving on, the next important skill is probability and statistics. A formal characterization of probability and techniques derived from it are at the heart of many machine learning algorithms. These are a means to deal with uncertainty in the real world. Closely related to this field is of statistics, which provides various measures like mean, median, variance, etc. Also distributions like uniform, normal, binomial, etc and analysis methods like hypothesis testing that are necessary for building and validating models from observed data is extremely important. 
Many machine learning algorithms are essentially extensions of statistical modeling procedures. Moving on, the next skill that is really important is understanding data modeling and evaluation. Now, what is data modeling? Data modeling is simply the process of estimating the underlying structure of a given data set with the goal of finding useful patterns like correlations, clusters, etc., and predicting properties of previously unseen instances. A key part of this estimation process is continually evaluating how good a given model is. Depending on the task at hand, you will need to choose an appropriate accuracy or error measure, example log loss for classification, sum of squared errors for regression, etc., and also an evaluation strategy like testing, training, split, sequential versus randomized cross-validation, etc. Iterative learning algorithms often directly utilize resulting errors to tweak the model. Examples are backpropagation for neural networks, so understanding these measures is very important even for just applying standard algorithms. So also applying machine learning algorithms and different libraries are very important. Standard implementations of machine learning algorithms are widely available through libraries or packages or APIs. Some of the examples are TensorFlow, Scikit-Learn, but applying them effectively involves choosing a suitable model like the decision tree, nearest neighbor, neural net, etc. Also, a learning procedure to fit the data, as well as understanding how hyperparameters affect learning is really important. You also need to be aware of the relative advantages and disadvantages of different approaches and also understand how biases and variance works, overfitting and underfitting work, all of the basics of machine learning and how do you apply them. Data science and machine learning challenges such as those on Kaggle are a great way to get exposed to different kinds of problems. Also, to become an ML engineer, you need to understand how software engineering and system design works. So at the end of the day, a machine learning engineer's typical output or deliverable is software. And often it is a very small component that fits into a larger ecosystem of products and services. You need to understand how these different pieces work together, communicate with them, and build appropriate interfaces for your component that others will eventually depend on. Careful system design may be necessary to avoid bottlenecks and let your algorithms scale well with increasing volumes of data. Software engineering best practices, including requirements analysis, system design, modularity, version control, testing, documentation, etc., are invaluable for productivity, collaboration, quality, and maintainability. Now that we have discussed the skills needed to become an ML engineer, let us look at some of the major roles and responsibilities. Now, the first and most important role is to create artificial intelligent products for the team. Well, this is achieved when we are able to create machine learning models of our own, right? What's more important is that we need to build efficient applications. The efficiency plays a really big role here. There are some responsibilities of a machine learning engineer, such as we need to be able to study some prototypes and then transform them into applications. We also have to be able to design and build our own machine learning systems. We have to be in a position where we put in some research to find the appropriate algorithms and tools necessary. And yes, we will be developing machine learning application based on what's required. Also, what's important is to select the right data set and to find the correct data representation methods. We also need to run machine learning tests and experiments to keep improving on our implementation for the use case. And lastly, we need to train the systems for top-notch accuracy but sometimes you will have to retrain them again based on the changes in the requirement. Well, this sure does seem like a lot for now, but it really isn't that complex. Once you start learning and begin cracking the basics, it's extremely simple. Moving on, let's see some of the salary and trends of a machine learning engineer. According to the 2019 Indeed report, the best jobs in the US and Indian market is the machine learning engineer. What's more interesting is that the role of an ML engineer recorded a whopping 344% increase since 2015. The average salary for a machine learning engineer in India is rupees 6 lakhs 89,460 rupees, whereas the average salary for a machine learning engineer in the United States of America is $112,000. So that's really a huge amount, right? 
Moving on, let's talk about some of the companies hiring machine learning engineers. The number of opportunities is exponentially growing and this is amazing because you'll be trending when you're a machine learning engineer and obviously you'll be paid really well. Everyone from Apple to Uber, Facebook to Salesforce, all these big players are on a constant ML engineers hiring spear and they obviously pay really high salaries for this. Now this takes us to the last part of today's session that is the future of machine learning. What is perhaps most compelling about machine learning is its seemingly limitless applicability. There are already so many fields being impacted by machine learning including education, finance, computer science and much more. There are also virtually no fields to which machine learning does not apply. In some cases machine learning techniques are in fact desperately needed. Healthcare is an obvious example. Machine learning techniques are already being applied to critical arenas within the healthcare sphere, impacting everyone from care variation reduction efforts to medical scan analysis. The world is unquestionably changing in rapid and dramatic ways, and the demand for machine learning engineers is going to keep increasing exponentially. The world's challenges are complex, and they will obviously require complex systems to solve them. Machine learning engineers are building these systems. If this is your future, then there's no time like the present to start mastering the skills and developing the mindset you're going to need to succeed. Let me connect you to the real life and tell you what all are the things which you can easily do using the concepts of machine learning. So you can easily get answer to the questions like which types of house lies in this segment or what is the market value of this house or is this a mail a spam or not a spam? Is there any fraud? Well, these were some of the questions you could ask to the machine. But for getting an answer to these, you need some algorithm. The machine need to train on the basis of some algorithm. Okay, but how will you decide which algorithm to choose and when? Okay, so the best option for us is to explore them one by one. So the first is classification algorithm, where the category is predicted using the data. If you have some question like, is this person a male or a female? Or is this a mail a spam or not a spam? Then these category of question would fall under the classification algorithm. Classification is a supervised learning approach in which the computer program learns from the input given to it and then uses this learning to classify new observation. Some examples of classification problems are speech recognition, handwriting recognition, biometric identification, document classification, etc. Shall we move ahead? Okay. So next is the anomaly detection algorithm where you identify the unusual data point. So what is anomaly detection? Well, it's a technique that is used to identify unusual pattern that do not conform to expected behavior or you can say the outliers. It has many application in business like intrusion detection like identifying strange patterns in the network traffic that could signal a hack or system health monitoring that is spotting a deadly tumor in the MRI scan or you can even use it for fraud detection credit card transaction or to deal with fault detection in operating environment. So next comes the clustering algorithm and you can use this clustering algorithm to group the data based on some similar condition. Now you can get answer to which type of houses lies in this segment or what type of customer buys this product. The clustering is a task of dividing the population or data points into number of groups such that the data point and the same groups are more similar to other data points in the same group than those in the other groups. In simple words, the aim is to segregate groups with similar trait and assign them into cluster. Now this clustering is a task of dividing the population or data points into a number of groups such that the data points in the X group is more similar to the other data points in the same group rather than those in the other group. In other words, the aim is to segregate the groups with similar traits and assign them into different clusters. Let's understand this with an example. Suppose you're the head of a rental store and you wish to understand the preference of your customer to scale up your business. So is it possible for you to look at the detail of each customer and design a unique business strategy for each of them? Definitely not, right? But what you can do is to cluster all your customer say into 10 different groups based on their purchasing habit and you can use a separate strategy for customers in each of these 10 different groups. And this is what we call clustering. Next we have regression algorithm where the data itself is predicted question you may ask to this type of model is like what is the market value of this house or is it going to rain tomorrow or not? 
So regression is one of the most important and broadly used machine learning and statistics tool. It allows you to make prediction from data by learning the relationship between the features of your data and some observed continuous valued response. Regression is used in a massive number of application. You know what stock prices prediction can be done using regression. Now you know about different machine learning algorithm. How will you decide which algorithm to choose and when? So let's cover this part using a demo. So in this demo part what we'll do we will create six different machine learning model and pick the best model and build the confidence such that it has the most reliable accuracy. So for our demo part we will be using the iris data set. This data set is quite very famous and is considered one of the best small project to start with. You can consider this as a hello world data set for machine learning. So this data set consists of 150 observation of iris flower. There are four columns of measurement of flowers in centimeters. The fifth column being the species of the flower observed. All the observed flowers belong to one of the three species of Iris setosa, Iris virginica, and Iris versicolor. Well, this is a good project because it is so well to understand. The attributes are numeric, so you have to figure out how to load and handle the data. It is a classification problem, thereby allowing you to practice with perhaps an easier type of supervised learning algorithm. It has only four attributes and 150 rows, meaning it is very small and can easily fit into the memory. And even all of the numeric attributes are in the same unit and the same scale. It means you do not require any special scaling or transformation to get started with. So let's start coding. And as I told earlier, for the demo part, I'll be using Anaconda with Python 3.0 install on it. So when you install Anaconda, how your navigator would look like. So this is my home page of my Anaconda navigator. On this, I'll be using the Jupyter Notebook, which is a web based interactive computing notebook environment, which will help me to write and execute my Python codes on it. So let's hit the launch button and execute our Jupyter Notebook. So as you can see that my Jupyter Notebook is starting on localhost 8890. Okay, so this is my Jupyter Notebook. What I'll do here, I'll select new notebook Python 3. This is my environment where I can write and execute all my Python codes on it. So let's start by checking the version of the libraries. In order to make this video short and more interactive and more informative, I've already done the set of code. So let me just copy and paste it down. I'll explain you then one by one. So let's start by checking the version of the Python libraries. Okay, so there's the code. Let's just copy it. Copied and let's paste it. Okay, first let me summarize things for you. What we are doing here, we are just checking the version of the different libraries. Starting with Python, we'll first check what version of Python we are working on, then we'll check what are the version of SciPy we are using, then NumPy, Matplotlib, then Panda, then scikit-learn. Okay? So let's execute the run button and see what are the various version of libraries which we are using. Hit the run. So we are working on Python 3.6.4, SciPy 1.0, NumPy 1.14, Matplotlib 2.12, Panda 0.22, and scikit-learn of version 0.19. Okay? So these are the version which I'm using. Ideally, your version should be more recent or it should match. But don't worry if you lag few versions behind as the APIs do not change so quickly. Everything in this tutorial will very likely still work for you. Okay, but in case you are getting an error stop and try to fix that error in case you are unable to find the solution for the error. Feel free to reach out Edureka even after this class. Let me tell you this. If you're not able to run the script properly, you will not be able to complete this tutorial. Okay, so whenever you get a doubt, reach out to Edureka and just resolve it. Now, if everything is working smoothly, then now it's the time to load the data set. So as I said, I'll be using the Iris flower data set for this tutorial. But before loading the data set, let's import all the modules function and the object which we are going to use in this tutorial. Same I've already written the set of code. So let's just copy and paste them. Let's load all the libraries. So these are the various libraries which we'll be using in our tutorial. So everything should work fine without an error. If you get an error, just stop. You need to work on your SciPy environment before you continue any further. So I guess everything should work fine. Let's hit the run button and see. Okay, it worked. So let's now move ahead and load the data. We can load the data direct from the UCI machine learning repository. First of all, let me tell you we are using Panda to load the data. Okay, so let's say my URL is this. So this is my URL for the UCI machine learning repository from where I'll be downloading the data set. Okay, now what I'll do I'll specify the name of each column when loading the data. This will help me later to explore the data. Okay, so I'll just copy and paste it down. Okay. So I'm defining a variable names which consist of various parameters including sepal and sepal width, petal length, petal width and class. So these are just the name of column from the data set. Okay. Now let's define the data set. 
So data set equals panda dot read underscore CSV inside that we are defining URL and the names that is equal to name. As I already said, we'll be using panda to load the data. All right. So we are using panda dot read CSV. So we are reading the CSV file and inside that from where that CSV is coming from the URL which URL. So this is my URL. Okay. Our names equal names. It's just specifying the names of that various columns in that particular CSV file. Okay. So let's move forward and execute it. So even our data set is loaded. In case you have some network issues, just go ahead and download the iris data file into your working directory and load it using the same method. But yeah, make sure that you change the URL to the local name or else you might get an error. Okay. Yeah, our data set is loaded. So let's move ahead and check our data set. Let's see how many columns or rows we have in our data set. Okay. So let's print the number of rows and columns in our data set. So our data set is data set dot shape. What this will do, it will just give you the numbers of total number of rows and total number of column, or you can say the total number of instances or attributes in your data set. Fine. So print data set dot shape. What you are getting 150 and 5. So 150 is the total number of rows in your data set, and 5 is the total number of columns. Fine. So moving on ahead, what if I want to see the sample data set? Okay. So let me just print the first 30 instances of the data set. Okay. So print data set dot head. What I want is the first 30 instances. Fine. This will give me the first 30 result of my data set. Okay. So when I hit the run button, what I'm getting is the first 30 result. Okay. 0 to 29. So this is how my sample data set looks like. Sepal length, sepal width, petal length, petal width, and the class. Okay. So this is how our data set looks like. Now let's move on and look at the summary of each attribute. What if I want to find out the count, mean, the minimum and the maximum values and some other percentiles as well. So what should I do then for that print data set dot describe what it will give. Let's see. So you can see that all the numbers are the same scales or similar range between zero to eight centimeters, right? The mean value, the standard deviation, the minimum value, the 25 percentile, 50 percentile, 75 percentile, the maximum value. All these values lies in the range between zero to eight centimeter. Okay. So what we just did is we just took a summary of each attribute. Now let's look at the number of instances that belong to each class. So for that, what we'll do print data set first of all. So let's print data set and I want to group it. Group by using class. And I want the size of it size of each class fine and let's hit the run. Okay, so what I want to do I want to print print what data set how I want to get it. I want it by class so group by class Okay, now I want the size of each class find the size of each class so group by class dot size Execute the run so you can see that I have 50 instances of iris setosa 50 instances of iris versicolo and 50 instances of iris virginica Okay, all are of data type integer of base 64 fine so now we have a basic idea of our data. Now let's move ahead and create some visualization for it. So for this we are going to create two different types of plot. First would be the univariate plot and the next would be the multivariate plot. So we'll be creating univariate plots to better understand about each attribute and the next will be creating the multivariate plot to better understand the relationship between different attributes. Okay, so we start with some univariate plot that is plot of each individual variable. So given that the input variables are numeric, we can create box and viscous plot for it. Okay, so let's move ahead and create a box and viscous plot. So data set dot plot what kind I want. It's a box. Okay, and do I need a subplot? Yeah, I need subplots for that. So subplots equal true. What type of layout do I want? So my layout structure is two cross two. Next, do I want to share my coordinates X and Y coordinates? No, I don't want to share it. So share X equal false. And even share y that two equals false. Okay, so we have here data set dot plot kind equal box. My subplots is true layout two cross two. And then what I want to do it, I want to see it. So plot dot show whatever I created, show it. Okay, execute it. Now this gives us a much clearer idea about the distribution of the input attribute. 
Now, what if I had given the layout to two cross two instead of that? I would have given it four cross four. So what it will result just see fine. Everything would be printed in just one single row. Hold on guys. Arya has a doubt. He's asking that why we are using this share X and share Y values. What are these? Why we have assigned false values to it? Okay, Arya. So in order to resolve this query, I need to show you what will happen if I give true values to them. Okay, so be with me. So share X equal true and share Y that equals true. So let's see what result we'll get. You're getting it. The X and Y coordinates are just shared among all the four visualization, right? So Arya, you can see that the sepal length and sepal width has y values ranging from 0.0, .0 to 7.5 which are being shared among both the visualization. So is with the petal length. It has a shared value between 0.0, .0 to 7.5. Okay, so that is why I don't want to share the value of X and Y. So it's just giving us a cluttered visualization. So Arya, why I'm doing this? I'm just doing it because I don't want my X and Y coordinates to be shared among any visualization. Okay, that is why my share X and share Y value are false. Okay, let's execute it. So this is a pretty much clear visualization which gives a clear idea about the distribution of the input attributes. Now if you want, you can also create a histogram of each input variable to get a clear idea of the distribution. So let's create a histogram for it. So data set dot hist. Okay, I would need to see it. So plot dot show. Let's see. So there's my histogram and it seems that we have two input variables that have a Gaussian distribution. So this is useful to note as we can use the algorithms that can exploit this assumption. Okay, so next comes the multivariate plot. Now that we have created the univariate plot to understand about each attribute, let's move on and look at the multivariate plot and see the interaction between the different variables. So first let's look at the scatter plot of all the attribute. This can be helpful to spot structured relationship between input variables. Okay, so let's create a scatter matrix. So for creating a scatter plot, we need scatter matrix and we need to pass our data set into it. Okay, and then what I want I want to see it. So plot dot show. So this is how my scatter matrix looks like. It's like that the diagonal grouping of some pair, right? So this suggests a high correlation and a predictable relationship. All right, this was our multivariate plot. Now let's move on and evaluate some algorithm. Now it's time to create some model of the data and estimate their accuracy on the basis of unseen data. Okay, so now we know all about our data set, right? We know how many instances and attributes are there in our data set. We know the summary of each attribute. Now I guess we have seen much about our data set. Now let's move on and create some algorithm and estimate their accuracy based on the unseen data. Okay, now what we'll do will create some model of the data and estimate their accuracy based on the some unseen data. Okay, so for that first of all, let's create a validation data set. What is a validation data set? Validation data set is your training data set that will be using it to train our model. Fine. All right, so how we'll create a validation data set for creating a validation data set. What we are going to do is we are going to split our data set into two parts. Okay, so the very first thing we'll do is to create a validation data set. So why do we even need a validation data set? So we need a validation data set to know that the model we created is any good. Later what we'll do we'll use the statistical method to estimate the accuracy of the model that we create on the unseen data. We also want a more concrete estimate of the accuracy of the best model on unseen data by evaluating it on the actual unseen data. Okay, confused? Let me simplify this for you. What we'll do we'll split the loaded data into two parts. The first 80% of the data will use it to train our model and the rest 20% will hold back as the validation data set that will use it to verify our trained model. Okay, fine. So let's define an array. This is my array. What it will consist of? It will consist of all the values from the data set. So data set dot values. Okay. Next, I'll define a variable x, which will consist of all the column from the array from 0 to 4, starting from 0 to 4. And the next variable y, which would consist of the array starting from this. So first of all, we'll define a variable x that will consist of the values in the array starting from the beginning. 0 till 4. Okay, so these are the column which will include in the x variable. And for a y variable, I'll define it as a class or the output. So, what I need, I just need the fourth column that is my class column. So, I'll start it from the beginning and I just want the fourth column. Okay, now I'll define my validation size, validation underscore size. I'll define it as 0 0.20 and I'll use a seed. I'll define seed equals 6. So this method seed sets the integer starting value used in generating random number. Okay, now I'll define the value of seed equals six. I'll tell you what is the importance of it later on. Okay, so let me define first few variables such as x underscore train test y underscore train and y underscore test. Okay, 
So what do we want to do is select some model. Okay, so model underscore selection But before doing that what we have to do is split our training data set into two halves. Okay, so dot train underscore test underscore Split what we want to split is the value of X and Y. Okay, and my test size is Equals to validation size Which is a 0 0.20 correct and my random state is equal to seed so what the seed is doing here it's helping me to keep the same randomness in the training and testing data set fine so let's execute it and see what is our result it's executed next we'll create a test harness for this we'll use 10 fold cross validation to estimate the accuracy so what it will do it will split our data set into 10 parts train on the nine part and test on the one part and this will repeat for all combination of train and test splits okay so for that, let's define again my C that was six already defined and scoring equals accuracy. Fine. So we are using the metric of accuracy to evaluate the model. So what is this? There's a ratio of number of correctly predicted instances divided by the total number of instances in the data set multiplied by 100 giving a percentage example. It's 98 percent accurate or 99 percent accurate things like that. Okay. So we'll be using this scoring variable when we run the build and evaluate each model in the next step. So our next part is building model. Till now we don't know which algorithm would be good for this problem or what configuration to use. So let's begin with six different algorithm. I'll be using logistic regression, linear discriminant analysis, k nearest neighbor, classification and regression trees, neigh bias and code vector machine. Well, these algorithms which I'm using is a good mixture of simple linear or non-linear algorithms. In simple linears which included the logistic regression and the linear discriminant analysis or the non-linear part which included the KNN algorithm, the CART algorithm, the, the neigh bias and the support vector machines. Okay, so we reset the random number C before each run to ensure that evaluation of each algorithm is performed using exactly the same data splits. It ensures the result are directly comparable okay so let me just copy and paste it okay so what we are doing here we are building five different types of model we are building logistic regression linear discriminant analysis k nearest neighbor decision tree gaussian neighbors and the support vector machine okay next what we'll do we'll evaluate model in each turn okay so what is this so we have six different model and accuracy estimation for each one of them now we need to compare the model to each other and select the most accurate of them all. So running this script, we saw the following result. So we can see some of the result on the screen. What is this? It is just the accuracy score using different set of algorithms. Okay, when we are using logistic regression, what is the accuracy rate? When we are using near discriminant algorithm, what is the accuracy and so and so. Okay, so from the output, it seems that LDA algorithm was the most accurate model that we tested. Now we want to get an idea of the accuracy of the model on our validation set or the testing data set. So this will give us an independent final check on the accuracy of the best model. It is always valuable to keep a testing data set for just in case you made a overfitting to the testing data set or you made a data leak. Both will result in an overly optimistic result. Okay. You can run the LDA model directly on the validation set and summarize the result as a final score, a confusion matrix and a classification report. Let us understand what regression in machine learning is. So what exactly is regression? The main goal of regression is the construction of an efficient model to predict the dependent attributes from a bunch of attribute variables. A regression problem is where the output variable is either real or a continuous value like salary weight area etc We can also define regression as a statistical means that is used in applications like housing investing etc To predict the relationship between a dependent variable and a bunch of independent variables For example, let's say in the finance application or investing we can actually predict the values of certain stock prices or you know those values depending on the independent variables like how many years it takes for a stock to you know actually mature or how many days will it take to grow or those variables that you have in investing and depending upon that we can make a possible outcome or a possible prediction of how our stock is going to be invested in a profit state or a loss state or all those things or we can take another example like housing we can take different parameters like number of years it's been there how many people have used it or what is the area of the house depending on all these factors or how many rooms does the house have we can predict the price of a house 
So this is basically what regression really is. So let us take a look at the various types of regression techniques that we have. We have simple linear regression, then we have polynomial regression, support vector regression, decision tree regression, we have random forest regression, and we have logistic regression as well. That is also a type of regression that we have. But for now, we'll be focusing on simple linear regression. So let's talk about how or what exactly is simple linear regression first. So one of the most interesting and common regression technique is uh, simple linear regression. In this, we predict the outcome of a dependent variable y based on the independent variables x. So the relationship between the variables is linear, hence the word linear regression. Then comes the polynomial regression. So in this regression technique, we transform the original features into a polynomial feature of a given degree and then perform regression on it. So this is basically polynomial regression. After this, we have support vector machine regression, or we can also call it SVR. We identify a hyperplane with maximum margin such that the maximum number of data points are within those margins. It is also quite similar to the support vector machine classification algorithm. Then we have decision tree regression. A decision tree can be used for both regression and classification. But in this case of regression, we use the ID3 algorithm, which is iterative dichotomizer 3 to identify the splitting node by reducing the standard deviation. After this, we have a random forest regression, which is basically an ensemble of predictions of several decision tree regressions. So this is all about the types of regressions. For now, we are going to focus on simple linear regression. So let's take a look at what exactly is a simple linear regression. Simple linear regression is a regression technique in which the independent variable has a linear relationship with the dependent variable. The straight line in the diagram is the best fit line and the main goal of the simple linear regression is to consider the given data points and plot the best fit line to fit the model in the best way possible. So if you talk about a real life analogy to explain linear regression, we can take an example of a car resale value. So we have different parameters, you know, when we are talking about a resale value of a car, like how many years the car has been there in the market and how many kilometers it has been ridden the kind of mileage the car gives and then we have different parameters we can focus upon and all these independent variables somehow are linearly connected or interconnected to the price of the car so that is one example to understand linear regression we'll be doing that in the use case i'll be telling you about how you can predict the price of car now talking about linear regression terminologies there are a few terminologies that you have to be thorough with to begin with linear regression so first of all we have to talk about cost function so the best fit line can be based on the linear equation that is given here. So in this, the dependent variable that is to be predicted is denoted by y. A line that touches the y-axis is denoted by the intercept b0. The b1 is the slope of the line and x represents the independent variables that determine the prediction of y. The error in the resultant prediction is denoted by e. Now talking about cost function, the cost function provides the best possible values for b0 and b1 to make the best fit line for the data points. We do this by converting this problem into a minimization problem to get the best values for B0 and B1. So with this, the error is minimized in this problem between the actual value and the predicted value, and we choose the function above to minimize. Now we square the error difference and sum the error over all the data points. The division between the total number of data points and the produced value provides the average square error for all the data points. It is also known as mean squared error and we can change the values of B0 and B1 so that the MSE or the mean squared error value is settled at the minimum. So this is one terminology that is cost function that we use in linear regression. Then we have the gradient descent. So the next important terminology to understand linear regression is gradient descent of course and it is a method of updating B0 and B1 value to reduce the MSE which is the mean squared error. The idea behind this is to keep iterating the B0 and B1 values until we reduce the MSE to the minimum. Now to update B0 and B1, we take the gradients from the cost function. And to find these gradients, we take partial derivatives with respect to B0 and B1. And these partial derivatives are the gradients and are used to update the values of B0 and B1. I'm sure guys, this might be a little confusing for you guys if you are new to this like gradient descent and cost function, but you don't have to worry about this because in Python when we're using a linear regression, we're going to be using the sklearn or the scikit-learn library. So you don't have to worry about this. You just have to integrate your model with the linear regression model that we have already over there and you will be done with it. And when I'm implementing the linear regression model, you'll see how easy it is to actually implement linear regression in Python. 
So after this, let's talk about a few advantages and disadvantages of linear regression. So talking about the advantages first, linear regression performs exceptionally well for linearly separable data. And it is actually very easy to implement, interpret and very efficient to train as well. And even though the linear regression is prone to overfitting, it handles it pretty well using dimensionally reduction techniques, regularization and cross validation. And one more advantage is that the extrapolation beyond a specific data set. So these are all the advantages that we have with linear regression. Let's talk about a few disadvantages as well. So one of the most common disadvantage with linear regression is that it takes the assumption of linearity between dependent and independent variables. The next disadvantage is it is often very prone to noise and overfitting as well, which is not a very good sign for any model if you are doing regression or classification in machine learning. The next disadvantage is it is very quite sensitive to outliers as well. And the last one is that it is very prone to multicollinearity. So these are all the advantages and disadvantages of linear regression. So let's understand the what and why of logistic regression. Now this algorithm is most widely used when the dependent variable or you can say the output is in the binary format. So here you need to predict the outcome of a categorical dependent variable. So the outcome should be always discrete or categorical in nature. Now by discrete, I mean the value should be binary or you can say you just have two values. It can either be zero or one. It can either be yes or a no, either be true or false or high or low. So only these can be the outcomes. So the value which you need to predict should be discrete or you can say categorical in nature. Whereas in linear regression, we have the value of y or you can say the value you need to predict is in a range. So that is how there is a difference between linear regression and logistic regression. Now you must be having a question. Why not linear regression? Now guys in linear regression, the value of y or the value which you need to predict is in a range. But in our case, as in the logistic regression, we just have two values. It can be either zero or it can be one. It should not entertain the values which is below zero or above one. But in linear regression, we have the value of y in the range. So here in order to implement logistic regression, we need to clip this part. So we don't need the value that is below zero or we don't need the value which is above one. So since the value of y will be between only zero and one, that is the main rule of logistic regression. The linear line has to be clipped at zero and one. Now once we clip this graph, it would look somewhat like this. So here you are getting a curve, which is nothing but three different straight lines. So here we need to make a new way to solve this problem. So this has to be formulated into an equation and hence we come up with logistic regression. So here the outcome is either zero or one, which is the main rule of logistic regression. So with this our resulting curve cannot be formulated. So hence our main aim to bring the values to zero and one is fulfilled. So that is how we came up with logistic regression. Now here once it gets formulated into an equation, it looks somewhat like this. So guys, this is nothing but a S curve or you can say the sigmoid curve or sigmoid function curve. So this sigmoid function basically converts any value from minus infinity to infinity to your discrete values, which a logistic regression wants, or you can say the values which are in binary format, either zero or one. So if you see here, the values are either zero or one, and this is nothing but just a transition of it. But guys, there's a catch over here. So let's say I have a data point that is 0.8. Now, how can you decide whether your value is zero or one? Now here you have the concept of threshold which basically divides your line. So here threshold value basically indicates the probability of either winning or losing. So here by winning, I mean the values equals to one and by losing, I mean the values equals to zero. But how does it do that? Let's say I have a data point which is over here. Let's say my cursor is at 0.8. So here I'll check whether this value is less than my threshold value or not. Let's say if it is more than my threshold value, it should give me the result as one. If it is less than that, then it should give me the result as zero. So here my threshold value is 0.5. Now I need to define that if my value, let's say 0.8, it is more than 0.5, then the value shall be rounded off to one. And let's say if it is less than 0.5, let's say I have a value 0.2, then should reduce it to zero. So here you can use the concept of threshold value to find your output. So here it should be discrete. It should be either zero or it should be one. So I hope you caught this curve of logistic regression. So guys, this is the sigmoid S curve. So to make this curve, we need to make an equation. So let me address that part as well. So let's see how an equation is formed to imitate this functionality. So over here, we have an equation of a straight line, which is y is equals to mx plus c. So in this case, I just have only one independent variable. 
but let's say if we have many independent variable then the equation becomes m1 x1 plus m2 x2 plus m3 x3 and so on till mn xn now let us put in b and x so here the equation becomes y is equals to b1 x1 plus b2 x2 plus b3 x3 and so on till bn xn plus c so guys your equation of the straight line has a range from minus infinity to infinity but in our case or you can say in logistic equation the value which we need to predict or you can say the y value it can have the range only from 0 to 1 so in that case we need to transform this equation so to do that what we had done we have just divide the equation by 1 minus y so now our y is equals to 0 so 0 over 1 minus 0 which is equals to 1 so 0 over 1 is again 0 and if we take y is equals to 1 then 1 over 1 minus 1 which is 0 so 1 over 0 is infinity so here my range is now between 0 to infinity but again we want the range from minus infinity to infinity so for that what we'll do we'll have the log of this equation so let's go ahead and have the logarithmic of this equation so here we have just transform it further to get the range between minus infinity to infinity so over here we have log of y over 1 minus 1 and this is your final logistic regression equation so guys don't worry you don't have to write this formula or memorize this formula in python you just need to call this function which is logistic regression and everything will be automatically for you so i don't want to scare you with the maths and the formulas behind it but it's always good to know how this formula was generated moving ahead let us see the various use cases wherein logistic regression is implemented in real life so the very first is weather prediction now logistic regression helps you to predict your weather for example, it is used to predict whether it is raining or not, whether it is sunny, is it cloudy or not. So all these things can be predicted using logistic regression. Whereas you need to keep in mind that both linear regression and logistic regression can be used in predicting the weather. So in that case, linear regression helps you to predict what will be the temperature tomorrow. Whereas logistic regression will only tell you whether it's going to rain or not, or whether it's cloudy or not, whether it's going to snow or not. So these values are discrete. Whereas if you apply linear regression, you'll be predicting things like what is the temperature tomorrow or what is the temperature day after tomorrow and all those things. So these are the slight differences between linear regression and logistic regression. Now moving ahead, we have classification problem. So Python performs multi-class classification. So here it can help you tell whether it's a bird or it's not a bird. Then you can classify different kind of mammals. Let's say whether it's a dog or it's not a dog. Similarly, you can check it for a reptile, whether it's a reptile or not a reptile. So in logistic regression, it can perform multi-class classification. So this point I have already discussed that it is used in classification problems. Next, it also helps you to determine the illness as well. So let me take an example. Let's say a patient goes for routine checkup in a hospital. So what doctor will do, it, it will perform various tests on the patient and will check whether the patient is actually ill or not. So what will be the features? So doctor can check the sugar level, the blood pressure, then what is the age of the patient, is it very small or is it an old person? Then what is the previous medical history of that patient? And all of these features will be recorded by the doctor. And finally, doctor checks the patient data and determines the outcome of his illness and the severity of illness. So using all the data, a doctor can identify whether a patient is ill or not. So these are the various use cases in which you can use logistic regression. Now, I guess enough of theory part. So let's move ahead and see some of the practical implementation of logistic regression. So over here, I'll be implementing two projects wherein I have the data set of a Titanic. So over here, we'll predict what factors made people more likely to survive the sinking of the Titanic ship. And in my second project, we'll see the data analysis on the SUV cars. So over here, we have the data of the SUV cars, who can purchase it, and what factors made people more interested in buying SUV. So these will be the major questions as to why you should implement logistic regression and what output will you get by it. So let's start by the very first project that is Titanic data analysis. So some of you might know that there was a ship called as Titanic which basically hit an iceberg and it sunk to the bottom of the ocean. And it was a big disaster at that time because it was the first voyage of the ship and it was supposed to be really really strongly built and one of the best ships of that time. So it was a big disaster of that time and of course there is a movie about this as well. So many of you might have watched it. So what we have, we have data of the passengers, those who survived and those who did not survive in this particular tragedy. So what you have to do, you have to look at this data and analyze which factors would have been contributed the most to the chances of a person's survival on the ship or not. So using the logistic regression, we can predict whether the person survived or the person died. Now apart from this, we we'll also have a look with the various features along with that. So first let us explore the data set. So over here we have the index value. 
then the first column is passenger id then my next column is survived so over here we have two values a zero and a one so zero stands for did not survive and one stands for survive so this column is categorical where the values are discrete next we have passenger class so over here we have three values one two and three so this basically tells you that whether a passenger is traveling in the first class second class or third class then we have the name of the passenger we have the sex or you can say the gender of the passenger whether the passenger is a male or female then we have the age we have the sib sp so this basically means the number of siblings or the spouses aboard the titanic so over here we have values such as one zero and so on then we have parts so parts is basically the number of parents or children aboard the titanic so over here we also have some values then we have the ticket number we have the fare we have the cabin number and we have the embarked column so in my embarked column we have three values we have s c and q so s basically stands for southampton c stands for cherbourg and q stands for queenstown so these are the features that we'll be applying our model on so here we'll perform various steps and then we'll be implementing logistic regression so now these are the various steps which are required to implement any algorithm so now in our case we are implementing logistic regression so our very first step is to collect your data or to import the libraries that are used for collecting your data and then taking it forward then my second step is to analyze your data so over here i can go to the various fields and then i can analyze the data i can check did the females or children survive better than the males or did the rich passenger survive more than the poor passenger or did the money matter as in who paid more to get into the ship were they evacuated first and what about the workers does the worker survived or what is the survival rate if you were the worker in the ship and not just a traveling passenger so all of these are very very interesting questions and you would be going through all of them one by one so in this stage you need to analyze your data and explore your data as much as you can then my third step is to wrangle your data now data wrangling basically means cleaning your data so over here you can simply remove the unnecessary items or if you have a null values in the data set you can just clear that data and then you can take it forward so in this step you can build your model using the trained data set and then you can test it using a test so over here you will be performing a split which basically split your data set into training and testing data set and finally you will check the accuracy so as to ensure how much accurate your values are so i hope you guys got these five steps that we're going to implement in logistic regression so now let's go into all these steps in detail so number one we have to collect your data or you can say import the libraries so let me just show you the implementation part as well so i'll just open my jupyter notebook and i'll just implement all of these steps side by side so guys this is my jupyter notebook so first let me just rename the jupyter notebook to let's say titanic data analysis now our first step was to import all the libraries and collect the data so let me just import all the libraries first so first of all i'll import pandas so pandas is used for data analysis so i'll say import pandas as pd then i'll be importing numpy so i'll say import numpy as np so numpy is a library in python which basically stands for numerical python and it is widely used to perform any scientific computation next we'll be importing seaborn so seaborn is a library for statistical plotting so i'll say import seaborn as sns I'll also import matplotlib. So matplotlib library is again for plotting. So I'll say import matplotlib.pyplot as pld. Now to run this library in Jupyter notebook, all I have to write in is percentage matplotlib inline. Next I'll be importing one module as well, so as to calculate the basic mathematical functions. So I'll say import maths. So these are the libraries that I'll be needing in this Titanic data analysis. So now let me just import my data set. So I'll take a variable, let's say Titanic data, and using the pandas, I will just read my CSV, or you can say the data set. I'll write the name of my data set that is Titanic.csv. Now I have already showed you the data set. So over here, let me just print the top ten rows. So for that, I'll just say I'll take the variable Titanic data dot head, and I'll say the top ten rows. So now I'll just run this. So to run this, I just have to press Shift plus Enter, or else you can just directly click on the cell. So over here I have the index we have the passenger id which is nothing but again the index which is starting from 1 then we have the survived column which has the categorical values or you can say the discrete values which is in the form of 0 or 1 then we have the passenger class we have the name of the passenger sex age and so on so this is the data set that I'll be going forward with next let us print the number of passengers which are there in this original data set 
So for that, I'll just simply type in print. I'll say number of passengers. And using the length function, I can calculate the total length. So I'll say length and inside this, I'll be passing this variable which is Titanic data. So I'll just copy it from here. I'll just paste it dot index. And next, so let me just print this one. So here the number of passengers which are there in the original data set we have is 891. So around this number were traveling in the Titanic ship. So over here my first step is done where you have just collected data, imported all the libraries and find out the total number of passengers which are traveling in Titanic. So now let me just go back to presentation and let's see what is my next step. So we're done with the collecting data. Next step is to analyze your data. So over here we'll be creating different plots to check the relationship between variables as in how one variable is affecting the other. So you can simply explore your data set by making use of various columns and then you can plot a graph between them. So you can either plot a correlation graph, you can plot a distribution graph. It's up to you guys. So let me just go back to my Jupyter notebook and let me analyze some of the data. Over here, my second part is to analyze data. So I just put this in header 2. Now to put this in header 2, I just have to go on code, click on markdown and I just run this. So first let us plot a count plot where you compare between the passengers who survived and who did not survive. So for that I'll be using the Seaborn library. So over here I have imported Seaborn as SNS. So I don't have to write the whole name. I'll simply say SNS.CountPlot. I'll say X is who survived and the data that I'll be using is the Titanic data. Or you can say the name of variable in which you have stored your data set. So now let me just run this. So over here as you can see I have survived column on my X axis and on the Y axis I have the count. So zero basically stands for did not survive and one stands for the passengers who did survive. So over here you can see that around 550 of the passengers who did not survive and there were around 350 passengers who only survived. So here you can basically conclude that there are very less survivors than non survivors. So this was the very first plot. Now let us plot another plot to compare the sex as to whether out of all the passengers who survived and who did not survive how many were men and how many were female. So to do that I'll simply say sns.countplot. I add the hue as sex. So I want to know how many females and how many males survived. Then I'll be specifying the data so I'm using titanic data set. And let me just run this. Okay I've done a mistake over here. So over here you can see I have survived column on the x-axis and I have the count on the y. Now so here your blue color stands for your male passengers and orange stands for your female. So as you can see here the passengers who did not survive that has a value 0. So we can see that majority of males did not survive. And if we see the people who survived here we can see the majority of females survived. So this basically concludes the gender of the survival rate. So it appears on average women were more than three times more likely to survive than men. Next let us plot another plot where we have the hue as the passenger class. So over here we can see which class that the passenger was traveling in. Whether it was traveling in class 1, 2 or 3. So for that I'll just write the same command. I'll say sns.countplot. I'll keep my x axis as sub only. I'll change my hue to passenger class. So my variable is named as p class. And the data set that I'll be using is Titanic data. So this is my result. So over here you can see I have blue for first class, orange for second class and green for the third class. So here the passengers who did not survive were majorly of the third class or you can say the lowest class or the cheapest class to get into the Titanic. And the people who did survive majorly belong to the higher classes. So here one and two has more rise than the passenger who were traveling in the third class. So here we have concluded that the passengers who did not survive were majorly of third class or you can say the lowest class and the passengers who were traveling in first and second class would tend to survive more. Next let us plot a graph for the age distribution. Over here I can simply use my data. So we'll be using pandas library for this. I'll declare an array and I'll pass in the column that is age. So I plot and I want a histogram so I'll say plot dot hist. So you can notice over here that we have more of young passengers or you can see the children between the ages 0 to 10 and then we have the average age people and if you go ahead lesser would be the population. So this is the analysis on the age column. So we saw that we have more young passengers and more mediocre age passengers which are traveling in the Titanic. So next let me plot a graph of fare as well. So I'll say Titanic data. I'll say fare and again I'll plot a histogram. So I'll say hist. 
So here you can see the fair size is between 0 to 100. Now let me add the bin size so as to make it more clear. So over here I'll say bin is equals to let's say 20 and I'll increase the figure size as well. So I'll say fig size. Let's say I'll give the dimensions as 10 by 5. Okay, so it is bins. So this is more clear now. Next let us analyze the other columns as well. So I'll just type in titanic data and I want the information as to what all columns are left. So here we have passenger ID which I guess it's of no use. Then we have see how many passengers survived and how many did not. We also see the analysis on the gender basis. We saw whether the female tend to survive more or the men tend to survive more. Then we saw the passenger class where the passenger is traveling in the first class, second class or third class. Then we have the name. So in name we cannot do any analysis. We saw the sex. We saw the age as well. Then we have SIB SP. So this stands for the number of siblings or the spouses which are aboard the Titanic. So let us do this as well. So I'll say sns.countplot. I'll mention x as SIB SP. And I'll be using the Titanic data. So you can see the plot over here. So over here you can conclude that it has the maximum value on zero. So you can conclude that neither a children nor a spouse was on board the Titanic. Now second most highest value is one. And then we have very less values for two, three, four and so on. Next if I go above we saw this column as well. Similarly you can do for parge. So next we have parge or you can say the number of parents or children which were aboard the Titanic. So similarly you can do this as well. Then we have the ticket number. So I don't think so any analysis is required for ticket. Then we have fare. So fare we have already discussed as in the people who tend to travel in the first class usually pay the highest fare. Then we have the cabin number and we have embark. So these are the columns that we'll be doing data wrangling on. So we have analyzed the data and we have seen quite a few graphs in which we can conclude which variable is better than the another or what is the relationship they hold. So third step is my data wrangling. So data wrangling basically means cleaning your data. So if you have a large data set, you might be having some null values or you can say NAN values. So it's very important that you remove all the unnecessary items that are present in your data set. So removing this directly affects your accuracy. So I'll just go ahead and clean my data by removing all the NAN values and unnecessary columns which has a null value in the data set. So next I'll be performing data wrangling. So first of all, I'll check whether my data set is null or not. So I'll say Titanic data, which is the name of my data set and I'll say is null. So this will basically tell me what all values are null and it will return me a Boolean result. So this basically checks the missing data and your result will be in Boolean format as in the result will be true or false. So false means if it is not null and true means if it is null. So let me just run this. So over here you can see the values as false or true. So false is where the value is not null and true is where the value is null. So over here you can see in the cabin column we have the very first value which is null. So we have to do something on this. So you can see that we have a large data set. So the counting does not stop and we can actually see the sum of it. We can actually print the number of passengers who have the NAN value in each column. So I'll say titanic underscore data is null and I want the sum of it. So I'll say dot sum. So this will basically print the number of passengers who have the NN values in each column. So we can see that we have missing values in each column that is 177. Then we have the maximum value in the cabin column and we have very less in the embarked column that is 2. So here if you don't want to see this numbers you can also plot a heat map and then you can visually analyze it. So let me just do that as well. So I'll say sns.heatmap. I'll say y tick labels false so I'll just run this so as we have already seen that there were three columns in which missing data value was present so this might be age so over here almost 20% of age column has a missing value then we have the caving columns so this is quite a large value and then we have two values for embark column as well add a cmap for color coding so I'll say cmap so if I do this so the graph becomes more attractive so over here your yellow stands for true or you can say the values are null. So here we have concluded that we have the missing value of age. We have a lot of missing values in the cabin column and we have very less value which is not even visible in the embark column as well. So to remove these missing values you, you can either replace the values and you can put in some dummy values to it or you can simply drop the column. 
So here let us first pick the age column. So first let me just plot a box plot and they will analyze with having a column as age. So I'll say SNS dot box plot. I'll say X is equals to passenger class. So it's P class. I'll say Y is equals to age. And the data set that I'll be using is Titanic set. So I'll say data is equals to Titanic data. You can see the age in first class and second class tends to be more older rather than we have it in the third class. Well, that depends on the experience, how much you earn or might be there n number of reasons. So here we concluded that passengers who were traveling in class one and class two are tend to be older than what we have in the class three. So we have found that we have some missing values in M. Now one way is to either just drop the column or you can just simply fill in some values to them. So this method is called as imputation. Now to perform data wrangling or cleaning, let us first print the head of the data set. So I'll say titanic dot head. So it's titanic underscore data. Let's say I just want the five rows. So here we have survive, which is again categorical. So in this particular column, I can apply logistic regression. So this can be my Y value or the value that I need to predict. Then we have the passenger class. We have the name. Then we have ticket number, fare, cabin. So over here we have seen that in cabin we have a lot of null values or you can say the NAN values, which is quite visible as well. So first of all, we'll just drop this column. So for dropping it, I'll just say Titanic underscore data and I'll simply type in drop and the column which I need to drop. So I have to drop the cabin column. I'll mention the axis equals to one and I'll say in place also to true. So now again, I'll just print the head and let us see whether this column has been removed from the data set or not. So I'll say Titanic dot head. So as you can see here, we don't have cabin column anymore. Now you can also drop the NA values. So I'll say Titanic data dot drop all the NA values or you can say NAN, which is not a number. And I'll say in place is equals to true. It's Titanic. So over here, let me again plot the heat map and let's say or the values which were before showing a lot of null values. Has it been removed or not? So I'll say SNS dot heat map. I'll pass in the data set. I'll check it is null. I'll say Y tick labels is equals to false. And I don't want color coding. So again, I'll say false. So this will basically help me to check whether my values has been removed from the data set or not. So as you can see here, I don't have any null values. So it's entirely black. Now you can actually know the sum as well. So I'll just go above. So I'll just copy this part and I just use the sum function to calculate the sum. So here that tells me that data set is clean as in the data set does not contain any null value or any NAN value. So now we have wrangled our data. You can say clean our data. So here we have done just one step in data wrangling that is just removing one column out of it. Now you can do a lot of things. You can actually fill in the values with some other values or you can just calculate the mean and then you can just fit in the null values. But now if I see my data set, so I'll say titanic data dot head. But now if I see over here, I have a lot of string values. So this has to be converted to a categorical variables in order to implement logistic regression. So what we will do, we will convert this to categorical variable into some dummy variables and this can be done using pandas because logistic regression just take two values. So whenever you apply machine learning, you need to make sure that there are no string values present because it won't be taking these as your input variables. So using string, you don't have to predict anything. But in my case, I have the survive columns. So I need to predict how many people tend to survive and how many did not. So zero stands for did not survive and one stands for survive. So now let me just convert these variables into dummy variables. So I'll just use pandas and I'll say pd dot get dummies. You can simply press tab to auto complete. I'll say titanic data and I'll pass the sex. So you can just simply click on shift plus tab to get more information on this. So here we have the type data frame and we have the passenger ID survived and the passenger class. So if you run this, you'll see that zero basically stands for not a female and one stand for it is a female. Similarly for male zero stands for it's not male and one stand for male. Now we don't require both these columns because one column itself is enough to tell us whether it's male or you can say female or not. So let's say if I want to keep only male, now I'll say if the value of male is one, so it is definitely a male and it is not a female. So that is how you, you don't need both of these values. So for that, I'll just remove the first column, let's say female. So I'll say drop first and true. So over here it has given me just one column which is male and has the value zero and one. 
Now let me just set this as a variable. Let's say sex. So over here I can say sex dot head. I just want to see the first five rows. Oh, sorry, it's dot. So this is how my data looks like. Now here we have done it for sex. Then we have the numerical values in age. We have the numerical values in spouses. Then we have the ticket number. We have the fare, and we have embarked as well. So in embarked, the values are in S, C, and Q. So here also we can apply this get dummy function. So let's say I'll take a variable. Let's say embark. I'll use the pandas library. I'll enter the column name that is embarked. So let me just print the head of it. So I'll say embark dot head. So over here we have C, Q, and S. Now here also we can drop the first column because these two values are enough whether the passenger is either traveling for Q that is Queenstown, S for Southampton, and if both the values are zero, then definitely the passenger is from Cherbourg that is the third value. So you can again drop the first value. So I'll say drop and true. Let me just run this. So this is how my output looks like. Now similarly you can do it for passenger class as well. So here also we have three classes one, two, and three. So I'll just copy the whole statement. So let's say I want the variable name, let's say PCL. I'll pass in the column name that is P class and I'll just drop the first column. So here also the values would be 1, 2, or 3, and I'll just remove the first column. So here we just left with 2 and 3. So if both the values are 0, then definitely the passenger is traveling in the first class. Now we have made the values as categorical. Now my next step would be to concatenate all these new rows into a data set. Or you can say Titanic data using the pandas. We'll just concatenate all these columns. So I'll say p dot concat, and then say we have to concatenate sex. We have to concatenate embark and PCL, and then I'll mention the access to one. And I'll just run this. Okay, I need to print the head. So over here you can see that these columns have been added over here. So we have the male column, which basically tells whether a person is male or it's a female. Then we have the embark, which is basically Q and S. So if it's traveling from Queenstown, the value would be one, else it would be zero. And if both of these values are zero, it is definitely traveling from Cherbourg. Then we have the passenger class as two and three. So if the value of both these is zero, then the passenger is traveling in class one. So I hope you got this till now. Now these are the irrelevant columns that we have it over here. So we can just drop these columns. We're dropping P class, the embarked column. And the sex column. So I'll just type in Titanic data dot drop and I'll mention the columns that I want to drop. So I'll say I'll even delete the passenger ID because it's nothing but just the index value which is starting from one. So I'll drop this as well. Then I don't want name as well, so I'll delete name as well. Then what else we can drop? We can drop the ticket as well. And then I'll just mention the axis and I'll say in place is equals to true. Okay, so my column name starts from uppercase. So these has been dropped. Now let me just print my data set again. So this is my final data set, guys. We have the survived column which has the value 0 and 1. Then we have the passenger class. Oh, we forgot to drop this as well. So no worries, I'll drop this again. So now let me just run this. So over here we have the survive, we have the age, we have the sib sp, we have the parch, we have fair, male, and these we have just converted. So here we have just performed data wrangling, or you can say clean the data, and then we have just converted the values of gender to male, then embarked to QNS and the passenger class to two and three. So this was all about my data wrangling or just cleaning the data. Then my next step is training and testing your data. So here we will split the data set into train subset and test subset. And then what we'll do, we'll build a model on the train data and then predict the output on your test data set. So let me just go back to Jupyter and let us implement this as well. Over here, I need to train my data set. So I'll just put this in the heading three. So over here, you need to define your dependent variable and independent variable. So here, my y is the output, or you can say the value that I need to predict. So over here, I'll write Titanic data. I'll take the column which is survive. So basically, I have to predict this column whether the passenger survived or not. And as you can see, we have the discrete outcome, which is in the form of 0 and 1. 
and rest all the things we can take it as a features or you can say independent variable so i'll say titanic data dot drop so we'll just simply drop the survived and all the other columns will be my independent variable so everything else are the features which leads to the survival rate so once we have defined the independent variable and the dependent variable the next step is to split your data into training and testing subset so for that we'll be using sklearn i'll just type in from sklearn dot cross validation import train test split now here if you just click on shift and tab you can go to the documentation and you can just see the examples over here i'll click on plus to open it and then i'll just go to examples and see how you can split your data so over here you have x train x test y train y test and then using this train test split you can just pass in your independent variable and dependent variable and just define a size and a random state to it so let me just copy this and i'll just paste it over here over here we'll train test then we have the dependent variable train and test and using the split function we'll pass in the independent and dependent variable and then we'll set a split size so let's say I'll put it as 0.3. So this basically means that your data set is divided in 0.3. That is in 70-30 ratio. And then I can add any random state to it. So let's say I'm applying 1. This is not necessary. If you want the same result as that of mine, you can add the random state. So this will basically take exactly the same sample every time. Next, I have to train and predict by creating a model. So here, logistic regression will grab from the linear regression. So next, I'll just type in from sklearn dot linear model import logistic regression next i'll just create the instance of this logistic regression model so i'll say log model is equals to logistic regression now i just need to fit my model so i'll say log model dot fit and i'll just pass in my x train and y train all right so here it gives me all the details of logistic regression so here it gives me the class weight, dual, fit, intercept and all those things. Then what I need to do, I need to make prediction. So I'll take a variable, let's say predictions and I'll pass on the model to it. So I'll say log model dot predict and I'll pass in the value that is X test. So here we have just created a model, fit that model and then we had made predictions. So now to evaluate how my model has been performing. So you can simply calculate the accuracy or you can also calculate a classification report. So don't worry guys, I'll be showing both of these methods. So I'll say from sklearn.metrics import classification report. So over here I'll use classification report and inside this I'll be passing in y test and the predictions. So guys, this is my classification report. So over here I have the precision, I have the recall, we have the F1 score and then we have support. So here we have the value of precision as 75, 72 and 73, which is not that bad. Now, in order to calculate the accuracy as well, you can also use the concept of confusion matrix. So if you want to print the confusion matrix, I'll simply say from sklearn.metrics, import confusion matrix first of all, and then we'll just print this. So here my function has been imported successfully. So I'll say confusion matrix. And I'll again pass in the same variables, which is y test and predictions. So I hope you guys already know the concept of confusion matrix. So can you guys give me a quick confirmation as to whether you guys remember this confusion matrix concept or not? So if not, I can just quickly summarize this as well. Okay, Jagriti says a yes. Okay, Swati is not clear with this. So I'll just tell you in a brief what confusion matrix is all about. So confusion matrix is nothing but a two by two matrix which has a four outcomes. This basically tells us that how accurate your values are. So here we have the column as predicted no, predicted y, and we have actual no and an actual yes. So this is the concept of confusion matrix. So here let me just feed in these values which we have just calculated. So here we have 105, 105, 21, 25, and 63. So as you can see here, we have got four outcomes. Now, 105 is the value where a model has predicted no, and in reality, it was also a no. So here we have predicted no and an actual no. Similarly, we have 63 as a predicted yes. So here the model predicted yes, and actually also it was a yes. So in order to calculate the accuracy, you just need to add the sum of these two values 
and just divide the whole by the sum. So here these two values tells me where the model has actually predicted the correct output. So this value is also called as true negative. This is called as false positive. This is called as true positive and this is called as false negative. Now in order to calculate the accuracy you don't have to do it manually. So in Python you can just import accuracy score function and you can get the results from that. So I'll just do that as well. So I'll say from sklearn.metrics import accuracy score and I'll simply print the accuracy. And I'll pass in the same variables that is y test and predictions. So over here it tells me the accuracy as 78 which is quite good. So over here if you want to do it manually you have to plus these two numbers which is 105 plus 63. So this comes out to almost 168 and then you have to divide it by the sum of all the four numbers. So 105 plus 63 plus 21 plus 25. So this gives me a result of 214. So now if you divide these two numbers you'll get the same accuracy that is 78% or you can say 0.78. So that is how you can calculate the accuracy. So now let me just go back to my presentation and let's see what all we have covered till now. So here we have first split our data into train and test subset. Then we have built our model on the train data and then predicted the output on the test data set. And then my fifth step is to check the accuracy. So here we have calculated accuracy to almost 78% which is quite good. You cannot say that accuracy is bad. So here it tells me how accurate your results are. So here my accuracy score defines that. And hence we got a good accuracy. So now moving ahead, let us see the second project that is SUV data analysis. So in this, a car company has released new SUV in the market. And using the previous data about the sales of their SUV, they want to predict the category of people who might be interested in buying this. So using the logistic regression, you need to find what factors made people more interested in buying this SUV. So for this, let us see a data set where I have user ID, I have gender as male and female. Then we have the age, we have the estimated salary, and then we have the purchased column. So this is my discrete column, or you can say the categorical column. So here we just have the value that is 0 and 1. And this column we need to predict whether a person can actually purchase a SUV or not. So based on these factors, we will be deciding whether a person can actually purchase a SUV or not. So we know the salary of a person, we know the age. And using these, we can predict whether a person can actually purchase a SUV or not. So let me just go to my Jupyter notebook and let us implement logistic regression. So guys, I will not be going through all the details of data cleaning and analyzing the part. So that part, I'll just leave it on you. So just go ahead and practice as much as you can. All right. So my second project is SUV predictions. All right. So first of all, I have to import all the libraries. So I say import numpy as np. And similarly, I'll do the rest of it. All right. So now let me just print the head of this data set. So this we've already seen that we have columns as user ID, we have gender, we have the age, we have the salary, and then we have to calculate whether the person can actually purchase a SUV or not. So now let us just simply go on to the algorithm part. So we'll directly start off with the logistic regression or how you can train a model. So for doing all those things, we first need to define your independent variable and a dependent variable. So in this case, I want my x that is an independent variable. I say data set dot I lock. So here I'll be specifying all the rows. So colon basically stands for that. And in the columns, I want only two and three dot values. So here it should fetch me all the rows and only the second and third column, which is age and estimated salary. So these are the factors which will be used to predict the dependent variable that is purchase. So here my dependent variable is purchase. And your dependent variable is of age and salary. So I'll say data set dot I log. I'll have all the rows and I just want fourth column. That is my purchased column dot values. All right. So I've just forgot one, one square bracket over here. All right. So over here I have defined my independent variable and dependent variable. So here my independent variable is age and salary and dependent variable is the column purchase. Now you must be wondering what is this I log function? So ILOG function is basically an indexer for pandas data frame and it is used for integer based indexing or you can also say selection by index. Now let me just print these independent variables and dependent variables. So if I print the independent variable, I have the age as well as the salary. Next let me print the dependent variable as well. So over here you can see I just have the values in 0 and 1. So 0 stands for did not purchase. Next let me just divide my data set into training and test subset. So I'll simply write in from sklearn.crossplit 
dot cross validation import train test next i'll just press shift and tab and over here i'll go to the examples and just copy the same line so i'll just copy this i'll remove the points now i want the text size to be let's say 25 so i have divided the train and test split in 75 25 ratio now let's say i'll take the random state as zero so random state basically ensures the same result or you can say the same samples taken whenever you run the code so let me just run this now you can also scale your input values for better performing and this can be done using standard scaler so let me do that as well so i'll say from sklearn dot preprocessing import standard scaler now why do we scale it now if you see our data set we are dealing with large numbers well although we are using a very small data set so whenever you're working in a prod environment you'll be working with large data set where you'll be using thousands and hundred thousands of tuples so their scaling down will definitely affect the performance by a large extent so here let me just show you how you can scale down these input values and then the pre-processing contains all your methods and functionality which is required to transform your data so now let us scale down for test as well as a training data set so i'll first make an instance of it so i'll say standard scaler then i'll have x train i'll say sc dot fit fit underscore transform and i'll pass in my x train variable and similarly i can do it for test wherein i'll pass the x test all right now my next step is to import logistic regression so i'll simply apply logistic regression by first importing it so i'll say from sk learn from sklearn dot linear model import logistic regression now over here i'll be using classifier so i'll say classifier dot is equals to logistic regression so over here i'll just make an instance of it so i'll say logistic regression and over here i'll just pass in the random state which is zero and now i'll simply fit the model and i simply pass in x train and y train so here it tells me all the details of logistic regression then i have to predict the value so i'll say y pred is equals to classifier then predict function and then i just pass in x test so now we have created the model we have scaled down our input values then we have applied logistic regression we have predicted the values and now we want to know the accuracy so to know the accuracy first we need to import accuracy score so i'll say from sklearn.metrics import accuracy score and using this function we can calculate the accuracy or you can manually do that by creating a confusion matrix so i'll just pass in my y test and my y predicted all right so over here i get the accuracy as 89 percent so if you want to know the accuracy in percentage so i just have to multiply it by 100 and if i run this so it gives me 89 percent so i hope you guys are clear with whatever i have taught you today so here i have taken my independent variables as age and salary and then we have calculated that how many people can purchase the suv and then we have calculated our model by checking the accuracy so over here we get the accuracy as 89 which is great let's compare the two models so first of all let's look at the definition of linear regression and logistic regression so the main aim of linear regression is to predict a continuous dependent variable based on the values of the independent variables. But when it comes to logistic regression, the aim is to predict a categorical dependent variable based on the values of independent variables. These are the main aim of each of these models. Now let's look at the variable type. Now in linear regression, the dependent variable is always continuous. All right, this is very important to remember because this is the main objective of linear regression. Okay, it makes use of continuous dependent variables to predict continuous values. Similarly, when it comes to logistic regression, you're going to use categorical dependent variable to predict a categorical value. All right, now let's look at the estimation method. So guys, linear regression is based on the least square estimation, which basically says that the regression coefficient should be chosen in such a way that it minimizes the sum of the square distance of each observed response. Okay, now this is in depth about linear regression. So that's why I'm going to leave a link in the description. Now, logistic regression, on the other hand, is based on maximum likelihood estimation. Okay, this basically says that the coefficients should be chosen in such a way 
that it maximizes the probability of y given some value of x next is the equation earlier we discussed this equation where for linear regression we have y is equal to b naught plus b1 into x plus e okay similarly this is the equation for logistic regression so the next difference is the best fit line so guys linear regression aims at finding the best fitting straight line which is also called the regression line all right but when it comes to logistic uh, regression if you try and uh, map the relationship between the dependent and independent variable you're going to get a curve which is also known as the sigmoid curve all right so in linear regression the relationship between the dependent and independent variable is represented using a straight line but when it comes to logistic regression the relationship between the dependent and independent variable is represented using a sigmoid curve now let's look at the relationship between dependent and independent variable now when it comes to linear regression there has to be a linear relationship between the two so when i say linear i mean that the variables have to vary linearly okay that's how the straight line is formed in the first place all right when it comes to logistic regression it's not necessary to have a linear relationship now the output of linear regression is always going to be a predicted integer value or basically a continuous value so when it comes to logistic regression the output has to be a binary value okay so it should either be class a or class b or it should be 0 or 1 something like that finally we have applications now linear regression is mainly used to predict outcomes like the expected number of sales and you know it's always used to predict some continuous value all right but when it comes to logistic regression it's mainly used in classification so when you want to classify a data set into two different classes then you use logistic regression you can find a lot of applications of linear regression in the business domain and logistic regression is mainly used in the cyber security image processing and classification domain what is classification and if i have to tell you about classification uh, like for example what happens is like we have two type of when we talk about machine learning machine learning is nothing but you know like a series of instructions you give it to the computer so that it can learn the patterns from your data set right to give you an example imagine that there is a trending topic for example you found it you want to find it out whether uh, prime minister modi will be uh, the second prime minister once again the prime minister for the country or not okay so now what you will do is you will collect the data set from multiple different sources and uh, you will you will actually build it a like a algorithm uh where you you will get a label as yes or no yes he will continue as a next prime minister or no he will not continue as a next prime minister so you will collect the data set and you will feed this data set to the computer and this process is called as a machine learning right so now in this case what happens is um uh, so this this is about the classification right so now machine learning is basically of two type one is called as a supervised machine learning another is called as a unsupervised machine learning and the third one is a reinforcement machine learning so when we speak about supervised machine learning as the name suggests it provides some supervision right for example the teacher teaching the kid it's a supervised machine learning right so we will give the trained examples we will give the trained data set with a pure label on top of that uh, this is called as a supervised machine learning so if i draw in front of you this type of machine learning look like this supervised machine learning where what happens is like you would have the data set which is a structured data set and you would have one column which is called as a label what you want to predict okay and you would have a, a various predictors by which you want to predict to give you an example imagine that you want to predict a pricing of a community okay you want to predict what would be the pricing of apartment in a particular community right now this can be the variable like you can see that uh, what would be the number of how many floors it has you can have a variable like what is a pollution level how how many educational institution are nearby right so based upon that the pricing will change but this type of supervised machine learning why it is called supervised machine learning because we provide the independent variable or we provide the predictors also we provide the label data set okay now this supervised machine learning is basically of two type so this supervised machine learning one type one first is called as the you know regression based supervised machine learning okay and the second one is called as a classification based supervised machine learning 
Now, what is the difference between regression based and a classification based supervised machine learning? Regression based supervised machine learning is that machine learning where what you want to predict is continuous in nature. Okay, imagine the you want to predict the com community prices, right? Which is a continuous value. If it is a continuous value, then we will go ahead with regression based supervised machine learning. Okay, whereas if you want to predict something which is the discrete outcome to give you an example, you want to predict that whether I will win the match or not. Okay, I want to predict whether the particular employee will churn out from the company or not. You want to predict, you know, like whether uh, the person will have a cancer or not. You're getting my point, right? So if you have the output which you want to predict is in the form of yes or no or true or false. Right. This is called as the uh, supervised machine learning, but a classification based supervised machine learning. OK, so classification based supervised machine learning is the process of dividing the data set into different categories or group by adding a label. OK, so always remember that whenever you guys want to predict the classes in the data set, whenever you want to predict, you know, like whether this will happen or not, whether the whether a person will do a credit card fraud or not. You're getting my point, right? Whether the employee will churn out from the company or not, right? Whether the particular person will have a diabetes as a disease or not. All these questions, wherever you want to find it out, yes or no, or true or false, or you want to predict classes in the data set, this is called as a classification based supervised machine learning. Okay. So this is what is called as a classification based supervised machine learning. And Today, I will teach you, you know, I will tell you about various form of classification based supervised machine learning, although we will do a deep dive into decision tree, right? Now you will be able to understand that decision tree, how decision tree is connected to the network, what we are learning today with uh, classification based supervised machine learning. OK, so now uh, we have various algorithms. Algorithm is nothing but a set of mathematical equations for classification based uh, supervised machine learning. We first of all, we have something called as decision tree. Then we would have something called as random forest, then knife base and then KNN, which is called as a K nearest neighbors. OK, so let me give you a few statements about this algorithm and we have many others. But today we will focus on one of them, which is decision tree. So now first let's start with decision tree. Now what is a decision tree? What I was telling you is believe me or not decision tree is something you use every day in your um, in your daily life. For example, you take decisions and for ex uh, today also you took a decision to attend this webinar, right? But how do you decide a decision based on various further decisions, right? For example, for today joining the webinar, you have seen that okay, uh, when this webinar is about OK, so you said it is weekday or weekend. Then you might have said check it out, right? What is the time of the webinar? Then you might have checked it out. What is the topic of the webinar, right? So and who is conducting this webinar? So based upon this, you took a decision. Shall I go ahead or not go ahead? You're getting my point, right? So this is what is called as a decision tree. We call it as decision tree because it is a graphical representation of all the possible solution to a decision. It's like a tree like decision tree is like a tree why because a tree also start with a root and then it emerge into various branches similarly you have a decision tree which i'm showing to you here as a simplest algorithm which is being used for machine learning purposes now it is something like this imagine that you want to find it out that you know like do you want to go to a restaurant or do you want to buy an hamburger OK, so you have two choices. Either you can go for a restaurant or either you can buy a hamburger. Now, how would you decide which one you would follow? So you will start with what is called as a root note. You will start with a root note that whether I am hungry or not, right? If I am hungry, right, then only I will go for all these activity. If I am not hungry at all, then simply go and sleep. You got my point, right? So this is how uh, you will start with the first note, which is to find it out whether I'm feeling hungry or not. If I'm feeling hungry, then I will decide that. Well, I do I have money which is around twenty five dollar worth. If I have money, then I will go for a restaurant. If I don't have a money, then I will buy an hamburger. 
you understood this this is simplest representation of decision tree basically you decide something on the basis of the previous outcomes and you can imagine any sort of example here imagine that you want to find it out whether the person will do a credit card fraud or not again it will depend upon the previous circumstances that you know for example it will depend upon how much is the salary of the person you it will depend upon what is the job profile of the person it will depend upon the fact that you know like for example how many fraud or how many cards this person have right so on basis of you will decide that whether this will do a credit card fraud or not so this is the simplest form of classification based algorithm then we have the next algorithm which is called as a random forest now what is a random forest as the name suggests you built one decision tree in the last example right but <clears throat> one decision tree can sometimes be overfitting as a case right so people said that you know like why should i only trust one decision tree for example whenever you take a bold decision in your life you don't trust only a single voice right <clears throat> you want to hear it from multiple different people to make your decision more stronger right go to a doctor if the doctor says to you that you have this type of a disease you don't uh, believe in that what you do is you also talk to second doctor third doctor fourth doctor to confirm that this is true or not okay so this is what is called as a random forest as the name suggests why it is called random forest it is called random forest because now you are building the various number of decision trees here it's like a forest of all the trees right it is no longer a single tree it is a forest of complete trees so for example you can imagine that if it is my training data set i will i will split my training data set into multiple examples multiple decision trees will be built and then based upon the majority i will decide whether should i do this or not okay so it is also called as a bagging sort of methodology where we bring the outcome of various models or we bring the outcome of various trees all together to make the uh, to make our powerful decision okay so this is another example this is another algorithm which is called as a random forest then after random forest we have something called as naive base okay now what is a naive base algorithm naive base is a also a simplest algorithm but naive base is basically based on the bayes theorem okay so this algorithm is basically based on the bayes theorem and bayes theorem is based on the conditional probability right so it is based on the conditional probability which is your naive base now in name naive base what happens is like we decide that whether something will happen or not on the basis of probability so let me illustrate you with this example imagine that you want to find it out whether i would have a disease or not okay so first of all the probability of having a disease is 0.10 and the probability of not having a disease is 0.90 okay so if there is a probability of having a disease is 0.10 you will further find it out that what is the probability that my test will be positive given i am diseased what is the probability that my test to diagnose the disease is negative given i have a disease right similarly if you go into this direction if there is a probability of not having a disease is 0.90 you will find it out that what is the probability of having a disease test being positive with having with no disease and what is the probability of no disease given i don't have the disease which is 0.90 so basically here you check the outcomes here you check the outcome of all the all the possible combinations this is what is called as the naive base algorithm or base theorem or uh, you know conditional probability based theorem okay then we also have something which is called as a key nearest neighbor which is the one of the finest algorithm uh, which also helps you in deciding the uh, classification right now what is key nearest neighbor k nearest neighbor as the name suggest what happens in this case is we try to build you know uh, we try to build uh, basically it's like a neighbor so it's something like this like if i give you the data set say i give you the customer data set okay and i it is a transaction data set so customer number 1 has bought a product number 1 
right from a particular vendor at a particular rate and this is a profit this customer has given to us and this is the revenues okay this is my class customer number one similarly you would have customer number two customer number three customer number four right now if i ask you that which customer profiling is same is nearby same right so what you can do is you can group your customers or you will get to know that which customer behave in a similar way so you can say that customer one customer three and customer four they behave in a similar way because they are giving us the high profit and high revenue margins you understood so this is what happens in the case of k nearest neighbor so k nearest neighbor what you generally do is you find it out that what uh i would be able to you know uh find it out who is my nearest neighbor like what are the similarities in the patterns we have right this is what we use for k nearest neighbors and this you can see that for example the algorithm based on the distance based mechanism find it out that how many people or how, what type of audience is similar to the outcomes right so then moving further here the, with the second topic let's go into detail about what is decision tree all about right so so far i have touched base on a classification based algorithm right and i was teaching you different type of classification based algorithm but since the focus of today's class is decision tree let's take a deep dive into the decision tree okay so let's get started with decision tree a decision tree is a graphical representation of all possible solution to a decision based on a certain condition what does it mean it means that it is as simple as that imagine that this is a tree right so it is like a tree where you have a problem statement that should i accept a job offer or not imagine that you want to find it out that should i accept a job offer or not this is a problem statement which is there in your mind now how would you solve this problem statement with the help of a decision tree first of all you will start with what we call as a root node we will start with a root node starting with you know to find it out what is a salary okay what i'm what I, what is a salary i'm getting so if my salary is equal to or greater than equal to 50000 i'll go here if my salary is not greater than equal to 50000 i will say i will not accept this offer okay now imagine that you say that your salary is greater than 50000 then you will check another uh, another variable here you will check it out whether i have to commute more than 1 hour if i have to commute more than 1 hour i will decline the offer you are getting my point right then you will if you don't have to commute more than one hour then you will still consider this option and then you will check it out for example in this case we are checking it out whether you are getting the free offers also like coffee or some snacks or other things like that if yes then you will accept finally the offer otherwise you will decline the offer you got my point this is how our decision tree works basically decision tree will keep on splitting keep on splitting unless and until you are able to find it out your decision okay so here the decision was shall i accept this or not right so it will keep on splitting keep on splitting unless and until you get your decision whether you do this or not like this example which i have to i have explained you okay now with this what happens is like let me if i go further and explain you further on this decision tree let's understand this more importantly right let's understand this uh, one by one so imagine that this is my data set okay now in my data set you can see that <clears throat> i have various colors given to you it's like a green color yellow color red color red color and a yellow color i am saying if this is a if there is a green color fruit with a diameter of 3 right and i can say it is a mango whereas i am saying if it is a yellow color and a diameter 3 still will be called as a mango if it is a red color with one diameter then it is a grape and it can be a red color with a diameter of one still can be a grape but even a yellow with a diameter of three can be lemon now what is happening in this case is if you have this type of a data set where you want to predict the label of the fruit right you want to predict whether a fruit will be mango whether a fruit will be lemon right or whether a fruit in this case is mango and lemon or grape I have to build a classifier, which is a decision tree classifier on the basis of this data set. Imagine this is a problem statement given to you. Now, first of all, what you will do here is you will take this data set 
right you will take this data set and you will start with a root node root node imagine here is like is my diameter of the fruit greater than or equal to 3 or not okay is my diameter of the fruit greater than or equal to 3 or not if it is greater than or equal to 3 right now if it is greater than or equal to 3 you can see that you have three fruits here three rows of the data set here one is green with 3 mango yellow with 3 lemon yellow with three mango and wherever it fails in the condition you are left with where the diameter is not greater than or equal to three it is less than or equal to three then which are the data set we have red one grape and red one grape okay so i hope you are understanding this right how we have starting with the decision tree with the based on one condition here right which is diameter now based upon this what I will do is I have to split it further here in this case I don't have to split it because I already got the result so if my diameter is greater than or equal to 3 in my data set if the diameter is not equal to greater than or equal to 3 I know it is a grape right whereas if the diameter is greater than or equal to 3 then it can be a mango or it can be a lemon I'm not sure on my decision so what I will do here is I will split it further so I have to split this further here the splitting is not required but if I split this further I may check it out now is the color equal to yellow or not now if the color is equal to yellow then I have two fruit which is your this row which is you know um, your mango or lemon and if the color is not equal to yellow then you will have the another row of the data set which is you know which you are left with right so this is how you have done this work in the case of your decision tree okay and how you will find it out that which type of the criteria or which type of the algorithm i should or which type of criteria or variable i should choose here to split the tree is on the basis of gini index and the information gain which i will illustrate and show you in the few slides from now okay so i hope with this you understand the how your decision tree works basically on the basis of the condition and if you get a pure subset then no need to split it further if there is no pure subset you will keep on splitting keep on splitting unless and until you get a pure subset okay so in this case what has happened is you got 100 percent mango here you got 50 percent mango and 50 percent lemon okay so now this is what uh, i have told you in the previous slide like how does it work right now this all depend upon the gini index basis right now in the next subsequent slide let me tell you and explain you about gini index and information gain how does it work right how does that something works on the basis of uh, your gini index so imagine that you know like imagine that i have a feature here is the color green or not right basis of whether the feature whether you have a color green or not what would happen here is if the color is green you will get this row here if it is not you will get this these two rows here right in the next it may decide on the other basis right it can be is the diameter which is greater than or equal to three or not and many other things okay now let's go ahead the example and the questions which is coming to your mind which is related to you know decision tree terminologies i'm pretty sure you would have these questions in your mind and you would be thinking that how should i decide that which feature i should use and which feature shouldn't i be using this is a question which you had and this is an excellent question for understanding the decision tree but before i go on to that i have to tell you about some of the terminologies which we commonly use while we build the decision tree so first of all decision tree looks like this type of a tree based structure okay so every decision tree will have its root node so root node is where the decision tree will start so it represents the entire population or sample and it is further get divided or into two or more homogeneous sets so as you know that this will be the first feature on the basis of your tree will start like tree start with a root your in this case your decision tree will also start with a root node okay now once you have the root after that in a tree what happens is you will start getting the branches right i hope you understand what is branches in this case we will keep on splitting keep on splitting unless and until we get a decision whether this will happen or not so it's like a branches okay 
then we would also have a parent or a child node so child node is nothing but when you have a branches then the branches can also have the outcomes so in the previous example like for example we have whether the diameter is greater than equal to three or not you remember whether the diameter is greater than equal to three or not if it is true what is happening if it is a false what is happening so this is a child or child node basically this is an intermediate node this is not the final decision which is being made so this is called as a parent or the child node then we also have other terminology here which is splitting which you know that we will keep on splitting unless and until you get a desired node and finally the tree end with the leaf node so always remember one thing you will start your tree with the root node root node is a node with which we will start the decision tree and you will end your decision as decision tree at a leaf node where you will get a decision that you should do this or not okay and now uh pruning is the activity where uh, you you will cut down the decision tree if it is pruned lot amount of times i will even explain you this it is a case of overfitting you shouldn't build thousand you can shouldn't build thousand uh, branches of the tree when it is not even required so i'll, I'll explain you this point now let's move further here and let's see this with the help of an example which was your uh gini index and your information gain right so this is where you were asking me that which question to ask and when right how would you decide that which feature has to be taken first right let's take up an example here and i would encourage every one of you to hear me really fine here because this is on the basis how would you decide or how the algorithm decide to break this further and and i'm explaining you with the help of one simplest example and we will do some maths over it so imagine that there is a data set where i want to find it out whether i will play the match or not okay there is a cricket match or there is a football match or whatever it is i want to find it out whether i will play the match or not okay now how do the decision tree look like decision tree look like this if the outlook if the outlook is humid if the outlook is humid and if the outlook is humid and humidity is very high then i will not play the match on the other hand if the outlook is humid and humidity is normal i may play the match okay if the outlook is absolutely clear then i will always play on the other hand if outlook is windy and the winds are very strong i may not play the match on the other hand if the outlook is windy and the wind are weak i may play the match so now what is happening again is that you are not sure how you decided with outlook how you decided with these nodes here how you decided with these features here let me try to show you this entire data set so this entire data set look like this okay so this is basically your 14 days data set and this exactly happens in the case of your classification based algorithm you will get a data set like this so you can imagine that you want to find it out i would like whether i will play or not right this is what you want to essentially find it want to find it out whether i would play or not on basis of what on basis of four different variables you have four different variables or features in the data set is outlook temperature humidity and wind right so now uh, it can be like if the outlook is sunny temperature is hot humidity is high wind is not there i will not play the match this is how you will read this one data point right similarly i have multiple data point now i have to decide how can i build a decision tree and out of these four features which feature should i use first as my root node right so this is what i have to decide and let's do it uh, accordingly right so now what i'll do from here is uh, we i will illustrate you what is gini index what is information gain and how does this happens right and this is basically used to build your decision tree so before i make you understand about gini index or information gain one thing which you should always remember is to understand the concept of impurity what is impurity impurity is nothing but you can see there is a basket where you have apples 
right now if you have a basket which is of apple and another uh, tray it is written the label as apple now in this case you will never make a mistake you will never make a mistake because here you have an apple here you have only one label so everything will be perfect it will be 100 percent basically there is no impurity there is no problem in your data set right on the other hand let me flip the story in this case imagine that i have different fruits in the basket which is like apple you have a banana you have a grapes you have a you know cherries and many other things right and you have many apples many labels here in this case try imagining you have to match each fruit with its label right now in this case the impurity cannot be equal to zero the impurity will not be equal to zero in this case because what would happen here is that you have a chances of misclassification right this is a very important concept right when you have perfect thing the misclassification will not happen but whereas if you have a multiple labels with multiple fruit misclassification or impurities will not be equal to zero right so this is associated with a term called as entropy maybe in your childhood days you have learned about entropy in your chemistry class in a simple sense what is entropy entropy is a randomness of the space sample space whenever you are not sure on your decision then entropy will be more imagine that i'm giving you the data set where it is like 51 percent of doing this thing 49 percent of not doing this thing 51 percent chance that the employee may leave the organization 49 percent chance that employee may not leave the organization so basically you are not sure on your decision if you are not sure on your decision then the entropy will be very high on the other hand if you are very sure on your decision then the entropy will be very low so basically we need that feature which can provide us lowest entropy rather than the highest entropy uh, to select as that as a good feature so we generally find it out entropy by the help of this formula what we simply do is don't get scared with this formula because everything happens automatically in r or python right imagine just look at this formula what is this formula this formula says that what is the probability that something will happen multiply by log base 2 probability that something will happen subtract this with probability that something will not happen into log base 2 probability that something will not happen okay let's take up an example don't worry about it uh, let's take up an example that probability that i will win the match you will apply here and probability that i will not play the match or win the match you will apply here and then you will calculate the entropy let's take uh, you know an example how you can do this in our case so in our case let me show you yeah how we will build the decision tree in our case in our case you just see here what is happening is that we have uh, 14 instances <clears throat> or 14 rows of the data set where nine times if you see it i will play the match and five times i will not play the match okay so if you see carefully there are nine labels where i'm playing the match and there are five labels where i'm not playing the match right so first of all i have to find it out the total entropy how i will find the total entropy this is being determined by probability that i will play the match sub multiply this with log base power 2 probability that i will play the match what are the chances that i will play the match 9 out of 14 all of you will be with me right this is 9 out of 14 multiply with log base 2 9 out of 14 subtract this with what is the probability that i will not play the match 5 out of 14 multiply this with log base 2 5 out of 14 so once you calculate this you will find it out the entropy of this entire system entropy of this entire system is 0.94 okay so this is the entropy of your entire sample space this is the first thing now how this entropy will help you in selecting which features you will take or not so let's go further so now we will take each feature one by one whether i should take outlook whether i should take temperature whether i should pick up humidity or whether should i pick up windy right let's go one by one now first i'm plotting for outlook imagine for outlook 
how many times uh, so what are the distinct value of outlook outlook can be sunny outlook can be overcast or outlook can be rainy right these are the three different combinations you can have for outlook now if the outlook is sunny two times i'm playing three times i'm not playing the match if the outlook is overcast i'm always playing the match if the outlook is rainy three times i'm playing two times i'm not playing the match right this is how i have bifurcated it what i will do in the next iteration is let me find it out the entropy of outlook okay so if we start with outlook uh, remember this formula which is you know probability that i will play multiply with the probability that i will play right and subtract with probability which i will not play and log base 2 of not playing so 2 by 5 is a chances that i will not i will play into log base 2 2 by 5 this is a subtraction here right with i will play and log 3 by 3 by 5 i will play right so you will calculate this entropy when outlook is sunny yeah so you got this entropy when the outlook is sunny is 0.971 accordingly you will proceed with calculating the entropy when the outlook is overcast outlook is overcast always you are playing right if the outlook is overcast every time you are playing so it means that you will get a probability of zero if you apply in that formula you will get zero and third what 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 would happen if the if the outlook is sunny in that case you will again multiply and you will put the formula and you will get it out 0.971 right so you will find it out entropy for each and every distinct combination of your feature you got my point right outlook being sunny outlook being overcast outlook being sunny uh, uh, you know uh, uh, overcast sunny and rainy this should be replaced here right and then what you will do is you will finally calculate the information gain information gain is nothing but what you will do is you will pick it up the chances you will pick it up the entire chances when you are playing right which is 5 out of 14 you remember 5 out of 14 were the total chances that i will play into if it is sunny plus 4 out of 14 if it is overcast 5 out of 14 if it is rainy right and you will calculate the information from this outlook and once you calculate the information you will subtract this information from your total entropy which i found it out in the last slide which was 0.94 you will subtract this and you will get the information gain or this is also called as a information gain from a particular feature so basically these type of a calculation first of all don't get scared away that you have to do this calculation but what i'm trying to explain you is this is how your algorithm will work for each and every feature it will calculate the information gain from your feature right if you have the more information gain it means that this variable is of very very important in predicting that something will happen or not okay so for outlook i got the information gain as 0.247 with all the calculation remember then we will proceed with wind if the wind is uh, there or not right and then i will proceed with wind and i will calculate the information gain and say information gain i found it out is 0 0.048 right similarly we will calculate for all the four of them let me put it together for all of you so this is what happens here now if i put in front of all of you these were the four different uh, variable i have outlook temperature humidity and wind right i am calculating the information gain for each one of them and the information gain i got for outlook is 0.247 so if the information gain is highest in a particular feature that feature will become your root node you got my point so therefore we will pick it up outlook as our root node similarly for when the tree get started later on as a branch node also your information gain will be calculated and wherever whichever feature is giving you more information gain that will be picked up later in the dis, dis, uh, your tree also so this is how you will build your decision tree and you will finally get a decision tree like this okay so now what i will do is um, you know like i will quickly show you how do we do the decision tree uh, in your python okay so i'll show you how do you do this in python and then i will uh, summarize for all of you 
that why decision trees or tree based algorithms are better than your uh, other algorithm okay so how do you choose basically that which algorithm you will select and when okay so i'll i'll describe you this but before let's jump on to python and go there so what i have done here is like i had built uh, the decision tree in front uh, like uh, you know already so quickly i will walk you through the commands okay so what happens here is that um, uh, in python uh, as you would be well versed with this that we generally import packages in python so i'm importing numpy i'm importing matplotlib for plotting the chart i'm uh, importing various packages from your sk learn which is for machine learning purposes right so i am importing your label encoder your decision tree classifier classification report and i also i am importing your uh, tree right so we have all this which i am importing right after i import what i will do is i am reading my my data set so i am showing you this with the help of our iris data set which is one of the very popular data set for building the a decision tree right for any particular source so imagine that this is my data set and i'm just showing you six rows of the data set where you know like uh, uh, i want to find it out whether a particular flower species will be citosa versicolor or virginica i have three different flowers which i want to predict and on the basis of sepal length petal length sepal width and petal width so basically i have different dimensions of flowers length and width and based on that i want to find it out whether the particular species will be citosa versicolor or virginica you got my point right so this is a data set so what i will do is i as you know with every machine learning data set we play with the data set so i'm checking the information here uh, like uh, what type of the data type it is so sepal length it is a float uh, petal length it is a float and species is a object why object because this is a categorical column so after this i am also checking whether there is any null value present in the data set or not because if there is any null value then we have to get rid of that null value or we have to replace that null value with some imputed value right this is what i am checking here once i do that i am also plotting this because we usually do visualization right to understand the data set better so what i am doing here in the with the help of sns which is your sns dot pair plot i am plotting all the possible plots so basically sepal length with sepal width what type of the combination look like so citosa versicolor and virginica there are three different species you can see in the data set and this is what i am getting a trend between your sepal length and sepal width similarly this is basically from sepal width to petal length right so this is how i am understanding the patterns or i am understanding the relationship between the variables in the data set so this is what i am understanding here i am also checking whether there is a correlation or not higher the shade it means there will be a strong correlation so all of these things is being done as a part of exploratory data analysis before even you start your machine learning model right once you do this after that what i have to do is after that what i am trying to do is i am taking your species column what i want to predict as my target variable which is your dependent variable and what i so this is my the dependent variable and with the help of what i want to predict will be my independent variable so i am calling x all my independent variable and i am calling target as my dependent variable once i do this then you will also think about it that you are um, the variable which i want to predict is the flower species right but i want to convert this into zero and one class zero one two class because your computer cannot understand text right computer can only understand the numbers so what i am doing here is i am uh, changing it to the uh, i am changing it to the class right so what i am trying to do here is i am saying wherever it is citosa it will become zero wherever it is virginica it will become one and it is versicolor as a third category it will become two so now imagine my data set my label to predict becomes zero one or two instead of three flower which was citosa versicolor and virginica this is what i am doing with the encoder here once i convert this and this become my target what i will do is as i told you that i will split this data set into training and test data set so basically 80% of the data is going into the uh, training data set and remaining 20% i am taking as a test data set okay now i will call decision tree classifier you know like i want to make a decision tree and i want to fit this on my training data set and the test data set 
and uh, i will start uh, building the decision tree and uh, with the help of you know from uh, so here is when i have created the decision tree and here is when i am checking the prediction how accurate my decision tree is so i got my precision which is good i got my recall i got my f1 score and i also get the support right so all these matrices are being used to calculate your uh, how accurate your predictions are so higher the precision better the results would be right and finally i am showing to you that how does the tree look like so i had tried to uh, plot this decision tree in front of you so basically it start with peter length and you can see the gini index coming up here or the information gain which is information gain and gini index are reciprocal to each other if you want to use information gain you will get that score if you don't want to use information gain you will get gini index so they are both reciprocal of each other it is one and the same thing you use gini index or you use information gain they are the two different matrix to built your decision tree so you can see that <clears throat> based on a peter length the tree gets splitted like this then based on the peter length uh, of different dimensions your tree further split then it further split then it further split and finally you get to know that whether the particular species will be versicolor or virginica okay so this is how your entire decision tree is built in python okay so this is how it's so simple i know uh, it takes time to build this thing but once you are a good data scientist and you understand all these things it is very simple to build all these things very easily in python or r right so now uh, finally going back how would you decide how would you decide that which algorithm you know which algorithm will be taken when so uh what happens is this is on the basis of scikit learn so it it starts something like this okay so it is on the basis of like this that first of all you see here that um, whether how many samples you have how many data points you have in a data set right if you have more than 50 samples then you will go here if you have less than 50 data point then you know you will go here so you will get more data set right so if you have more data if you have uh, greater than 50 data point then you will go further you split your data set if it is not then you will you just the kind advice it get more data set okay so then you will decide at what you want to predict if you have a label data set then you will go here right and do clustering if you don't have the label data set then you will see whether you want to predict a quantity if yes you will go in regression if you want to predict uh, if you just want to do exploratory analysis you can do dimensional reduction if you have a label data set uh, you know for classification you can do all this classification so basically this is a cheat sheet which we generally use to decide that what we have to do with the data set and when let's understand what is a random forest. So random forest is constructed by using multiple decision trees and the final decision is obtained by majority votes of these decision trees. So let me make things very simple for you by taking an example. Now suppose we have got three independent decision trees. Yeah, we are just taking three decision trees and I've got an unknown fruit and I want that uh, these trees would give me a result of what exactly this fruit is. So I pass this fruit to the first decision tree, the second decision tree, and the third decision tree. Now a random forest is nothing but a combination of these decision trees. So the results are being fed into the random forest algorithm. So what it sees is that, okay, the first decision tree classifies it as peach. The second decision tree says that it is an apple. And the third one says that it is a peach. So random forest classifier says that, okay, I've got the result as two peach and one for an apple so i would say that the unknown fruit is an peach all right so this is based on the majority voting of the decision trees and that is how a random forest classifier comes to a decision of predicting the unknown value okay so this was a classification problem so it took the majority vote now suppose if it was a regression problem it would have taken mean of it Okay, so now let's move on further to understanding what is a decision tree. But before that, we should understand that random forest, the building blocks are decision trees. And that's why studying decision tree becomes important because if we understand one decision tree, we can apply the same concept to random forest. Okay, 
So now let's move on forward and understand the important terms in random forest. And this will also help us consolidate whatever we have learned so far. So we've taken the same small decision tree of the previous example. And let's understand these are also the important terms which will be relevant to random forest also. So the first is the root node. Now here what happens is that the entire training data has been fed to the root node. And then we've got here that each node will ask either true or false question with respect to one of the feature. And then in response to that question, it will partition the data set into different subsets. That's what it is It is doing here based on the condition that it, if the mass body mass is greater than or equal to 3500, it asks a question either yes or no. And based on that, again, for the partition is done. And if not, then it just classifies the species. And then again, what happens is that the splitting. Now, this is very important here. The splitting takes place either with the help of a Gini or entropy methods. And these helps to decide the optimal split. And we will be discussing about splitting methods very soon, right? Okay. And then we've got the decision nodes, which provide the link to the leaf nodes. And these are really important because then only the leaf nodes would tell us what actually the real predictions or to which class does the species belong. So now coming to the leaf node and these are the endpoints where no further division will take place and we will obtain our predictions, okay? So now coming up to another important thing here is working of random forest. So now for working of random forest, we will have to understand a few important concepts like random sampling with replacement, feature selection, and also the ensemble technique, which is used in random forest and that is bootstrap aggregation, which is also known as bagging. So we will understand this with the help of an example, which will be very simple. And then we will go on understanding how feature selection is done in both the classification and the regression problem. Actually, how random forests select features for the construction of decision trees. Well, in random forest, the best split is chosen based on Gini impurity or information gain methods. So this also we will understand. Now, let us first understand random sampling with replacement. Now, what happens here is that we've got a small subset of the same penguin data set, wherein we've got some six rows and four features, that means four columns. And the arrows that you can see is that now we will be creating three subsets from this small subset, right? And these three subsets will become our decision trees. And then we'll be constructing decision trees from these subsets. So let us create our first subset. And you can see here that the subset is randomly being created. And for convenience sake, let me just also show you the different subsets here. Okay, so now for better understanding, let us understand this, that in the first subset, if we focus, we've got certain random rows here and we've got certain feature, but we do not know how this feature has been selected. We got island and we got body mass, but in the second subset, we got island and flipper length. And in the third subset, we got body mass and flipper length, right? Now let's look at the rows. Now, when I am talking about these features, I will say this is feature selection. And remember this term. Now coming to the second concept, that is random sampling. Now random sampling is nothing but selecting randomly from your subset. So I'm selecting randomly certain rows from my subset and creating further subset. Okay, so what is replacement here? Replacement is can be seen here and can be understood with this second subset. We see here that the Gento species, this row is being repeated again. And this is replacement. That means that when we are working with repeated rows and this row can be repeated again in the second or the third subset, then this is random sampling with replacement. That means my random forest can use a row multiple times in multiple decision trees, right? So this is the basic concept of random sampling with replacement and feature selection in random forest. Another important term which I would like to bring into the notice is that when we are working with these type of small subsets, these are also known as a bootstrap data sets. And when we aggregate the results of all these data set, it becomes bootstrap aggregation. So just filling in the gaps so that later on the concepts become more clear. So now let's move on to drawing decision trees of these subsets, okay? So let's draw the decision tree of the first subset. Again, we are taking body mass as the first root node and then based on a decision like 
if the mass is greater than or equal to 3500 then take a decision either yes or no if it is no then the species is chin strip and if it is yes then again you partition based on island and if it is togresin then it is adli and if it is bisco then it is gento species okay so this is how we will construct two more decision trees of the remaining subsets so the second subset let us just again create decision tree and here now we are taking flipper length and then based on a condition that if the flipper length is greater than or equal to 190 then make a split if it is yes then the species become gento and if it is no that means again make a decision based on island and if it is togresin it is edily and if the island is dream island then it is a chin strep species so this is how the decision tree of the second subset has been created and this is how it will take decisions right based on the tree length depth and also the features it is selecting okay so now let's create the third decision tree of the third subset and we get a decision tree something like this where in body mass if it is greater than 4000 and if it is yes then clearly it is a gento species and if it is no then again make a partition with the with respect to flipper length another feature here and then if it is again greater than or equal to 190 then the species would be edily else it would be chin strep so this is how decision tree 3 will make a decision now let's just keep these decision trees with us okay and we will make sense of these trees just in a while okay but before that, let us understand how feature selection is done in a random forest. How am I selecting the columns? So for classification, by default, the feature selection is taken as the square root of total number of all the features. Now, suppose I've got here four features. So it is a classification problem. I will take the square root of these four features, which becomes two. So decision tree would be constructed based on two features each. If suppose I had 16 features, then it would be square root of 16. That would be four. So four features would be taken in each decision tree. All right. And suppose if this would have been a regression problem, then by default, what would happen? The features would be selected by taking the total number of features and dividing them by three. Okay. So this is how by default, the feature selection is being done by a random forest. Okay. Now let us move on forward to consolidating our learning. So now we are coming to ensemble techniques that is also known as bootstrap aggregation. Random forest uses ensemble techniques. And what is ensembling? It just means that you are aggregating the result of the decision trees and taking the majority vote in case of classification and the mean in case of regression problems and giving the output. Okay. So now we have again plotted all our decision trees here. And below we can see that there's an unknown data and I want to predict the species of this data. So what will happen is that again, let us just feed this problem to each of the decision tree and let's see what each decision tree makes the prediction. So I just feed this unknown data to decision tree one and it says that, okay, the species seems to be chin strip. Okay. And then decision tree two says that based on the data, it has been found that the species is elderly. And then decision tree three says that, no, I, I, with my decision tree, this species is chin strip. Okay, now all these data has been fed to random forest classifier. And it says that, okay, for chin stripe, I've got two votes. For edily, it's got one vote. So the new species would be chin stripe, right? So this is how the bootstrap aggregation is done based on the majority voting and the decisions taken by different decision trees. They have been combined together, aggregated, and we get an ensembled result in the random forest okay so this was very simple concept of ensemble techniques which has been used in random forest okay so now let's move on forward to splitting methods so what are the splitting methods that we use in random forest so splitting methods are many like Gini impurity information gain or chi square so let's discuss about Gini impurity so Gini impurity is nothing but it is used to predict the likelihood that a randomly selected example would be incorrectly classified by a specific node. And it is called impurity metric because it shows how the model differs from a pure division, right? And another interesting fact about Gini impurity is that the impurity ranges from zero to one with zero indicating that all of the elements belong to a single class and one indicates that only one class exists. Now value, which is 
like 0.5. This indicates that the elements, they are uniformly distributed across some classes, right? Now, moving on forward to information gain. Now, this is another splitting method which random forest can use. And information gain utilizes entropy. So entropy is nothing but it is a measure of uncertainty. So information gain, let's talk about that first. So the features they are selected that provide most of the information about a class, right? And this utilizes the entropy concept. So let's see what is entropy. This is a measure of randomness or uncertainty in the data, right? So we will understand this entropy with the help of a small example. So don't worry about it. So let's understand this entropy. Now, suppose there's a fruit tray with four different fruits, right? And... Uh, what do you feel about the entropy here? That means the randomness of the data. Is it really easy to classify these fruits into the respective class? So this becomes really uncertain and the data looks messy here. But what if we just split here these into two trays, wherein the first tray would have peaches and oranges, and in the second tray will have apples and lemons. So now this becomes a little more certain. We get low randomness here and this is called as low entropy so when we move down from tree that means from root node to the leaf nodes the entropy reduces and we can also calculate information gain from this entropy that is the difference in entropy before and after the split that is known as information gain okay so once we move down the tree and start reducing the randomness from the data the entropy becomes lower and that is what we want in our data. If there's low entropy, that means we are likely that the predictions would be more accurate and we can make predictions very easily as compared to very messy data, which has high entropy. Okay, so that was about entropy. And now let us just move on to the practical demonstration or a hands-on on random forest. Okay, so now it's time for a hands-on on random forest. So let us just import a few basic libraries of Python in our Jupyter Notebook. And we will run this. We will import pandas, SPD, numpy as NP, and Seaborn as SNS. Now Seaborn is need needed here because we want to load a data set, that is a penguins data set, with the help of Seaborn. And this has already been preloaded in Seaborn. This is already loaded data set and Seaborn has got multiple data sets, you know, for practice for beginners. So it is a good way to practice for data sets. Now, we can see this asterisk sign that means it is telling us to wait. So let us just let it get loaded. So we get got our data in an object called DF and we can see the first five entries here. And this uh, data frame is shown in the form of a table, rows and columns. And we see here some species, island, bill length, bill depth, flipper length, body mass and the sex of the penguin. So our task is to specify or to classify these species of penguins into the respective correct species, right? So we see the shape of our data and we see that it is like 344 rows and seven columns. And we will see the info. So we see df.info and this gives us along with the non-null count, we also get the data type of the values. So we have got species island as the object data type, whereas the build length, build depth, triple length and body mass are in floating point or you can say floating uh, data type. And the sex is in object data type. Right. So now moving on forward to calculating how many null values are there with the help of df dot is null dot sum. So we get certain like some around uh, two null values in all these columns, as you can say, the features like build length, build depth, flipper length and body mass, whereas there are 11 null values in sex feature. Right. So what we do is since they are very small null values, we can just drop it or we can also ignore them. So here in this data frame, what I'm doing is I'm just dropping these null values and let us just check whether they, they are being dropped or not with the help of again, the same function dot is null dot sum. And then we see that, yes, they are being dropped from our data frame. Now let us do some feature engineering with our data. Now we have seen that we have got some object data type in our data frame. And before feeding it into algorithm that is random forest, we have to transform the categorical data or the object data type into the numeric. So we are using here one hot encoding to convert the categorical data into numeric. Now there are various ways in Python which we can do that, like one hot encoding, or you can also use a mapping function in Python. But here we are using one hot encoding. So let us just do that. And we find here, first of all, let us apply it on the sex column. And here we see that we have got two unique values in sex, that is male and female. 
and we use pandas here to get dummies that is how we will apply this one hot encoding because this is how get dummies work so what happens is here is that the new unique values are converted into the respective columns in the data frame so we see here we have got two unique values males and female and they are being converted into the columns okay so one thing to note here is that we also get a problem of dummy trap because here we see only two unique values now suppose if i had six or seven unique values and i do this one hot encoding i would have lots of features in my data frame and that would lead to several complexities so what i do is uh, to keep things simple i can use one hot encoding when my data frame or my unique counts are low when my unique values are less so since I had just two or three, I can use it. So I'm using here. So what I do is again, now one row, one column, as we can see here that it is redundant, giving me extra information. So I will just drop it. So I drop this first column and what I get in this data frame is only male. So let us just infer whether I can also infer females from this or not. So if the value is one, that means the penguin is a male. And if the value is zero, that means the penguin is a female. Okay, so only one column is needed for this data frame. So I just kept one and dropped the another one. Okay, now apply again one hot encoding to the island feature. So in island, if we check the unique values, we've got three unique values here Togerson, Bisco, and Dream Island. And the object is the data type, right? So again, we will use pandas pd.getdummies and we will use apply it on the feature island and let's get the head of it. So we get here again the unique values were converted into columns and we get here respective three columns and then again we will just drop the first column to get the remaining two columns so here also we can infer that if the island is togerson if it is one then it is not dream neither bisco right so this is how we can read it from the data frame and understand that now remember this thing that these two island and here sex these are two independent data frames these are not yet included in the main data frame so what we will do now is we will concatenate the above two data frames into the original data frame. So what we do, we again create a new data frame that is new data. And let us just concat with the help of pd.concat function. And we will concat what? df, island and sex. And x is one, that means in the column. Okay. So when we will run this, let's see the head of it. So everything gets concatenated in a single data frame, which is good for the feeding this data into or splitting the data into test and train data. So now we have this new data frame and we've got some repeated columns here which needs to be deleted. So what we do is we will delete sex and island here which are just repeating because we've got here male and we have also got here dream and togerson. So we do not require this island column, neither the sex. So we just drop it with the help of uh, new data dot drop and the column names x is one in place equals to true, right? And let's see the head of this data frame. Head of the data frame gives me five unique values, right? And now it is time to create a separate target variable. And what we'll do is we will store in a variable called y only species. So what we do is from this new data dot species, we will just store the species in this y. And we see this y dot head, that is the first five species. And we got the values here. That means another target variable is being created now. So, and you can also see the y dot unique values as Edelie, Chinstrap, and Gentoo. So now we see here three unique values of the penguin, that is Chinstrap, Edelie, and Gentoo. And the data type is object here. So again, we need to convert this object into the numeric data type. So now what we are doing is we are using the map function in Python. And what we do is we map Edelie to zero, Chinstrap to one, and Gentoo to two. So this is how we see that all the values are being mapped to numeric this is another way to convert a categorical value into a numeric value in python now what we do is let us just drop the target value species from our main data frame so we just drop it and let's see our new data frame so we see that we don't have any target species here right okay so in x let's store this new data and perform the splitting of the data so what we do is from sklearn.model selection we will import our train test split and we will split our training data into 70% and 30%. So test data becomes 30% and training data is some 70%. And this random state is zero, which means that I'm not fixing any random state. And this is also used for the code reproducibility. Now, suppose if I again run this code, I will get the same result. It will not change. 
you can set this random state to any of the random number as per your choice and the result would differ okay so now let us print the shape of x train y train x test and y test so we see here that it has been split into 70 and 30 percent and we get x train as 233 values here and seven features and x test has 100 values and seven features similarly y train you can see 233 values and y test has 100 values that means the species okay so that has been perfectly splitted into 70 and 30 percent now what we do is we will train the random forest classifier on the training set how do we do it we will import the random forest classifier from sklearn.ensemble so we've already dealt with what is ensemble and then in classifier we will store this random forest and this n estimator is nothing but decision tree so we are creating some five decision trees here and the criteria is entropy and again random state is set to zero so let's see and then we will fit this x train and y train so this has been fitted and the criteria is entropy here all right so now let's make some predictions and let's create a variable called y predict and we will just predict it on x test and we have also printed this Y prediction. And now let's print the confusion matrix to check the accuracy of random forest algorithm. And what we do is from matrices, SQL and matrices, we will import classification report and confusion matrix and also the accuracy score. So we will just import them. And then in CM variable, we will print the confusion matrix of Y test and Y predictions. So we will print it and we see here the accuracy score also, which is 98%. So our random forest classifier is giving us a very good accuracy of 98%. And you can see a confusion matrix that only two cases have been misclassified. Rest all the cases have been correctly classified by random forest classifier. Okay, so now let's move on to printing the classification report of Y test and Y prediction. Let's see. And we get the precision as 96%. That means the two predictions by the algorithm is 96%. The recall or the true prediction rate is 100%, which is very nice. And F1 score is also good, which is 98%. So this is giving us a good result. But what if, if we change the criteria from entropy to Gini? So let's just experiment with that too. So let's try this with the different number of trees and change the criteria to Gini coefficient. So now again, from sklearn.ensemble, we will import random forest classifier and fit it okay and here what we are doing is just we are using seven trees previously we used five and now in the criteria we will use Gini coefficient and random state is zero so let's run this and see whether there is a change in accuracy or not and let's predict this and let's check the accuracy score what is the accuracy score for this random forest classifier with seven trees so we get 99 percent accuracy with changing the criteria and changing the number of trees so you can just experiment with different number of trees and different number of decision trees. Let's just experiment with, you know, 12 decision trees and see what happens. So you can see the accuracy reduced to 98%. Okay. With seven, we were getting 99. So let's just keep seven because it is giving us really good accuracy. So this is about random forest classifier and how it works with several trees and different criteria to give us very good accuracy on our training and test data. The case that we are discussing is basically the KNN algorithm, which is an algorithm which we used for mostly supervised machine learning, which is where you have labeled data. Okay, so what is KNN algorithm? So, as we said, KNN algorithm is K nearest neighbors algorithm, and it is an example of supervised learning algorithm where basically you try to classify. A new data point based on the neighbors of that data point which is basically which data points are closer to it for example here as you can see you have on one side couple of cats and on the other side you have couple of on one side you have dogs and on the other side you have cats right now if a new data uh, point is given to us there is a picture of a new animal and if it is lying somewhere here right then we know that it is nearer to the cats right and therefore we will classify it as cat whereas if it is sort of uh, nearer to the dogs then we classify it as dog right so that's the like you know neighborhood for the dog 
and therefore we sort of uh, classify it that new animal or the new picture as as being or that of a dog and this is quite uh, uh, you know this is something which is we even see in our in our regular day to day life right you know we have had examples where our parents keep telling us okay don't play with those kinds of you know children or something because they are not good in their studies or probably they are not uh, so good in their behavior because you would become like them right so it's again an example from real life of classifying a particular person based on the company that they keep right or from the uh, with the kind of people that they are so that's that's sort of uh, the example and now let me actually go back okay what are the features of of k nearest neighbors algorithm okay so let's talk about uh, the features of knn so as as i said knn is a supervised learning algorithm typically it is uh, you know uh, used for supervised learning kind of problems it's very simple as we mentioned intuitively you can, uh, you know it's about you know what kind of neighbors do you have so your class is predicted based on the your nearest neighbors as the name suggests and then it's a non parametric technique so i would like to spend a couple of minutes here to discuss about what we mean by by non parametric so typically you know the supervised machine learning algorithms are of two kinds right one is the parametric types and the second one is the non parametric type when we say parametric what we mean is basically that the machine or the algorithm assumes that there is an underlying function uh, or a distribution that is known of the particular data set like for example the linear regression would assume that the uh, relationship between two two things x and y is is linear in nature right um and 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 similarly for a distribution a gaussian distribution it would assume a normal distribution of the data points and so on so uh, a lot of the supervised machine learning algorithms they assume some kind of function association between the predictor which is basically the root causes which help you in predicting and the variable that you are trying to predict whereas there are certain algorithms like the knn or the parson window or the linear discriminant analysis which is of the kind which is called non parametric because it does not assume any particular kind of distribution or any particular kind of functional relationship of the data that you are trying to you know predict or you are trying to learn the the pattern of so knn is one of the kind as i said parson window is another one uh, which is basically where you uh, in in parson window essentially you know the the volume of the data set uh, or, or the area that the data set covers is known whereas you are trying to find the k there where uh, which is the number of data points within that area or the volume right whereas in case of non parametric technique like knn it's the opposite where the k is known which is basically you would like to associate the class of of the data point that you are trying to predict based on the k number of neighbors around it now k can be 3 4 5 whatever right 10 20 and so on essentially the difference between parson window and knn is that in knn you already know the k and then from the k you try to find out the volume and therefore then you try to find the the probability or the density underlying distribution and then there is the the discriminant analysis which is of again two kinds linear discriminant and multiple discriminant analysis where basically what you do is you you transform the underlying data the features into a higher dimension and in such a way that in the new feature space after you have transformed the data you now try to apply a parametric approach like for example you will try to project the features onto a line or if it is on a sub subspace which is higher dimension than a line then essentially it becomes multiple discriminant analysis so basically um, those are the three kinds of non parametric techniques so even if you were not able to sort of get the full hang of what these three types are what you need to keep in mind is that non parametric technique does not assume any kind of distribution or any kind of functional relationship 
of the underlying data and therefore it gives us a lot of flexibility whereas the parametric techniques they basically assume some kind of functional relationship between the data points uh, or they assume some kind of distribution so where would you use a non parametric versus a parametric technique right so basically you would use non parametric technique uh, you know where you do not know about the functional relationship that is one second is that you know there is uh, uh, maybe let's say large amount of data and so on and thirdly a uh, non parametric technique like knn does not work in a very high dimensional data so you would also use parametric techniques in that case whereas if you have you know smaller data sets you would use uh, you know typically non parametric techniques and then also if you know understand that the relationship between the data points might be for example linear or something like that you would use a parametric technique so you are assuming that there is some kind of relationship uh, like a linear relationship or something like that between the data point so that's where you will use the parametric technique so again just to summarize basically non parametric is an approach where you do not assume any kind of distribution or functional relationship whereas parametric assumes a functional relationship or basically a distribution between the data points the other feature of knn is that it is a lazy algorithm so what do we mean by lazy algorithm actually in most of the supervised uh, learning algorithms uh, you basically train your model on the training data set then you have your model and then you apply this particular model to the test data set to then classify or predict uh, you know for example whether a new image is that of a cat or a dog right so this can be you know some kind of algorithm like support vector machine or regression or logistic regression or whatever right so you run this logistic regression or you run this re regression or support vector machine on the training data set and it learns the features or it learns the parameters of the model from that data set and then applies this learnt model on the test data set whereas in case of knn actually there is no training step at all that's why it's called a lazy algorithm because what it does is at the time that you are actually now want to predict at that point in time actually it will go and it will do all the calculations of the distance of the new data point like for example the new image of the cat or dog from all the other data points that you have so it will calculate all the distances and then will check for the those data points which are or the k data points which are nearest to this so that's why it's called lazy algorithm because nothing happens till the point or no calculations happen till the point you are actually trying to predict something so there is no training step involved okay and then it's used for both classification and regression as we just mentioned so it can be used to predict the values as well as be able to classify something like you know okay whether it is a cat or dog or if you are trying to let's say predict some value some forecast or something that for that also you can use it and then it is based on feature similarity which is basically what do we mean by feature similarity so feature can be things like if for example you know you are looking at classifying cats versus dog right so is the eyes like a dog that can be one of the features is the how do the ears look that can be one of the features what about the tongue the face and so on so there can be multiple such features and how similar it uh, these features are between two data points which is used basically uh, by the knn algorithm and then as i said there is no training step involved so these are the features of knn algorithm and therefore now let's look at actually just some simple examples of how it works so as you can see here in this slide we have two classes of data so one is the all these blue data points and there is another one which is the orange data points now if you have a new data point which is this pink one here which class should it belong to should it belong to class a or should it belong to class b so what you would do is you would actually start calculating the distance of this pink data point from every square or blue triangle data point and then you will decide uh, you will have to assume a particular k let's say k is 3 right which is i am looking at the nearest three data points 
and in that case basically as you can see if we draw this circle right then we see that two of the nearest data points within that circle is of the square orange kind so basically we will predict that this particular new data point belongs to class a whereas k value was 7 right as in this particular example now you would see that four out of the seven is actually of the blue triangle kind and therefore we will now classify it as belonging to class b so essentially this prediction changes as you can see here depending on what is the k value so therefore the question is what should be the value of k right and typically what happens is you run a trial and error and basically you come up with okay what is the best k value but essentially what one needs to understand is that as the value of k increases basically the the partition line starts moving towards becoming more and more linear so it starts becoming less flexible and it starts assuming some kind of a linear dividing line or something like that so what happens is that in that as you increase the k your bias basically increases but your variation reduces so we know that in classification problems or in machine learning problems bias and variance are two things that we are trying to manage right bias is basically how close you are to the actual class or how, or to the actual uh, value whereas variation is how much va variability is there in your prediction so uh, as the k increases the bias sort of increases but the variance reduces and then it is vice versa so if your k decreases let's say at k is equal to 1 where you are only looking at just one nearest neighbor and then predicting based on that actually the bias is the least which means it is the most flexible k is equal to 1 is the will give you the most flexible uh, sort of demarcating line or function whereas the variability will be the maximum so that that's the sort of the trade off and that's how we actually determine k so we have to get a k value in such a way based on trial and error that sort of maximizes our uh, sort of or reduces the bias as well as the variance and and that's the kind of optimization we are trying to do okay so how do we calculate the distance itself right and distance typically can be of many kinds so you know the example here is of the euclidean distance but you can have other kinds of distances like manhattan distance or Mahalanobis distance and you can look up references for other kinds of distances now Euclidean dis distance is calculated for the point p1 and p2 as given here essentially Euclidean distance is nothing but the you know square root of sum of the x coordinates of these two points p1 and p2 and then y coordinate square of uh, of of these two points p1 and p2 and uh, this is just an example of one kind of distance and other kinds of distances like Manhattan or Mahalanobis are also there and then this calculating this distance becomes quite challenging especially in cases where you know you are trying to for example calculate let's say how close two LinkedIn profiles are right or trying to classify uh, the category of electrocardiogram and so on and so forth so there we have to bring in more creativity to just decide what kind of distance to use okay now let's move ahead we will now talk of some use cases where KNN can be used and this is an example of how KNN can be used for book recommendations. So if you have purchased books on Amazon or wherever, right? Some of these recommendations are based on on KNN algorithm and then you know as we said, you know KNN is like based on features, right? So maybe let's say what will be the nearest neighbors of a particular book? It can be based on who is the author? What is the topic and so on and so forth? and then there are other use cases like i mentioned so for classifying satellite images for classifying handwritten digits uh, on on image analytics or or for classifying electrocardiograms um, etc uh, you know typically knn can be used okay so now actually we will get into some hands on okay so to start the hands on session i'll go to this jupiter notebook that I already have installed on my system and I have a certain code written which uh, we will take two examples 
both the examples are based on data sets which are available in the open source so you can easily get access to that data so what we do is we start by importing the necessary libraries so we import pandas seaborn numpy and matplotlib basically pandas and numpy are there for doing the data manipulation and also for storing data as matrices or as arrays and and be able to perform some mathematical procedures on them and then seaborn is basically used for plotting and matplotlib for plotting as well and this line here get ipython just helps us to run the images that we will be creating in line with jupyter notebook instead of opening up a new window so let's run this and what it will do is it will import all these packages for us which we are going to use and then we will first import the breast cancer data that is available in your scikit-learn data sets so we import that and then let's just initialize that data into a variable here called cancer so cancer here represents all the load the breast cancer data and now we will let's actually look at what this data is it's a bunch of attributes in this uh, dictionary here so you have data the target which is basically nothing but whether it is a cancer or not so whether it is malignant or benign malignant means it's a bad cancer and benign means well it's just a tumor it's not cancerous targets name description feature names which is basically uh, the features that will tell us whether a particular um, case belongs to cancerous or, or non-cancer or malignant or benign and then actually let's just print the description of this particular data here so as you can see uh, we can use this uh, command to print the description here and then we see that there are 569 data points with about 30 attributes and these attributes are radius texture parameter etc and uh, the, the max and min values of those are given here and then now let's look at some of the feature names so these are the feature names radius texture and so on and now let's actually set up a data frame of this particular data here using pandas this function here so there are 569 data points and all these are basically your features as we talked about and let's look at the target variable which is nothing but whether it is telling us whether a particular data point belongs to malignant or benign so zero is cancerous and one is non-cancerous and then we convert the target into a data frame as well and then let's look at the couple of examples of how the data points look like this is you know one row of the data points which with all the several feature values that we have so basically we use this um, package called standard scalar from scikit-learn for pre-processing and for standardizing the variables and we initialize this standard scalar into a variable called scalar so standardizing is nothing but you know basically bringing all the samples to essentially the same range right because uh, what might happen is some of the data point like for example temperature might be from 0 to 100 and some price might be from let's say 1000 to 100000 or whatever right so the absolute values can can lead to some issues with respect to the prediction therefore we have to standardize it or bring it between let's say minus 1 and 1 so and then a mean of zero right so we have to bring everything to the same scale to be able to compare the samples so we first of all we fit the this standardization uh, or normalization on the data set we have and uh, that is we calculate the the variance and and the means and then we actually apply it on the data set to transform it to the actual values and then if we look at the scaled values now so let's look at the scaled values and this will give an example of the top five rows here so we can see now the values are between minus one and one or rather uh, it is standardized essentially with a normal distribution and then we divide this data into test and train so basically we will 
train the model and then we will test it on a separate data set if you use the same random state you, you should be able to get the same result otherwise you may get a different result here and essentially we are keeping the testing size to 30 which means that we are dividing the entire data set into two parts the train part which is having 70 percent of the data and the test part which is having 30 percent of the data and again we are using this package called train test split from the scikit learn package so we get the x and the y's which are basically nothing but your train and uh, the x's are your predictors and y is your predicted variable whether it is cancerous or not and then now let's import the k nearest neighbors classifier this is act the actual algorithm which we are importing from scikit-learn package and now we initialize this particular algorithm and then we fit it on the data And some of the parameters, as you can see, uh, is basically what is the leaf size and so on and so forth. The nearest uh, n neighbors we are taking. So we are taking k is equal to one here, basically, as of now. We will see the results based on that, and then we will change it and see how the results vary. And we now run it on the, we now try to predict it. And then we will now try to evaluate what the results look like. So we have imported the classification report and confusion matrix, which is basically trying to see whether we were able to correctly classify the cancerous as cancerous and non-cancerous as non-cancerous as or not. So we can see that this is the actual and this is the predicted. So basically some data points here, five and four are classified wrongly. Otherwise, all the others are classified well. So if we look at the accuracy, calculated accuracy actually, so we see that the precision which is true alarm right which is basically from the cancerous samples how many were you able to actually predict as cancerous so if you see the accuracy is quite high almost 94 95 percent and then the recall which is from all of the cancerous samples how many were you able to actually predict accurately is about again 94 95 percent and f1 score is nothing but a combination of both precision as well as recall and that's quite good as well so with k is equal to one you are able to get some already some good results now let's try to see how to choose the k value right so this is basically nothing but a, a bunch of code that actually runs the k value from 1 to 40 and then tries to check the accuracy and this is just like doing a trial and error to see where we get the best results so that we can then use the best k value so if you can see this particular plot here after we plot the result from the running the trial and error from 1 to 40 we see that the error actually starts decreasing and somewhere around this k is equal to 21 we get the minimum value of error so for us the best k value is 21 so now if we compare the results between k is equal to 1 and k is equal to 21 we, we should be able to see the prediction result so as you can say this was the result with k is equal to 1 which is we get about 94 95 percent accuracy and then with k is equal to 21 we will see whether the accuracy improves right so we see that yes the accuracy has now gone up to almost 99 percent which is we earlier had nine misclassified data points uh, out of uh, all of the points and then here we have just two data points which are misclassified from the test data set. So now this was one example of applying KNN on the cancer data set, which is available freely. And now let's look at another example, which is the iris data set. And uh, again, available freely as well. So iris is a type of flower and we will see what flower is it. So just give me a moment here. So we again start by importing the necessary libraries and then we'll look at what this iris data set is so the iris data set comprises of 50 samples of three species of iris flower which is iris setosa iris virginica and iris versicolor these are the three types of iris flowers and if you run this basically we will find that okay sorry we did not copy the entire the code here so it was giving an issue let's just run it again okay so we see that it is this particular flower which is iris setosa 
so the iris setosa you can see and now let's look at the other two kinds of flowers here so which is iris versicolor so this is iris versicolor and then you have the iris virginica so we see that this one is iris virginica so essentially we now will import the sort of data set we have already done that and we will now use the seaborn package to actually plot some of this data and see how it looks like which is basically do some kind of exploratory data analysis so if we look at the data itself so this is the top five rows from the data right so essentially the data consists of basically what is the sepal length sepal width petal length and petal width and this is nothing but basically your petal is your this colored part of the flower and the sepal is basically your green part here right so it is talking about what, what is the sepal length sepal width and petal length and petal width of each of the species whether it is setosa virginica or uh, versicolor and we are we will see whether we can use knn to actually classify these these flowers into uh, the data points into these uh, categories of flowers so let's do some quick exploratory data analysis on this so we are running a pair plot on the data set and uh, in the meantime i'll just copy another part of the code here okay so now the plot has come up so as we can see that the green is basically your uh, setosa flower and uh, we can see that this pair plot actually just plots the sepal length sepal width and the petal length petal width of each of the samples of setosa vers versicolor and virginica and we see that the green dots which are the setosa flower is actually quite separable from the others it's when you plot let, let's say for example sepal length and petal length right we see that this is quite separate from the other data points so let's see whether you know we can actually be able to classify it using knn uh, or not and here we are running a kernel density estimation function on the setosa flower to check what kind of distribution it has so this is the kernel density estimation plot using the sns package so only for the setosa flower so if we plot the sepal length and sepal width we get something distribution like this so essentially we see that the maximum centered around here and then there is a distribution as you can see here so there's some kind of a linear relationship here okay so now we will again do the same standardization of the variables that we had done in the cancer data set case so we are importing the standard scalar function from the scikit-learn pre-processing so we will initialize that so we are again basically doing the standardization or normalization of the data and we will do the standardization on everything except the species which is a categorical value right so it's categorical whether it is which kind of flower it is so we have removed that and then we have done the standardization or normalization on rest of the data so we now convert this into a data frame a pandas data frame and if we look at the top five rows now it's all converted or transformed so the values are now normally distributed basically okay so now we divide the data again into train and test and we again have a training of about 70% uh, and test data set of about 30% um, so we are dividing that entire data set into these two buckets and we will now use knn to see if we can use knn to classify them again the same n uh, k is equal to 1 and we will check the results and then we will do a trial and error to check what is the best value of k so here k is equal to 1 and now we are going to predict on the test data set and look at the results so we are now importing the classification report and the confusion matrix so if we look at the confusion matrix we see that kind of already we are getting quite good uh, prediction so just two misclassified points and uh, if we look at the accuracy 
we see that the accuracy is quite high around 96 percent already now we choose we have to see what is the best value of k so essentially we will we will again run k is equal to 1 to 40 and check which is the best value so let's plot the errors when we vary the k from 1 to 40 and we see that the, actually the uh, error decreases and then increases so basically the error is minimum with k is equal to let's say 3 or even 5 or maybe 11 so let's choose one of these values so let's say k is equal to 3 and let's see how the results look like does it improve the accuracy or not so we now see that even the two data points which are misclassified earlier is now classified properly so the accuracy improves to 100 percent so that's the example of how you can choose k what is naive base let us understand naive base with an example here i just cannot seem to figure out which are the best days to play football with my friend can you please help us out all possible conditions are given to us there is summer monsoon and winter which is nothing but the outlook am i correct in saying that summer monsoon and winter is nothing but the outlook then we have sunny or not sunny so that basically is the humidity right and then we have windy or no windy that speaks about the winds how are the winds right so if you look at these combinations okay we will look at this using navy bass on how do we decide whether we can play or not so if i have noted down all the days it was good bad to play football and the combination of weather matrices on that day that will be perfect right that is perfect and we will be able to do navy bias classifiers using that now navy bias classifier comes from the navy bias theorem and navy bias theorem is purely and purely based on the assumption of independence so what does it mean when i say independence what it means is that this variable has no relationship no association with this variable now when i talk about this in a linear context obviously in summer you will see that we have more sunny days yes so if you look at it from the correlation area from the linear algebra concepts linearly these two are correlated to each other am i correct in saying that obviously in monsoon we have less sunny days in winter we further have less sunny days yeah so although there is a relation navy buyers theorem says that all these variables are independent of each other what does it that mean if this is causing any kind of an effect if this is causing any kind of an impact this should not matter okay there is going to be no relationship summer monsoon winter it has its own weightage okay and it has nothing to do with the other conditions every condition is equally significant all right so what happens in navy bars is we estimate the posterior probability of every event happening here we calculate the posterior probability of an event happening okay so here if you see if you look at the sunny conditions what we have done sunny conditions we have this distribution that there is no play happening in summer there is play happening in monsoon there is play happening in winter right so base of the season we are figuring that out similarly for windy conditions we are doing that right again then we do it for a combination right whether when windy conditions are yes and no what happens to play okay so here what at the end of the day what gets selected is the one which has a posterior probability of greater than five now when i talk about posterior probability what do i mean by posterior probability let me have a blank slide here you go actually it's given so i need not show you that what is the simplistic probabilistic classifier here what is the probability of an event a happening given b so if you look at our problem context what is it that we are trying to figure out we are trying to figure out 
वट इज दबिलिटी ऑफ प्ले हैपनिंग गिवेन the outlook is sunny comma the uh, winds are normal and there is no rain on any given day on any given day when there is no rain there is no wind and the outlook is sunny whether play will happen or not so what we end up doing is we calculate the posterior probability of play happening given these conditions we also calculate the posterior probability of play not happening given these conditions and then we normalize these probabilities mathematically we do all of these calculations to figure out navy bias okay now here see here we are talking about one event here we have three events we have outlook we have winds and we have rains so what this becomes is probability of three independent events so what we will do we figure out what is the probability of play happening given outlook is sunny we also figure out what is the probability of play happening multiply this with the probability of wind as no given no then probability of play happening given rain is no we figure out all the th in three independent probabilities multiply it all right this is what we do mathematically this is what is done mathematically in navy bias theorem ultimately the posterior probability the posterior probability probability of an event a happening given b conditions is calculated by first calculating the class probability what is the class probability here probability of it raining given play was happening in that day this is multiplied by the total probability of play happening and divided by the total probability of sunny conditions here as you see this is the posterior probability this is the class probability here is the predictor's probability this is the outlook x is the outlook c is what we are trying to predict right and here is the likelihood so how is this formulated into our table now if you correlate this to our graph what will be the likelihood what will be the likelihood of sunny conditions given play happens sunny conditions play happens 2 divided by 3 out of sorry how many sunny conditions do we have six conditions in six conditions how many days does play happen two days 2 by 6 1 by 3 what is the class probability so of all the events that are given to us how many days does play happen okay this is how this is calculated so here you see what we have done is let me go back to the previous slide here you go okay here what we have done is we have calculated this table now it speaks about a data set where can you get this data set you can look for golf play days data set online you can look for golf play days data set okay in this data set you will find all the data which is required for this particular example to be done so what i will be doing is i will be doing this example this navy bias classification with you in python all right so whatever calculations are being done here okay i will do the same activity in python with pen and paper and instead of doing this 
in a numeric way where i'm doing lot of probabilistic calculations i will achieve this simply in very limited lines of code very limited lines of code with python once i'm i have done that i will come and explain this prob probability table to all of us i am going to use some basic libraries all right so here what i will be doing is using some very basic libraries for this activity all right done now let me quickly go and uh, read the data set so for that what i will do is quickly change my working directory And now let me quickly go and read my data. So my data frame is pd dot. Here you go. This is my data set, right? So if you look at this data set in this data set you have 13 14 days in these 14 days you have the outlook overcast rainy and sunny you have temperature temperature is hot cool and mild you have humidity you have wind and you have play right so i will not be using uh, okay let us use all four in this example they are using only three variables but in our hands on okay in this hands on what i will be doing is i will be uh, using all four variables let us do that okay so before i do that let me convert everything into a category if you look at your data frame right now it's not everything is not into a categorical variable here you go see okay so let me quickly go and convert everything into a category and once i have done this uh, let me create a new data frame in which i have everything as a category code so that i have numbers i'll show you what what do i mean by this so let me execute this here you go see now i have two data frames in the first data frame i have all these values these are now categorical variables but in the second data frame i have all ones and zeros so wherever you see there is sunny conditions now i have a code 2 rainy conditions code 1 similarly when play happens i have a 1 when play does not happen i have a 0 this is what i have done this data frame is available online okay you can get this data frame online all right now 
my data frame is ready so now what i'm going to do is i'm going to divide my data frame into training and testing i have 14 records so let's take 10 records for training i will give 10 records as an input and i will give four records last four records as my test data frame all right uh, so now i will need to create my x and my y so how i will do that is i'll say y underscore train is equal to from train i don't want the play variable that play variable should be my y as simple as that and i will say x underscore train is equal to train okay and i will do the same thing for my test data frame also now those who are new to python will find this a little bit strange please bear with me but these are the only calculations only steps which need to be performed every time you are trying to achieve navy bias algorithm or any kind of an algorithm All right so here now you see this is my training data frame in which play variable is not there play variable is not there this is my y in which only play variable is there this is my training data set so both of them have 10 records with the matching index similarly test data frame four records four records with the matching index right so that we know which data frame is where now multinomial navy bars very simple three lines of code and my model will be done okay first i initialize my model here you go i have initialized my model in this model i fit my data in this model i will fit my data so to do that what i say is fit x underscore train comma y underscore train done your model object is now ready and now you can simply get the classification outcomes so we have in our test data frame if you look at our test data frame this is our test data frame we have three con four conditions all four are sunny high temperature low humidity and windy right and if you look at their outcomes these are their outcomes on the first two days play is not happening on the next two days play is happening let us look at what is the prediction of our model for this so to do, do that what i simply do is x out is equal to model dot predict to this i give my x underscore test here you go okay now you have your y, y out variable so this is the prediction for all the four inputs that you give and this is the prediction first day first day we say play does not happen let us match it let us try to match it with our here see out of four records three records we are predicting correctly three records we are predicting correctly if you want to check the accuracy what is the accuracy of your model what you can simply do is print let us print the accuracy on both training and testing training accuracy how do i get the training accuracy very simple model dot score and here i give my x underscore train comma y underscore train and then we do the testing accuracy also here you go so here you can see for our mo model training we have 80 percent accuracy and for testing we have 75 percent accuracy okay so this is the advantage of doing this activity in python but what is happening in the backend now let us go and also understand that in terms of naive bias classifier we have successfully 
we have successfully implemented the naive bias classifier in python programming language but here let us try to understand bias theorem what is happening so from this data set all the tabulated data frequency tables are calculated once the frequency tables are calculated they are substituted in our formula to calculate the probabilistic scores so what is the probability of summer given it is playing conditions total how many playing conditions are there total there are nine playing conditions nine days play happened that becomes our denominator out of those days how many days was summer is our numerator that is how for this we get a probability of 0.33 then we calculate the class probability where we look at how many days was it summer out of total 14 days five days was summer so that's the probability and the class probability is 0.64 put everything into our equation put everything into our equation and this is what we get okay so we do this for each and every condition so here we calculated for winter all right once we have done it for all three days winter sunny and windy days we substitute those here and that gives us the probability which is more than 0 0.5 does now we can say that if it is winter sunny and conditions are sunny and there are winds conditions are not sunny and there are winds play can happen look at another example if a single card is drawn from a standard deck of playing cards the probability that card is a king is 4 by 52 since there are four kings in a standard deck king is the event this card is a king this is the event the prior probability of this is 1 by 13 if evidence is provided for instance someone looks at the card that the single card is a face card then the posterior probability can be calculated using bias theory okay since every king is also a face card the probability of face happening given you getting a face card given it's a king is one since there are three face cards in each suit all right it's actually four ace is also a face card so it's jack king queen and uh, ace the probability of the face card is 4 by 13 okay so if you combine these three likelihoods what you get is 13 by 4 so using bias theorem this is the probability that you get What is support vector machine? Support vector machine comes under supervised machine learning. And we use it specifically for performing the task of classification. So support vector machine is a discriminative classifier that is formally designed by a separate hyperplane. Okay, it is a representation of examples as points in a space that are mapped so that the points of different categories are separated by a gap as wide as possible. So in this case of this support vector machine, let's say I have some data points. So there are some data points of X and there are data points of circle. Now this support vector machine is a type of machine learning algorithm where if I have the collection of points, so here in this data points, I have two classes. One is X and the another one is circle. Now, given this kind of data points, okay, given this kind of binary classification problem, so the expectation is, in case of support vector machine, I'm going to draw a hyperplane, which separates as much as possible, okay? So I'm going to draw a hyperplane which separates these two classes as much as possible. So it says that the I'm going to draw draw a hyperplane and it, it will be separated by a gap as wide as possible. So that is the intuition behind support vector machine. Okay, now that you have an intuition behind what is support vector machine, let's understand as how does this svm that is support vector machine would work so in case of support vector machine so here there is one more example i have this set of uh, points which is green green color and i have another set of points which are in red color so these two uh, points are belonging to the different different classes 
now what i'm going to do is i'm going to draw a hyperplane which separates these two classes data points as much as possible and when i'm drawing the hyperplane i'll make sure that this hyperplane is uh, as this hyperplane is equidistant from my support vectors now the support vectors is nothing but the point which is closer to my hyperplane now here in this example that you're seeing the, this data point and this data point are called as support vectors because these are the data points which are nearest from my hyperplane that I've just drawn. In if I am trying to make use of this SPM model, it is going to draw this kind of hyperplane to make sure that it is separating two classes. The two classes that we have over here in this example is red and green. It is going to separate these two classes as much as possible and it will be equidistant from my support vectors and the support vectors are nothing but the nearest point to my hyperplane and that is how i'm going to separate between two classes when it comes to support vector machines now here in this example that you're currently seeing the hyperplane that i've just drawn so this is a simple linear hyperplane is like a straight line that I'm trying to draw if I want to separate two classes of data points now apart from drawing this straight line we also have other uh, kind of lines as well which we can draw so let's see how we can do that so the types of line that we can draw or the hyperplane that we can draw is called as SPM kernels that is support vector machine kernels the example that we have seen it's an example for linear SPM kernels so let's see what are the other types of kernels that we have so when it comes to SPM kernels we have linear kernels radial basis function kernel and along with that we also have polynomial kernel now in case of linear kernel I'm going to draw a hyperplane which is like a straight line in case of polynomial kernel i can draw my hyperplane on the basis of polynomial function that i have created on the basis of number of variables that i have and the degree that i have over there in case of polynomial and in case of radial basis function so i'll make use of radial basis to uh, separate my data points okay so these three are the important kernels that we have in spm and this is one of the commonly asked interview question when it comes to the topic of support vector machines now let's look at some of the use cases or the way we can do where we can use this spm to uh, work or let's look at some of the use cases where we can use this spm okay so we can use this SVM on many of the use cases. So to name a few, we can use it in face detection. We can use it in text and hypertext categorization. We can use the SVM if I'm trying to classify any images. I can make use in bioinformatics. And if I'm trying to detect something, so I can, in, the, in an example here, remote homology detection, handwriting detection, or in general, we can make use of this generalized predictive control. So wherever we are dealing with the task of classification, we can use this SVM model. Okay, now that we have a theoretical understanding as what is SVM and how it is actually going to look like and how it will be, let's have a quick walkthrough as how we can implement this SVM. Now, to implement this SVM, these are the common steps that we are going to follow. We are going to load the data. We'll explore the data. And once we have explored the data, we are going to split the data into two parts. The reason is simple. When I have training, so I'll be making use of my training data. And once my training is complete, I'll check how my model has been trained with the help of my test data. So I'm going to split the data. Now, once that is complete, we are going to train this SPM model and finally we can evaluate the model and observe as how model is working. So this is the overview of the implementation of support vector machines. So let's do one thing. Let's work it out and let's create the notebook in Google Collab and let's see it in action as how we can implement this SVM.
I'll come back to my Google Colab. So this is the notebook that I have already prepared and I'll give you a walkthrough as we proceed along. Now here in my first cell, I'm importing my NumPy library, Pandas library, and along with that, for creation of plots, I'm importing my matplotlib library. Now, if you are comfortable with Seaborn, you can use the Seaborn library as well. So in my example, I'm just making use of matplotlib because we are not interested in creation of visualization, but we want to understand as how a model is being working. Okay, and I'm going to execute this cell. So this is going to take care of necessary imports. I'm importing my necessary libraries. And once that is done here, I'm importing this SVM. So this SVM model is available inside my SKLearn library. So I've mentioned as SKLearn dot SVM and from SKLearn dot SVM, I'm importing my SVC. Okay, so I'm importing my SVC. So I'll show you what is this SVC. Learn SVM SVC. So it's C means support vector classification. Okay, now here when I'm instantiating this SVC, I can mention what is the kernel that I want to use. And if I'm working with any polynomial kernel, then I can also mention what is the degree of polynomial that I want to use while performing the fit for my data set. So I'm importing my SVC. And along with that, I'm also importing the data sets. So in the SKLearn library itself, we have a data set. So it, SKLearn host already, like it, it actually, SKLearn has many toy data set which will actually help us in our learning journey. So we are going to use one of the data set, the famous IRIS data set. We use that for multi-class classification. So I'm going to load that IRIS data set. And I'm just going to extract only two features. So the two features that I'm extracting is petal length and petal width because I don't want to complicate it. I just want to visualize the data. So in order to help in visualization, I, I'm just getting only two features of my given data and I'm separating my Y as Iris target. So whatever the target variable that I had, I'm assigning to my variable of Y. Then I'm going to uh, do this check whether it is setosa or versicular that means this default data set which is in multi-class classification i'm just going to convert it into a binary classification task you'll get a better understanding once i execute this next cell so this is going to prepare my data set and once the data set is prepared if i create a scatter plot so i'm just creating the scatter plot to show us what and how my data set looks like so this is how my data set looks like. On my X axis, I think I'm having petal length. On my Y axis, I'm having petal width. And here, the blue points refers to the class zero and the orange points refers to the class of one. Okay, so this is how my data set looks like. You can clearly see that I have one set of points in one region and I have another set of points in another region. Now this is a classic example to understand about the SPM. How does it draw a hyperplane? So we have the data set ready and as I mentioned already in order to fit this model. So when I say support vector machine, I'm going to draw a line this line that I have drawn, it will be equidistant from my support vectors. Now here in this example, the support vector is this because this is the only point which is nearest to my line. And here, I think this is the data point which is nearest to my SVM, SVM line. That is this fisted line, hyperplane line. So I'll be placing this hyperplane such that it is equidistant from the support vectors. That is how I'll be drawing this support vector line. So we now have an intuition. Let's see whether we get the same outcome as we are expecting. So here I'm initializing my model. So for initialization, I'm saying it as SVC. Use the kernel as linear because I'm able to draw a line effectively. We, were, we just seen and I'm using the C as infinity. That means it should be a hard classifier. So hard classifier means I make I want the 100% result. I mean, I don't want any loose ends. I want to draw a line 
which passes which clearly separates two classes so i'm saying it as c as infinity to mention this as a hard classifier and once i initialize any model here in this scenario svm model i am performing the fit on my data set now this is the common flow that we follow whenever we are performing the fit so we'll initialize the model and then we perform the fit on our data set now since this svm being a supervised machine learning model i have to specify both my input x as well as my output y hence svm classifier dot fit x comma y so this is going to perform the fit for my data set i'll just execute this so this has performed the fit and here it is giving me the confirmation as this is the parameter that are being used to perform the fit okay now once i have drawn and once i have found this fit next if i want to display the weight terms so i can say it as svm classifier dot coefficients so these are the weight terms and if i want to display my bias term or the intercept it is minus 3.78 now this means the line that i have just drawn so that line has the uh, that line has the c term as or the w naught term as minus 3.78 and w1 w2 are 1.29 and 0.82 respectively so that's how the data is distributed for us that's how the values has been found for our scenario next in order to get the better visualization here i have created a function that is called as plot svc decision boundary and this takes my svm model the x min and the x max now w and b i'm extracting from the coefficient and the intercept parameter that we have over here so we are extracting from this uh, at, from this attributes that we have from this model and now if i want to draw a decision boundary so i need the set of points so in order to get the points i'm saying it as x naught is equal to nb dot lin space x max comma x min comma x max comma 200 and i'm specifying as how does my decision boundary should look like my decision boundary is given by w naught into x naught plus w1 into x1 plus b is equal to zero so this is what my decision boundary would look like so i know what is x naught i know w naught i also have w1 and i also have b so the only term that i do not have is my x1 okay so the only term that i do not have over here in this example is x1 and the x1 if i want it so i just have to substitute it so x1 is equal to minus w0 divided by w1 into x0 minus b divided by w1 now i am specifying the same equation over here for my x2 so my x0 and the decision boundary will give me the pair of input and output okay now along with this there is a property in svm okay so the property is given by whenever i have a margin so that margin is given by 1 over w1 okay so the margin is nothing but the distance between my hyperplane and the support vector so that is given by 1 by w1 hence i have mentioned as gutter up and down gutter up means one line or the one line where the support vector lies so that is given by decision boundary plus margin and one line below my one line uh, below my hyperplane that is where another support vector would lie so i have mentioned as decision boundary minus margin okay then i am defining where exactly my support vectors are present my support vectors uh, i can access the support vector coordinates by saying it as by accessing the attribute of my train model support underscore vectors underscore now i am specifying where exactly those support vectors are present with the help of a simple scatter plot by highlighting my support vectors and i'm specifying where exactly my decision boundary is present and i'm also mentioning where is my line that is gutter up and gutter down so let's do one thing i'll just execute this this is going to create me a function i'm going to call my function support vector machine classification and i will specify my range of x and y as 
here yeah x min and x max are 0 comma 5.5 i'll just execute this so what we have done just now is we have created this uh, hyperplane so the middle one the solid line that you're seeing over here so this solid line is called as your hyperplane and these points that you're seeing over here so these two points which are highlighted these two points are actually called as support vectors okay so this dotted line that you're seeing so this dotted line refers to my gutter up and gutter down which i've found right here let's do one thing i'll add some labels so that you'll get some more visualization in the plot itself i'll say label and i'll mention it as hyperplane okay and there is one more yeah these are support vectors and i'll say pld dot legend so this clearly says which are all my hyperplane and which are all my support vectors so this is the intuition behind support vector machines so we'll be drawing a hyperplane which separates the points that we have okay and whichever the point which is nearest to my hyperplane we call that point as a support vector now to access that support vector we make use of the attribute so let's do one thing let's explore the same the attributes svm dot support underscore vectors underscore so this is going to tell me where exactly my support vectors are present so one point is given by 1.9.0.4 i think this is the point that i'm talking about and the another support vector that we have is at the location 3 comma 1.1 so 3 and 1.1 this is where we have another support vector so using all these attributes we have been able to create this visualization okay now whenever we are working with the support vector machines it's very important that we scale the data first if i do not scale the data i'll not be able to get a better fit of my svm model so here i've given one more example where i have my x uh, is given as 1 comma 50 5 comma 20 3 comma 80 as you can clearly see it's it's not scaled okay so i'm going to execute this cell so this is going to tell me and give me a visualization as how the fit will be in case of scaled and unscaled see if it is unscaled i'll if it is not scaled okay that means if it is unscaled we can clearly see that the hyperplane that i'm drawing and the distance from my hyperplane it's very close to each other and whenever i'm working it's it, it will be difficult for me to separate those two data points but if i scale them correctly now here for scaling i have made use of a scalar and standard scalar now if i scale it correctly then in that scenario it will be easier for me and it would actually work better when i have scaled data okay so this is about using the linear svm model to perform the fit on my given data set now if i go below we have some more examples about nonlinear classifiers as well now in order to test out the same here i'm creating an example data set and that data set that i'm generating is called as make moons data set and this has been generated with the help of a scale and data set generator now as you can clearly see I cannot make use of linear classifier so linear classifier is nothing but a classifier okay which is an svm model where i'm drawing or where i'm using a straight line to split my data points i can clearly see that i wherever i i join or wherever i try to draw a line over here 
I cannot split the data in an effective manner. Now this brings us the challenge. Now if I have a data set in this way where I cannot linearly separate it, how can we go about and fit, uh, perform the fit on our SVM model? So in order to save us, we have a model that is called as uh, SVM model and from that SVM model, we can actually create a polynomial uh, a polynomial kernel. So we can make use of polynomial kernel and using that polynomial kernel, I can actually uh, create it like this. I mean using polynomial kernel, I can perform polynomial regression or I can draw a line like this. Now to show you how it works, I'm getting some data like this. So this is some uh, random data and I'm making use of pipeline. So this pipeline is going to take care of my stand, standard scalar as well as kernel. I'll do one thing. I'll just come below. So this is what we are currently interested in. So here I'm importing the polynomial features and I'm generating the polynomial features for my data. I'm performing the fit and transform my polynomial data. That means I'm just modifying my existing data and I am sending it for my uh, X. Okay, so this is how my pair of input X and Y looks like. Now I'll use my X. I'm going to transform it with the help of my polynomial features. And then I'm going to scale it with the help of my standard scalar and I'm going to send it inside my classifier that is SPM classifier. Okay, so I'm going to combine it together like this. Now observe what would happen. And once that is complete, see, with the help of my polynomial, uh, polynomial features that have applied on my given linear data, so I have increased uh, the degrees by which my model can learn. Now instead of straight line, my model is also having the ability to learn this complex representation as well. Because I have increased the model complexity by adding my polynomial features. And while doing it to make sure that we follow a, a clear path. So I have defined this scalars pipeline. So if you're new to data science machine learning, I highly recommend you to learn this concept of SKLN pipeline. Now this SKLN pipeline helps us to combine multiple operations in a single call. So here we have created a pipeline. This pipeline is going to add some polynomial features for my input data. And on top of it, this is going to perform scaling. And then I'm going to perform this binomial classification using this SVM. And finally, I'm performing the fit on my data set. See, when I perform the fit, it takes my input X and it's going to do all these activities. It is going to chain all these activities together and then it is going to perform the fit for my data Y. Once the fit has been complete, so we can validate how my model is performing. So what is a clustering technique? Clustering technique is something that we will use it for grouping purpose. So especially well, there is a very easy way to understand what is clustering technique. You would have seen such a, a way, while we are going through a COVID-19 situation, the government has came up with creating some containment zones as all of you must be knowing. So how on what criteria government has taken that okay which area is supposed to be a containment zone or which area is supposed to be applied with some some restrictions on which areas can be can be considered as normal on what criteria that they have created so that's what using clustering technique which means if the government or when i say government means that the people who will be taking the final decision in such criteria either prime minister either the Either the chief ministers of that particular state will be taking decisions whether to go for a lockdown, whether to not to go for lockdown, or which areas has to be considered as containment zones or non-containment zones. So those high-level decisions are something which will be taken based on the clustering technique output which is generated by the uh, these algorithms. Based on a number of inputs. Okay, what is the population in a particular area? How many number of people are affected? How many number of hospitals which are present? How many number of um, uh, people who are been recovered? 
so likewise based on this these multiple criteria people will do some clustering technique on top of the data and according to that people will be segregated or the areas will be segregated so that saying that okay these are the observations which belong to one cluster these are the observations which belong to one cluster like that so that people can cluster them which can make organizations to take decisions on a very high level okay that's what is our clustering technique which clustering technique output will contain the different different groups it itself will group the different different components based on whatever the number of clusters that you want to generate that may not give the direct output on top of the generated output people will be taking business related decisions that's what is all about clustering techniques okay so now what we will do let's take an example of within clustering techniques what are the different types of clustering techniques we have so what are the different types of clustering that we have so there are multiple types of there are multiple types of ways based on the type of output that we want to produce there are multiple different types of clustering techniques we have but out of which the let's try to understand about what are the very famous and most widely used clustering technique algorithm out of which we have something called k means clustering algorithm is one of the very famous and most widely used more than 90% of the people will end up with using k means clustering algorithm which is very very famous in clustering techniques right which is very very famous in clustering techniques so what are these clustering techniques as i said how this clustering technique will work so k means clustering is nothing but always remember one thing if any one of you are going to work in machine learning or anywhere in anywhere wherever you see a notation called k by default k is nothing but you are you are supposed to as a user you are supposed to provide what is the input of k which means wherever you see there are multiple techniques that we have in machine learning like k means clustering technique k nearest neighbor is one of the algorithm k fold cross validation likewise wherever you see a notation called k what is what does a k means it's an input that you are supposed to provide always remember this it's an input that you are supposed to provide to your algorithm your algorithm cannot identify that k value of course everything else will be taken care by your algorithm but whenever you see k which means in k means clustering what is the meaning of k means clustering how many number of clusters that you want to provide that is something that you have to input it to your algorithm that is something that you have to input to your algorithm right here the meaning of k is how many clusters that you want to generate so how many clusters that you want to generate okay when you have thousand observations which are present when you have thousand in input column input records which are present in your historical data how many number of clusters that you want to produce do you want to go for one cluster obviously one cluster means that the entire data set will be considered as is do you want to create two clusters out of the data do you want to create three clusters out of the data four clusters five clusters or ten clusters so how this can be done there are multiple steps that are involved in generating kms clustering algorithm so you can see choose the number of clusters this is what is nothing but your first step it means you need to decide what is your k is nothing but number of clusters that you want to produce and then there is an initialization of centroids will happen as a one time activity right so there is an initialization of centroids which will be which will be declared that will that will be used as your initial step for your machine and then assign the clusters move the centroids and optimization and then converge the, the all the clusters into one component yes i know it will be very difficult to understand by looking at this thing so let me show you a very simple example how exactly it will be done maybe let me take a simple diagram for you to show how exactly that's going to work okay so let's say for example i'm going to take some historical data just to explain you on how exactly the kms clustering algorithm will work so what is that it is written in the first step what is that it is written in the first step so the choose a number of clusters choose number of clusters now which means so for example we need to take some historical data i'm considering some historical data here let's assume this is the historical data let's assume this is the historical data that we have so uh, as you could see there are multiple historical data points so as you could see the first step choose number of clusters which means let's assume to make this thing simple i'm going to choose that we want to have two clusters generated okay so this is which means we want to have two clusters created so because my number of clusters that i want to generate is two i'm going to consider that there are two centroids which are present this is my first step how this algorithm will do how algorithm will come to come with the number of clusters so this is how it will happen so first step is to choose the number of centroid and then initialize your centroid that's the second step so now what is the third step let's assume this is observation number one this is our data point one so now what what is the next step 
we will take the distance from every observation to every centroid and every observation to every centroid which means now tell me which observation for this observation number one which centroid is more closer is the green color centroid is more closer or the red color centroid is more closer for this centroid means that data points the one which i have highlighted that's what we call a centroid data points we have chosen two centroids only because that is the, as a user you are supposed to input what's supposed to be your k what's supposed to be your k value that's what i said you need to know how what is your k is nothing but how many number of clusters that you want to provide usually your business users are going to provide that in case if you are going to work in this kind of algorithms they will provide that or else there are some other methods available like uh, elbow method or other things we will talk about that now this observation is more closer to red color so now what happens what what is the next step the algorithm will assign this particular observation one as a red color for now as considering that this belongs to red color likewise for the second observation when the second observation appears what is the distance from the second observation to both the centroids now which one is more closer i see green color is more closer so now i'll mark this as green color if both if what if the distance is same equal so then the algorithm will force any of the observation to get into any of the centroids so number of clusters number of centroids that you will choose based on the k value as i said now you are going to likewise you will repeat the same process and whatever the observation which is more closer to whatever the centroid it is you will mark them as with their so to call mark like this now you are going to initially mark them as observations into either into green color either into red color so now these observations are now considered as green color observations and these observations are now considered as red color observations this is step number 1 what is the step number 2 step number 2 is segregate all these red color observations and take the average value of x and y coordinates and repeat the same process for calculating average coordinates of x and y coordinates for the green color observations take the average of all these observations calculate average and take the all these observations take the average you end up with getting a new centroid positions called xy which means now you ended up with getting a new centroids in the initial step that we have taken random centroid now you got the centroids that you can use based on the previous iteration now you ended up with getting a new centroids you repeat the same process again again you repeat the same process take the distance from every observation to every centroid and assign the observation based on the nearest of nearest distance and continue to mark every observation either into red color or either green color or whatever it is and you repeat the process until you will be able to see there will be no change applicable for your clusters you repeat the process which means in every step you might end up with changing your centroid every step will continue to change your centroid now the centroid might become like this then later your centroid will become like this likewise your centroids will be keep on moving initially you are taken it like this but it, it might continue to move like this somewhere it will be fixed and after that there will be no change that you will notice if you are repeating the same process at this particular stage whatever the observations which are marked into which are grouped into green color you will say like these are the green color observation whatever the observations which are marked into red color you will you will mark them as okay these are the observations which belong to red color these are the observations which belong to red color likewise you will segregate all these observations either into red color or green color right so that's how we can generate these uh, clustering technique that's how the k means clustering algorithm will generate this algorithms uh, output of using this algorithm okay so that's how k means clustering algorithm will work okay so now what likewise there are multiple algorithm that we have so like uh, uh, when we talk about machine learning so where there are multiple types of algorithms that we have so like how we have the, the how does the k value k value will occur as you can see on the ppt which are also mentioned so you are going to choose some randomly generated k value and you will be choosing the number of k over here and you can see that it will assign them based on the number of this easy most nearest distances and according to that you will change your centroids once you change your centroids you will repeat the same process until you are able to change that your centroids don't move further and then once it is been finalized you will say like this is the final centroid of final uh, cluster output that we can generate out of this right so likewise we also have different types of clustering technique and the second type of clustering technique that we have is fuzzy or siemens clustering so what is fuzzy or siemens clustering the output will remain same so siemens clustering means that there are places that one or two observations can belong to one or two different clusters right one or two different clusters which means usually the primary difference between the primary difference between your c means and k means clustering technique is 
in case if there are any observations which are having equal amount of distance usually in k means clustering what we will do we will force this observation to be part of any of the cluster but in c means clustering uh, based on the distance that we see there are chances that an observation can go to or can belong to one or two clusters so it purely depends on the business use case who is going to decide to either to go for k means clustering or c means clustering based on the the business use case based on our business outcome so if people are going to decide whether to go for CMS clustering or KMS clustering. So there are a number of observations which might, it's not mandatory, which might can belong to one or more clusters that can happen. So the third is the agglomerated clustering, so which, which is the third type of clustering technique that we have. Okay. So which is also one of, uh, one of the clustering technique that we have. Okay. So now, which can also be used here. Okay. So now, what is this agglomerative clustering so this is what we also call it as hierarchical clustering so in times you also call them as hierarchical clustering these clustering techniques are built using h clustering in short we call it as h clustering and also people will also call it as hierarchical clustering techniques so what are this so based on the type of algorithm they will try to there is a there is a mathematical expressions which are involved in it, but then considering that uh, the limited time that we have i'm not going to take you through all the in, in detail depth of it so considering the way how the data points have been segregated we'll it will build a kind of dendrogram so on top of this dendrogram, your observations can be classified here like this, as you can see on the screen. Is K-means clustering sensitive to outlier? You need to understand one thing. When we are talking about unsupervised learning algorithms, as I said, you may or may not have clarity on the data, which means your assumption is that at the least level, you don't have clarity on the data. Then if you don't, when you don't have clarity on the data, how can you say that can, this is an outlier or this is not an outlier? When you have clarity on the data, especially when you're working on supervised learning algorithms, you can. But you don't have output column also. How you will be able to evaluate how the so-and-so -so called output column can be can be evaluated because this is not being classified properly, it is not been clustered properly based on the historical data because there is no output column. So those type of concepts are something which you don't need to worry about when you are working on unsupervised learning. They will be primarily they will be constrained when you are working on supervised learning algorithms. And of course, in case if you see that there are outliers which are present, obviously it has to be, it will be considered, it will be considered as one of the clustering, any of the, any of the, any of the cluster, it belongs to the data. But anyhow, that's the characteristic of the data. You don't need to, you, you don't be taking care because you might be killing the actual original values which are present in the data, but you cannot expect that outlier can be recognized out for all the cases that you have in unsupervised learning. So the next type of clustering technique that we have is division clustering. So what is this division clustering? As the division clustering is also creates the data in a form of dendrogram. But the difference is you can see that it starts with all data points in one cluster, splits the root into child recursively based on the dendrogram and stops when there is a single term clusters which are created, which means that for every cluster, there'll be one observation which belongs to. So likewise, the clustering technique will work. Now, there is one more technique that we have in terms of building a clustering technique. That's what we call it, the mean shift clustering. So what we will do, we'll take an average of every cluster that we have. What we will do, we'll end up with reducing their means into the into a single density of items and then we'll continue to repeat the process to see to that which observations mean will belong to the same cluster and according to that we'll continue to identify which observation will belong to a cluster a particular cluster so likewise we can apply different types of clustering technique that can help us to cluster the data which is part of unsupervised learning right so now let's take a, let's jump into something called a small hands-on okay let's let's take a small uh, uh, python example and we will see how do we build that particular uh, clustering technique on top of the data using one of the simple data that we have. Jupyter Notebook, let me open uh, how we can use scikit-learn using one of the example. So meanwhile, let me show you some of the data set also. Let me show you a data set that I'm going to use as well. So I'm what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this movie metadata information. Let me open this data set. I'm going to take this example of movie metadata information where this this data set has got a number of observations which are present. Okay, let me open this. Okay, you can see that there are a number of movies related information as you can see the movie names. So Avatar, Pirates of the Caribbean, Spectre, The Dark Knight, Star Wars, etc, etc, John Carter, Spider-Man 3, uh, Tangled or etc, etc. We have a lot of movies. And about every movie, we got a lot of information which is present, like who is the director, who is the actor, what are the director Facebook likes, what are the actor Facebook likes. Likewise, we got an, we got a lot of information which is present as part of these particular every observation. So 
So now what we will do, we will try to cluster these data points. You can see a lot of observations which are given. What is the gross of the movie? What is the number of reviews? What is the IMDb rating? What is the so and so called IMDb score? What is the movie span? What is the gross? What is the budget and everything? So now what I'll be doing, I'll be reading this data set using one of the pandas library that we have. Okay, so I'll be reading this data set. Let me open the Jupyter notebook. I'll be using something called pandas. As you can see, read.pandas.csv. I'll be reading this data set where you can see that this is the data set that I am able to read. I got a number of observations that are present. I can see that director Facebook likes and actor three Facebook likes. So now what I what is it I want to do is instead of building this clustering technique on top of every observation, so what I will do is I will take these columns called called number of Facebook likes on director and number of actor Facebook likes versus director Facebook likes. So where you can see that if I want to select a director Facebook likes alone, I'll be able to choose this uh, director Facebook likes alone. You can see for every movie you got the number of director Facebook likes which are present. So if there are more number of Facebook likes, what does it mean? The director is famous person, correct? Or rather, if there are more number of famous Facebook likes that the actor has got, which means that the person is or the actor is very famous person. So that's what you can understand. So now we can see that I'll try to extract these independent components that we're talking about. I will extract all the records in all the director Facebook likes versus or actor Facebook likes, where I'm just going to form an object called new data by applying some I location as a filter. I locations, the I LOC stands for index location, where I can filter out what are the records that I wanted to, what are the columns that I wanted to using this I location function. Now I got all the so and so called uh, number of director Facebook likes versus actor Facebook likes, which are present as part of this. Okay, so I, this is being loaded into an object called new data. So now what is that I'll be doing? After that, I'm importing something called Escalon Chinese cluster. So this algorithm is available as part of this Kaikit loan algorithm. Whatever the number of steps that we have discussed, you are not supposed to execute all these steps manually. And of course, if you want, you can also write such a program as well. But what is that we'll be doing? In Skykit Learn library, there is a Python library called Skykit Learn, which has got most of the algorithms present. And we will be importing this K-means clustering algorithm. And for this K-means clustering, I'm providing the C is equal to number of clusters is equal to five. So here, if you are, if you are aware of uh, object-oriented programming using Python, you'll be able to correlate. I'm importing this K-means clustering, which is implemented as a class here, where I'm creating an object called K-means clustering by providing an input called n number of scores clusters is equal to five, which means that what is the meaning of five? I want to build five clusters out of this. So where um, once you create an object using k means, I'm calling this method called picked method by providing new data as my independent variables. I'm for calling this fit method, which means fit is a method that's going to invoke what's supposed to be the process that needs to be executed. That's going to build my clustering technique algorithm by taking number of clusters is equal to five. So now I'm able to generate my algorithm where by looking at my model, I'll be able to extract what are the centroids that I got final centroid because initially you'll be taking some random centroids but at the end you'll end up with getting a final centroid position somewhere fixed to it that is nothing but a center point for every cluster that we got these are the final centroid that we got even if i want to print what is the labels which are generated labels is nothing but it will extract the outcome you can see that these are the label numbers which are added here out of 5000 movies we got the labels which are added as an array <clears throat> but we won't be able to see it like that what is it i'm trying to do I'm trying to get all the unique values present in these labels with respect to counts. Now you can see that my data is now clustered into five different, all the movies are clustered into five different clusters. Actually. Cluster number zero has got 4,700. Most of the observations are moved into cluster number zero. One or four movies went into observation number one. 11 movies are moved into cluster, cluster number two. And 87 movies are moved into cluster number three and 67 into cluster number four. So the data properties are being distributed and that's how the clustering technique has divided the data into five clusters. Now you can see what is that I'm trying to do. I'm trying to put this into a new data of cluster, which means whatever the labels that are generated here. This is my output column. I'm going to create this into a, as a new column in my new data where I'm using this LM plot that will print whatever the column that I have called director Facebook likes versus actor Facebook likes. And I'm choosing this data is equal to new data that will help me to that will help me to identify what column can be considered as Q so that I'll be printing it in a cool warm type chart. You can see that pellet type is equal to cool warm type, which will help me to identify based on the cluster that you have created. Now if I print this, you can see that pretty much the every observation is now categorized into individual cluster. You can see these are the movies which are now graphical representation. This is the graphical representation that we are using to see how these movies are being segregated. I can see these movies are nothing but cluster number zero. 
you can see there are a few more movies which are extracted over here this is nothing but based on the color indication this is cluster number three and these movies are created as a cluster number one cluster number two these movies are something which are created as cluster number one and these movies are created as cluster number four zero one this is nothing but two plus number three plus number three and plus number four like this now you can clearly see that how the chemist clustering has came up the movies which are made by new people with new directors new actors are making films with new directors or new directors are making film with new actors these are all you will see more number of movies will fall into this category because you'll end up with getting new people into the into the into the film industry most of the cases a lot of movies are being made with the new directors with new actors and you can see that these movies are the clusters which are being segregated very clearly the famous actors are making films with new directors very famous actors are making films with new directors and these movies are something where very famous directors are less i mean average fame directors are making films with uh, some new actors you can see these movies are nothing but very famous actors are making directors are making films with very new actors you can see very famous directors are making films with very famous actors like Spielberg might be making a film with Tom Cruise or something like that so likewise you can clearly see that where instead of if you do this activity manually it, it might take a little longer time for you to segregate each and every component but within five minutes we're able to cluster this activity right so that's what the beauty with algorithms you don't need to manually do this activity where you can provide your data automatically based on the properties of the data your algorithm itself will die, build this clustering output out of the data all right so that's how we will be able to build a clustering technique on top of the given data so that's what we have as part of one of the hands-on example what is hierarchical clustering so hierarchical clustering it is also known as hca or hierarchical cluster analysis and this is a method of cluster analysis as we have seen so what happens here is that this clustering allows us to build the tree structure from data similarities like we have built x and y and we have created trees and these trees are actually called known as dendrogram so the way you represent a hierarchical cluster or hierarchical clustering is through dendrogram so we actually drew a dendrogram okay so this is how the clustering is being formed and this is how the clusters are being made and this is how the relationship among the clusters is being shown by a dendrogram so based on these things now we will go on further to understanding what is agglomerative clustering so when this hierarchical clustering follows a bottom up approach this is called agglomerative clustering and when this is following up a top down approach this is used in divisive clustering so now let us understand what is agglomerative clustering so the types of hierarchical clustering are two that is agglomerative and divisive so now moving on further what is agglomerative clustering so agglomerative hierarchical clustering this is also known as agnes which means agglomerative nesting hierarchical clustering and it follows a bottom up approach which means that clustering or clusters they are formed from the bottom and are again clustered till a complete single cluster is formed and what happens then is that the clustering continues until we obtain a single cluster and we will see how we obtain a single cluster and we also represent it so individual data points are clustered based on similarity and we go on clustering until there is only one single cluster left so let us just plot this agglomerative clustering and make things really simple for us now suppose i have got these data points scattered here a to g and these data points have to be clustered so another important thing is that now we will form clusters so how clusters are formed so we can see that based on some similarity like because of the distance nearby distance a and b can be grouped together in a single cluster so i am just doing that c and d i form another cluster because they are near so i just club them and again i would just club e and f based on their distance and g is separate so i will just form a separate cluster now what happens in agglomerative clustering is that i have to plot all these data points like a b c right d e f and g so these are separate clusters the clustering starts from the bottom and each data point is treated as a single cluster which we will also understand with the help of an example further but now for simplicity let's take a b c d 
So then what happens is that since A and B are grouped as one cluster, so this is how I just group them, all right? And C and D is grouped as one cluster. This is how I group them. E and F are grouped in one single cluster. This is how I group them. Now remains G, which is not being grouped into any of the cluster. So now clustering, I said that it is, it continues until a single cluster is left. So now I would have to have another level of clustering. That means that E, F, G, since G is very close to E, F, I will cluster it in one single cluster. Okay. And since I can see that both these A, A B and C, D pairs, these clusters are again together. So I will just cross this line and I will make one single cluster of these four points. Right. So what I do is since these two are connected, I connect them with the help of this line figure that is tree structure dendrogram and this G, E and F, they are connected somehow. I connect them. All right. Now what happens is that I have got two big clusters and clustering continues until a single cluster is obtained. So in the end, I will have to cluster everything into a single cluster. And this is how I do that. And to join it, I will again join this entire graph. So this is when it follows a bottom to up approach. This is called as agglomerative hierarchical clustering. Okay. So now we will go and see an example of this hierarchical agglomerative clustering, right? Okay. So let us understand what is agglomerative clustering with this example. Now we see that here the clustering takes place from bottom to up. And we have taken an example of population wherein we go on clustering until we get population. So here from the bottom, the individual professions are being plotted. And we see that, uh, let's, let's take for a convenience the left hand side. And on the left hand side, the red dots, as you see, this is individual profession in public sector. And on the another side, which we see in the brown circles is the private sector employment. So somehow there's similarity between private sector. So they are being clustered as one single cluster and the private sector as a, another cluster. These again are being clustered into one single cluster and that is employment cluster. Whereas on the another side, we can see another cluster which is different and that is unemployed section of cluster of people. Now they again share one similarity and that is that they all belong to a single gender that is male. So everything is being clustered into one single cluster that is male and then again male and female clusters are being clustered together to form one single cluster that is population similarly we also divide on the right hand side the individual professions of women clubbed into private and public sector and then again we have separate clusters of employed and unemployed women and they have been grouped into one single cluster and that is women again we merge the two big clusters into one single cluster that is population. So this is how the clustering is taking place. The levels are being increasing from bottom to up. So when we are using this bottom up approach, this is agglomerative clustering. Now many of us have visited retail shops such as Walmart or Target for our household needs. Or let's say that we are planning to buy the new iPhone from Target. What we would typically do is search for the model by visiting the mobile section of the store and then select the product and head towards the billing counter. But in today's world, the goal of the organization is to increase the revenue. Can this be done by just pitching one product at a time to the customer? Now the answer to this is clearly no. Hence, organization began mining data relating to frequently bought items. So market basket analysis is one of the key techniques used by large retailers to uncover associations between items. Now examples could be the customers who purchase bread have a 60% likelihood to also purchase jam. Customers who purchase laptops are more likely to purchase laptop bags as well. They try to find out associations between different items and products that can be sold together, which gives assisting in the right product placement. Typically, it figures out what products are being bought together and organizations can place products in a similar manner. For example, people who buy bread also tend to buy butter, right? And the marketing team at retail stores should target customers who buy bread and butter and provide an offer to them so that they buy a third item, suppose eggs. 
So if a customer buys bread and butter and sees a discount offer on eggs, he will be encouraged to spend more and buy the eggs. And this is what market basket analysis is all about. This is what we are going to talk about in this session, which is association rule miling and the a priori algorithm. Now, association rule can be thought of as an if then relationship. Just to elaborate on that, we have come up with a rule. Suppose if an item A is being bought by the customer, then the chances of item B being picked by the customer too under the same transaction ID is found out. You need to understand here that it's not a casualty, rather, it's a co occurrence pattern that comes to the force. Now, there are two elements to this rule. First is the if, and second is the then. Now, if is also known as antecedent. This is an item or a group of items that are typically found in the item set. And the later one is called the consequent. This comes along as an item with an antecedent group or the group of antecedents a purchase. Now, if you look at the image here, A arrow B, it means that if a person buys an item A, then he will also buy an item B, or he will most probably buy an item B. Now, the simple example that I gave you about the bread and butter and the eggs is just a small example. But what if you have thousands and thousands of items? If you go to any professional data scientist with that data, you can just imagine how much of profit you can make if the data scientist provides you with the right examples and the right placement of the items which you can do and you can get a lot of insights that is why association rule mining is a very good algorithm which helps the business make profit so let's see how this algorithm works so association rule mining is all about building the rules and we have just seen one rule that if you buy a then there's a slight possibility or there's a chance that you might buy B also. This type of a relationship in which we can find the relationship between these two items is known as single cardinality. But what if the customer who bought A and B also wants to buy C? Or if a customer who bought A, B and C also wants to buy D, then in these cases the cardinality usually increases and we can have a lot of combination around these data. And if you have around 10,000 or more than 10,000 data or items, just imagine how many rules you're going to create for each product. That is why association rule mining has such measures so that we do not end up creating tens of thousands of rules. Now, that is where the a priori algorithm comes in. But before we get into the a priori algorithm, let's understand what's the maths behind it. Now, there are three types of matrices which help to measure the association. We have support, confidence, and lift. So, support is the frequency of item A or the combination of item A or B. It's basically the frequency of the items which we have bought and what are the combination of the frequency of the item we have bought. So, with this, what we can do is filter out the items which have been bought less frequently. This is one of the measures which is support. Now, what confidence tells us? So, confidence gives us how often the items A and B occur together given the number of times A occur. Now, this also helps us solve a lot of other problems because if somebody is buying A and B together and not buying C, we can just rule out C at that point of time. So, this solves another problem is that we obviously do not need to analyze the products which people just buy barely. So what we can do is according to the sales, we can define our minimum support and confidence. And when you have set these values, we can put these values in the algorithm and we can filter out the data and we can create different rules. And suppose even after filtering, you have like 5,000 rules. And for every item, we create these 5,000 rules. So that's practically impossible. So for that, we need the third calculation, which is the lift. So lift is basically the strength of any rule. Now let's have a look at the denominator of the formula given here. And if you see here, we have the independent support values of A and B. So this gives us the independent occurrence probability of A and B. And obviously there's a lot of difference between the random occurrence and association. And if the denominator of the lift is more, what it means is that the occurrence of randomness is more rather than the occurrence because of any association. 
So lift is the final verdict where we know whether we have to spend time on this particular rule what we have got here or not. Now let's have a look at a simple example of association rule mining. So suppose we have a set of items A, B, C, D and E and a set of transactions T1, T2, T3, T4 and T5. And as you can see here we have the transactions T1 in which we have A, B, C, T2, A, C, D, T3, B, C, D, T4, A, D, E and T5, B, C, E. Now what we generally do is create some rules or association rules such as A gives T or C gives A, A gives C, B and C gives A. What this basically means is that if a person buys A then he's most likely to buy D and if a person buys C then he's most likely to buy A and if you have a look at the last one if a person buys B and C he's most likely to buy the item A as well. Now if we calculate the support confidence and lift using these rules as you can see here in the table we have the rule and the support confidence and the lift values. Now let's discuss about a priori. So a priori algorithm uses the frequent item sets to generate the association rule and it is based on the concept that a subset of a frequent item set must also be a frequent item set itself. Now this raises the question what exactly is a frequent item set? So a frequent item set is an item set whose support value is greater than the threshold value. Now just now we discussed that the marketing team according to the sales have a minimum threshold value for the confidence as well as the support. So frequent item set is that item set whose support value is greater than the threshold value already specified. For example if A and B is a frequent item set then A and B should also be frequent item sets individually. Now let's consider the following transaction to make the things a little easier. So suppose we have transactions 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and these items are there. So T1 has 1, 3 and 4, T2 has 2, 3 and 5, T3 has 1, 2, 3, 5, T4, 2, 5 and T5, 1, 3 and 5. Now the first step is to build a list of item sets of size 1 by using this transactional data. And one thing to note here is that the minimum support count which is given here is 2. Let's suppose it's 2. So the first step is to create item sets of size 1 and calculate their support values. So as you can see here we have the table C1 in which we have the item sets 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and the support values. If you remember the formula of support it was frequency divided by the total number of occurrence. So as you can see here for the item set 1 the support is 3. As you can see here that item set 1 appears in T1, T3 and T5. So as you can see its frequency is 1, 2 and 3. Now as you can see here the item set 4 has a support of 1 as it occurs only once in transaction 1. But the minimum support value is 2 that's why it's going to be eliminated. So we have the final table which is the table F1 in which we have the item sets 1, 2, 3 and 5 and we have the support values 3, 3, 4 and 4. Now the next step is to create item sets of size 2 and calculate their support values. Now all the combination of the item sets in the F1 which is the final table in which you discarded the 4 are going to be used for this iteration. So we get the table C2. So as you can see here we have 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 5, 2, 3, 2, 5 and 3, 5. Now if you calculate the support here again we can see that the item set 1, 2 has a support of 1 which is again less than the specified threshold. So we're going to discard that. So if we have a look at the table F2, we have 1, 3, 1, 5, 2, 3, 2, 5 and 3, 5. Again, we're going to move forward and create the item set of size 3 and calculate the support values. Now all the combinations are going to be used from the item set F2 for this particular iterations. Now before calculating support values, let's perform pruning on the data set. Now what is pruning? Now after the combinations are being made we divide C3 item sets to check if there is another subset whose support is less than the minimum support value. That is what frequent item set means. So if you have a look here the item sets we have is 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 1, 3, 2, 3 for the first one. Because as you can see here if we have a look at the subsets of 1, 2, 3 we have 1, 2 as well. So we are going to discard this whole item set. Same goes for the second one. We have 1, 2, 5. We have 1, 2 in that, which was discarded in the previous set or the previous step. That's why we're going to discard that also. 
which leaves us with only two factors which is 135 item set and the 235 and the support for this is 2 and 2 as well now if we create the table c4 using four elements we're going to have only one item set which is one two three and five and if we have a look at the table here the transaction table one two three and five appears only one so the support is one and since c4 the support of the whole table c4 is less than two so we're going to stop here and return to the previous item set that is c3 so the frequent item sets are one three five and two three five now let's assume our minimum confidence value is 60 percent for that we're going to generate all the non-empty subsets for each frequent item set now for i equals 1 comma 3 comma 5 which is the item set we get the subset 1 3 1 5 3 5 1 3 and 5 similarly for 2 3 5 we get 2 3 2 5 3 5 2 3 and 5 now this rule states that for every subset s of i the output of the rule gives something like s gives i to s that implies s recommends i of s and this is only possible if the support of i divided by the support of s is greater than or equal to the minimum confidence value now applying these rules to the item set of f3 we get rule 1 which is 1 3 gives 1 comma 3 comma 5 and 1 3 it means 1 and 3 gives 5 so the confidence is equal to the support of 1 comma 3 comma 5 divided by the support of 1 comma 3 that equals 2 by 3 which is 66 percent and which is greater than the 60 percent so the rule 1 is selected now if we come to rule 2 which is 1 comma 5 it gives 1 comma 3 comma 5 and 1 5 it means if we have 1 and 5 it implies we are also going to have 3 now if we calculate the confidence of this one we're going to have support 135 divided by support 15 which gives us 100 percent which means rule 2 is selected as well but again if we have a look at rule 5 and rule 6 over here similarly if it select 3 gives 135 and 3 it means if we have 3 we also get 1 and 5 so the confidence for this comes at 50 percent which is less than the given 60 percent target so we're going to reject this rule and same goes for the rule number six now one thing to keep in mind here is that although the rule one and rule five look a lot similar they are not so it really depends what's on the left hand side of the arrow and what's on the right hand side of the arrow it's the if then possibility i'm sure you guys can understand what exactly these rules are and how to proceed with these rules so let's see how we can implement the same in python right so for that what i'm going to do is create a new python file and i'm going to use the jupyter notebook you are free to use any sort of id i'm going to name it as a priori so the first thing what we're going to do is we'll be using the online transactional data of a retail store for generating association rules so firstly what we need to do is get the pandas and ml extend libraries imported and read the file so as you can see here we are using the online retail.xlss format file and from ml extend we're going to import a priori and association rules it all comes under ml extend so as you can see here we have the invoice the stock code the description the quantity the invoice data unit price customer id and the country now next in this step what we're going to do is do data cleanup which includes removing the spaces from some of the descriptions and drop the rows that do not have invoice numbers and remove the credit card transactions because that is of no use to us so as you can see here the output in which we have like 532,000 rows with eight columns so after the cleanup we need to consolidate the items into one transaction per row with each product for the sake of keeping the data set small we are only looking at the sales for france so as you can see here we have excluded all the other sales we are just looking at the sales for france now there are a lot of zeros in the data but we also need to make sure any positive values are converted to one and anything less than zero is set to zero so as you can see here we have still 392 rows we're going to encode it and see 
check again. Now that you have structured the data properly, in this step, what we're going to do is generate frequent item sets that have support at least 7%. Now, this number is chosen so that you can get close enough and generate the rules with the corresponding support, confidence, and lift. So, guys, as you can see here, the minimum support is 0 0.7. Now, what if we add another constraint on the rules, such as the lift is greater than 6 and the confidence is greater than 0 0.8? So as you can see here, we have the left hand side and the right hand side of the association rule, which is the antecedent and the consequence. We have the support, we have the confidence, the lift, the leverage and the conviction. So guys, that's it for this session. That is how you create association rules using the a priori algorithm, which helps a lot in the marketing business. It runs on the principle of market basket analysis, which is exactly what big companies like Walmart you have Reliance and Target too, even IKEA does it. Why Mathematics in Machine Learning? Aspiring machine learning engineers often tend to ask me, what is the use of mathematics machine learning when we have computers to do it all? Well, that is true. Our computers have become capable enough to do the math in split seconds where we would take minutes or even hours to perform the calculations. But in reality, it is not the ability to solve the math. Rather, it is the eye of how the math needs to be applied. You need to analyze the data and infer information from it so that you can create a model that learns from the data. Math can help you in so many ways that it becomes mind boggling that someone could hate this subject. Of course, Doing math by hand is something I hate too. But knowing how I use math is enough to explain my love for math. So allow me to extend this love to you guys too because I won't be teaching you just the mathematics for machine learning but the various applications you can use it for in real life. So what math do we need to learn for machine learning? Here is a pie chart which comprises of all the needed math. Linear algebra covers a major part followed by the multivariate calculus, statistics and probability also play a big role and you need to know the knowledge of algorithms and much more. This is the requirement that is needed to master machine learning. So now that we have developed this understanding, let's do some math. We shall kick off with linear algebra. Linear algebra is used most widely when it comes to machine learning. It covers so many aspects making it unavoidable if you want to learn mathematics for machine learning. Linear algebra helps you in optimizing data, operations that can be performed on pixels such as sharing, a rotation and much more. You can understand why linear algebra is such an important aspect when it comes to mathematics for machine learning. So let's move over to the first topic in linear algebra, scalars. So what is a scalar? A scalar is basically a value. It represents something, right? So scalars are just values that represent something. Suppose we had a laptop on sale and it is priced at 50,000 rupees, right? So this 50,000 rupees is the scalar value of that laptop. What are the operations that can be performed on scalars? It is just basic arithmetic. So for example, we have addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, all of those operations can be applied on scalars. Okay. For example, over here we are buying a laptop and the accessories. What is the total price? It will be the addition of both the prices. So 50,000 for the laptop and 5,000 for the accessories brings it up to 55,000 rupees. What happens if you're buying a laptop at a 50% discount? So it is half the price, right? It is 50,000 divided by 2 that becomes 25,000 rupees for the laptop. So, this is just a brief introduction and all that is required from scalars. So, once we are clear with this, let's move over to vectors. So, vectors can get a bit complicated as they are different for different backgrounds. Let me tell you how. Computer science people can interpret vectors as a list of numbers that represent something. Physicists consider vectors to be a scalar with a direction and it is independent of the plane. Mathematicians take vectors to be a combination of both and try to generalize it for everybody. All of these standpoints are absolutely correct and that's what makes it so confusing for anyone learning about linear algebra for mathematics for machine learning. In machine learning, we usually consider vectors in the standpoint of a computer scientist. 
where the data is in the tabular form consisting of rows and columns, right? And when our data is in the form of pixels or pictures, we consider them as vectors that are bound to the origin and transform them to matrices and perform operations that we shall discuss later. So now that you have a brief idea about vectors, let's jump over to the operations that you need to know when working with vectors. Operations on vectors can be applied only when you know what kind of data you're working with. Suppose you have pixel data and you want to apply rotations but end up doing something wholly different, your model will not work because it is doing all the wrong operations here. It's important that you make sure that you know what you're working with. Only then you will be able to apply the required operations. So the first operation that we have here is vector addition. So let's understand what vector addition does. So for example, vector addition is also called as dot product. Vector addition is something that is completely different from operations that we've been learning now for scalars. Okay, it's not simple arithmetic. It is actually the total work that is done by both the vectors in a quantified form. So for example, let me say that I want to walk forward by 50 meters and that is one vector. Okay, okay. So me walking forward for 50 meters is one vector and from there I go right for 25 meters, right? So that is the second vector. So what is the work that is completely done by both these vectors is me moving forward and then moving right. So let me say for example, V1 is what I walked forward, okay? And then V2 is something that I moved right. right? So what is the addition of this? The addition is basically putting both the vectors point to point and then finding the displacement or the work that has been done. If you look at it over here, it is V1 plus V2's work that is in the quantified form of V1 plus V2. It is the displacement. So for example, V1 is a distance and V2 is a distance. V1 plus V2 is the displacement. So that is basically what is a dot product. I hope you've understood this. So let's move over to the next operation that is a scalar multiplication. So what is scalar multiplication? So whenever a vector is multiplied with a scalar value, it either grows or shrinks. What this means is that you have a particular value, a scalar value, which is either positive or it is negative. And it may be greater than one or lesser than one. Whichever is lesser than one and it is negative, it will always make it shrink or else it will do the opposite. It will make it grow. So let me just show you an example over here. here. So let's say I have a vector called V1. Now if I'm trying to multiply this with a positive scalar value, say K, positive scalar value into V1 will make the vector grow. Whereas if I am trying to multiply this particular vector with a negative scalar value, say minus K, it will be shrinking down. down. So it is minus K into V1 gives me a shrink vector. So as you can see, this was my normal vector. And if I multiplied it with a constant K, which was positive, it grew. And if it was negative, it shrank down. So that is basically what is a scalar multiplication. So the next vector operation is a projection. So what does projection help us with? So for example, let's say I have two vectors, okay, V1 and V2. Now I do not know much about V1 and I just know more about V2. So if I can try to find a way in which I can project the vector V1 onto V2, I'll be able to obtain information about V1. So let me just show you. So for example, I have a vector V1 and I had another vector V2. So I know all about V2, but I do not know about V1 vector. So what happens over here is if I'm able to project the projection of vector V1 onto V2, I will be able to analyze and know the unknown features that vector V1 has, okay? Actually, if you go with this into deep learning, right? You can be able to find unknown features of the vector which can help you modify your one image into so many images that you can basically simplify and modify that image into something that it is not. Okay, that comes under deep learning, but we are not going to cover that. But this is a very important concept that you need to understand. It is basically like it's uh, said over here. Projection is the shadow of a vector that it places on the other vector. So whatever information that V1 vector has, 
I'll be able to somehow extract it from the vector v2 because the projection falls onto v2. That basically brings us to the end of all the vector operations that you need to remember for machine learning. Let's move over to matrices. So what is a matrix? A matrix is the composition or it is the mixture of numbers, symbols, expressions which are in a rectangular array. It can be rectangular, it can be square, it depends on the order. So what do we use matrices for? We use matrices to convert our equations into the form of arrays. For example, if you've got an equation, you cannot simply put that into your computer saying that, okay, solve this and give it to me. You need to convert it into a list or an array so that you will be able to perform your operations on it, right? That is the reason matrices are so much important to us. And that is the reason it is much more easier for us so that we can convert our equations into uh, lists and arrays and then perform our operations on them. So suppose for example, you have two equations over here. So how do you convert these two equations into matrices? So what does a uh, equation tell you? If you have 2x plus 2y is equal to 10. What this basically is trying to convey the information to you is that you have two constants x and y in these constants if you keep giving different numbers you will be able to find a different value for it let's say for example the scalar value is 10 and you have 2x plus 2y which is basically a vector i need to find the points of x and y find the points of x and y meaning that i'm trying to find the direction of the vector and then if i'm able to substitute values and then find out how 2x plus 2y is equal to 10. I'm finding all the information I need from that vector so that I can basically find out what all the other information I need from it. That is how functions are very important. You need to understand what a function is trying to convey to you. Let's say, for example, you have the equation of a straight line. So, what does a straight line be? It is y is equal to mx plus c. What does this mean? It means that the y coordinate is equal to some value m into x plus a constant. So I'm able to plot this. I'll be getting the y coordinate, the x coordinate, and I'll be able to get a straight line. So whatever numbers I put into these, I will always be getting a straight line. So that is the reason it is called the equation of a straight line. It is always going to be constant. So you have to understand what a function is trying to convey to you. Once we are done with that, let me just tell you how you convert equations into matrices. It's really simple. Take out all the numbers. So you have 2x plus 2y equal to 10, right? So 2x and 2y has two numbers, 2. So those two become one row. 4 and 1 in the second equation become one row. x and y becomes one column and 10 and 18. So let me just show it to you. So as you can see, we have a matrix 2, 2, 4, 1. Then we have x and y is equal to 10 and 18. If you multiply it accordingly, you will be getting back the same equation that we had earlier. This is how matrices are used in linear algebra. So once you know how the equations are converted into matrices, let's move over to the matrix operations. So what is the first operation? Simple addition. What does addition help you with? It is just basically adding all the directions of two vectors. Why is it two vectors? Because I'm converting vectors into matrices, right? You are simply just going to add the corresponding elements of both the matrices. Simply add the corresponding elements of both the matrices. And you have to remember that if you are adding two matrices, it has to be of the same order. What do I mean by order? It is basically the number of rows into the number of columns. So for example, if I have the first matrix that is 2, 2, 4 and 1, I have two rows and I have two columns. So that becomes a 2 cross 2 matrix. That is the order of the matrix. The next one also 2, 3, 1, 4, 4. It has two rows and two columns that makes it an order of 2 cross 2. So if I had three rows and I had two columns, it would be 3 into 2. So I hope you've understood what a uh, order is. Let's say I had these two matrices and I want to add them. So what I do, it is 2 plus 2. So let's say I have 2 over here and I have 2 over here. 
So what is 2 plus 2? It becomes 4. What is 2 plus 3? It becomes 5. What is 4 plus 1? It becomes 5. What is 1 plus 4? It becomes 5. So it is adding the corresponding elements of the matrix. So I hope you've understood that. So let's move over to the next operation matrix subtraction. It's the same thing as how you did it for addition. You just subtract the corresponding elements. If you had 2 minus 2, it becomes 0. 2 minus 3 becomes minus 1. 4 minus 1 becomes 3. 1 minus 4 becomes minus 3. Simple. You can understand this very easily. Moving ahead from matrix subtraction is matrix multiplication. What do you do with matrix multiplication? You are basically multiplying the rows with the columns. The matrix of row 1 with the columns of matrix 2. What happens? You have to remember that the number of rows in matrix 1 has to be equal to the number of columns in matrix 2. Only then will you be able to perform the matrix multiplication. So for example, if I had a 2 cross 2 matrix, it would be A11 into B11, A12 into B21, A11 into B12 plus the A12 into B22 accordingly. So let me show you an example for matrix multiplication so that you can understand how it works. Suppose I have a 2 cross 2 matrix that I've already been using for matrix addition and subtraction. Now how am I going to perform the matrix multiplication is basically I'm going to you know multiply the first row into both the columns of the matrix 2. So I have 2 into 2 plus 2 into 1 then I have 2 into 3 plus 2 into 4. The same thing goes for the second row also. So what do I get? I get 4 plus 2, 6 plus 8, 8 plus 1 and 12 plus 4. That accordingly gives me 6, 14, 9 and 16. So this is the matrix multiplication. It's really simple to understand. So if you have any doubts, leave them in the comment section. We'll get back to you as soon as possible. So once we are done with matrix multiplication, let's move over to the transpose. So the transpose is a really simple operation. All you do is you convert the rows into columns. That's it. But why is it so important? Transpose is really important when you want to change the dimensionality of your data. Suppose all your data is in a row. You can reiterate through there or all your data is in a column. You can do it accordingly. So it is really important when you work with transpose because it helps you to change the dimensionality. It helps you flip the dimension. So for example, if you're working with pixels, right? Pictures. If you change the rows or the columns of your pictures data, you are basically changing the picture and then you can, you know, analyze it more, get more information from it. So transpose plays a very important role. You need to understand that. So for example, I have two, two, four and one. What happens is the first column becomes the first row and the second row becomes the second column. So as you can see here, it is a 2, 2, 4 and 1 and that is all transpose is. So let's move over to the next operation. We have determinant of a matrix. By now, all we have been doing is having matrices being added, subtracted. So what is all of this? It is basically all the vectors being added, subtracted, multiplied, you know, then flipped with their dimensions. You will understand this when you do all of this practically. Because all of this is something that we do not do it in our daily lives. But when you're learning with machine learning, when you're performing machine learning, all of these operations come into picture. So all that you've learned by now is basically adding values of vectors, subtracting vectors, multiplying two vectors, then transpose that is the flipping of vectors. And now you're going to learn about determinant. What is a determinant? All the matrices that we had till now, they are basically directions. They are basically directions and values of all the vectors. Now all these vectors are definitely going to have a scalar value in them so that you can understand the weight. You can understand the depth of that particular matrix. What is the determinant helping you with with? The determinant helps you with understanding the weight or the you know sensitivity that it can provide on the data set. That is the reason determinant is really important. It is the scalar value of the matrix and it can help you give the eigenvalues of the matrix. What do I mean by eigenvalues? I'll tease that to you in the next part because we are going to understand in depth what are eigenvalues and eigenvectors. That is the reason determinants are so important. 
So let's say for example, I had this particular matrix a b c d e f g h i it would be a into e f h i and then it would be minus b into d f g i plus c into d e g h so what happens now is i'm going to get this particular equation so it's a e i plus b f g plus c d h minus a f h minus b d i minus c e g this is basically what is going to give me the scalar value of the matrix so i hope you've understood the importance and how determinants are important in machine learning so next we will learn about the inverse of a matrix so how do i explain inverse to you it's a very simple example if you understand that suppose i am walking on a road and i walked straight for 50 meters but then i remember that i had to get back something from the place i started so i walked back 50 meters what is the distance that i traveled the distance that i traveled was 100 meters why because i went 50 meters forward and 50 meters backward but what is the work that i have done it is zero why is that it is because i am at the same place that i started from that is not the work done if i move from one place to another place that is the work done that is some displacement that my body has achieved but i have not achieved that over here why it's because i have gone straight and come back straight for 50 meters making my work done zero so just the same way inverse of a matrix works suppose you have a vector that moves in the forward direction you will have the inverse of that particular vector that comes in the negative direction and it makes all the work done zero sometimes there is no inverse of a matrix that exists that's because the vector does not have all the information that is required to obtain its inverse so i hope you have understood what is a inverse let's see how do you find an inverse of it okay for a 2 cross 2 matrix this is how you're going to find it it is finding the determinant into the transpose or you know finding the inverse of the matrix so it is a and d that is going to be you know switched over and minus b and minus c this gives you the inverse of the matrix so for orders 3 and above what do you do do you find the determinant of a and then you accordingly find all the different determinants inside of it so that is basically how you find the inverse of a matrix let's move over to how a vector can be used as a matrix okay so by now that i've been telling that vectors can be easily translated into matrices and i've already showed it to you and why is it so important it's because they help you apply operations on the data very easily and then you have certain well known operations such as scaling rotation sharing and much more all of this come under computer graphics okay making these operations on your image or your vectors becomes really easy when you are working with matrices so that's the reason matrices are so important so for example right now i've shown you that if there was an equation v1 as 3x plus 4 it would be 3 and 4 and then you had x and y then you would have x plus 2y which would become 1 and 2 and then x and y that is how vector as a matrix works what are some of the well known operations right i'm assuming that there is going to be a 2 cross 2 matrix whenever you're scaling it is basically increasing the size so how do you increase the size it is sx and sy which are the scaling factors which you perform on your x and y coordinates then you have sharing which is basically moving or reshaping your particular object that you're working with so it can be m which is the sharing factor and then you have the rotation so how do you rotate your particular object in which direction so all of that can be done using these particular matrices so let's move over and understand how matrices can help you solve equations and you know obtain solutions much more easily so that is basically vector as a matrix fix we have two methods over here they are the echelon method and the inverse method for our tutorial i've been taking the row echelon method because it's much more comfortable for me if you are much more comfortable with column echelon method you can go ahead with that but because i am comfortable with row echelon methods i've used row echelon method and next we have the inverse method so we are basically going to solve the equations we are going to find the coordinates at which our points give us that particular value so let's move over with the first method which is the row echelon method and i have some equations over here which go ahead like 2x plus y minus z equal to 2 
x plus 3y plus 2z equal to 1, x plus y plus z equal to 2. So I'm going to convert all of this into a particular matrix. So let me show you how the matrix looks. It is 2, 1, minus 2, and 2, 1, 3, 2, 1, and 1, 1, 1, 1. So all the information about the equations have been put into the matrix form. And the answers that we are going to get are x is equal to 2, y is equal to minus 1, and z is equal to 1. So this is the reason I'm going to get all these particular values that is 2, 1, and 2, which I'm getting from the equations. Whenever I put the x, y, and z values into them, I'm going to, you know, get those particular coordinates. Now let me just tell you why we are solving equations, okay? So if I am telling that there is this particular vector that goes like this or comes in this direction or something like that. I want to find the x, y and z coordinates so that I can obtain the information, visualize it and then learn more about that particular vector. Now say for example, this is just 2x plus y minus z equal to 2. Let's say for example, if what if it was a 2 boxes plus 1 candle minus one chocolate is equal to giving me a profit of two rupees. Okay, so as you can see these are just simple equations and these are the coordinates that we get x is equal to two y is equal to minus one and z is equal to one. But what is the importance of this? Okay, let me just give you a simple example so that you can understand what we are actually trying to find out over here. Okay, suppose I have a factory and I want to get a profit of two rupees. And I have boxes, I have candles, and I have chocolates. So if I take the first equation, I'm saying that if I have two boxes, one candle minus the chocolate, it is going to give me two rupees profit. So what is X, Y, and Z exactly? X, Y, and Z are the investment costs. How much do I need to invest into them so that I can get back what I really required? So for boxes, I need to invest two rupees. For uh, chocolates, I need to invest nothing. For candles, I need to invest minus one or something like that. Okay. If I invest so much, I'm going to get two rupees profit. So this is like a real life example which is being converted into some equation and then we just need to solve it. That is the reason vectors are so important and how they can be converted into matrices and then, you know, solved very easily. How does the row echelon method work? I'm going to be taking the step one which is R1 divided by 2. R1, when we divide it by 2, we get 1 half minus half and 1. So what's the step 2? We will do R2 minus R1. So we have R2, which is the minus of R1. I'm going to get the particular equation, which is 1 half minus half and 1, 0, 5 by 2, 5 by 2 and 0, 1, 1, 1, 2. Simple enough, right? So what is the next step? It'll be R3 minus R1. So it is uh, 1 half minus half 1, 0, 5 by 2, 5 by 2, 0, and 0 half 3 by 2 and 1. The next step is 2 by 5 by R2. So you get 1 half minus half 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 0, 1 by 2, 3 by 2 and 1. So what's the step 5? Step 5 is basically R1 minus half of R2. So I get 1, 0, minus 1 and 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 0, 1 by 2, 3 by 2 and 1. Step 6 is R3 is equal to R3 minus half of R2. So I have 1, 0, minus 1 and 1, 0, 1, 1, 0 and 0, 0, 1, 1. Step 7 is R1 plus R3. So I have 1, 0, 0, 2, 0, 1, 1, 0 and 0, 0, 1, 1. Step 8 is R2 is equal to R2 minus R3. So I have 1, 0, 0, 2, 0, 1, 0, minus 1 and 0, 0, 1, 1. If you put all of this back into the equation, you will find out that for the first row, 1, 0, 0, 2 is equal to x plus 0 plus 0 is equal to 2. The value of x is, is equal to 2. The value of y is equal to minus 1 and the value of z is equal to 1. So this is how the row echelon method works. And what do you have to actually perform in row echelon? It is basically the first row has to start with the value 1 the second row has to have a zero and then somewhere in the middle it has to have a value of one and then the third row should be starting with zeros and then getting some value where it starts with one only so row echelon or column echelon whatever method you use you have to make sure that whichever element is the first starting element of the row it has to have a one or it has to be proceeding with zeros 
So as you can see here, the first row has one zero zero two, and then you have zero one zero minus one, and then you have zero zero one one. So that is how you are performing the row echelon method to solve your matrix. So if you remember, we had x is equal to two, y is equal to minus one, and z is equal to one. Those were the answers that we wanted. Once we are done with row echelon method, let's move over to the inverse method. So suppose we have some equations: 4x plus 3y is equal to minus 13, and minus 10x minus 2y is equal to 5. What does the inverse method tell us? Let me show it to you. To you. So this is the matrix that you come up with. So it is a 4, 3, minus 10, and minus 2. Then you have x and y, and which is equal to minus 13 and 5. So what does the inverse method actually tell us? For example, we know that a into a inverse is equal to zero work done, right? It is the identity matrix, I matrix. So if I have a into the a inverse, so it is like I'm doing the work and I don't do the work, is equal to no work done. So a into a inverse gives me the identity matrix. If a into b is equal to c, so a is my, you know, all the numbers, then b is my x and y, and c is the output value. If I do a into a inverse into b is equal to c into a inverse, I am going to get b is equal to c into a inverse. Because a into a inverse gets cancelled, so b is equal to c into the a inverse of it. So that's what I'm going to do. So what is the inverse of the two cross two matrix? The inverse is found by this formula and the inverse is actually 1 by 22 minus 2 minus 3 10 and 4. So that's the inverse of the matrix. So let me show you how it works. What happens is I'm having a into a inverse into b is equal to c into the a inverse. So a into a inverse is obviously going to get cancelled out because you know it's an identity matrix. So I'm just going to be left with x and y is equal to 1 by 22 into minus 13 and 5 minus 2 minus 3 10 and 4. So what I do later, I'm going to just multiply and this is what I get. So it's basically 1 by 22 and 11 by minus 110. So if I do 1 by 22 into the particular matrix that I found, it is going to be x is equal to half and y is equal to minus 5. So that is how I'm going to be using the inverse method to find or solve the equations. I hope that was simple to understand. So once we've done all of that, we are now capable enough to understand what an eigenvector is. Eigenvectors are really important when you're working with data. All of that, what vectors, matrices, what all we've been doing by now, think of it as the data you're working with in your machine learning algorithm, right? What is an eigenvector? Eigenvector does not change the direction even if a transformation is applied to it. What does a eigenvector really give us? So for example, I have a data. If I am trying to do any transformation on it, it should not change from what it was really. It should not change from what it was initially. It should not become something that is totally irrelevant to me. If I have such data that even if I apply transformations to it, it does not change what it was supposed to be. That is an eigenvector. What does an eigenvector give me? They are the most sensitive parts of my data set and I can use them and I can trust them for my analysis purposes. So that is why eigenvectors are so important. Eigenvectors help you transform and you know make your data much more careful. So for example, let me show you what an eigenvector looks like. Okay, so I have a particular rectangle and I have a lot of vectors, but for my example, I'm just going to be using two vectors. Okay, I have a V1 and V2. These vectors are basically trying to explain all the data that is there in the particular rectangle. What happens if I perform the sharing operation? When I perform the sharing operation, my V1 vector has changed its direction completely. It was at some other direction and after sharing or after performing some operation, it has completely changed its dimensionality, its direction. All the information that it held initially has now completely been changed. Whereas my V2, it has not changed its direction. Yes, it has moved forward. It has multiplied, but it gives me the same information that it was giving me earlier also. So that becomes an eigenvector. Think of this now in the form of a matrix. If my matrix is changing so drastically, how will I be able to perform operations on it? It becomes really difficult. 
Okay, so for example, think of the vector v2 as a you know list, which is then just multiplied by two. It does not make a difference. Why? It's because even if I multiply by two, it's just going to double the value. But the operation that I want to do on it, the information that it is giving it to me, that's the same. So that's the reason eigenvectors are so important. And what are eigenvalues? The values that we perform on these eigenvectors are all that are eigenvalues. It's that simple to understand. So that is all you need to know about eigenvectors. All the data which is not transforming anything is basically the data that you should be learning with. What are the applications that linear algebra helps us with? You have the first and foremost, which is the principal component analysis PCA. It is used for dimensionality reduction and it helps increase the quality of data. Then you are working with applying transformations. It helps in encoding. It helps in the single value decomposition where it is again reducing the dimensionality of a single value data. And then it is used for natural language processing for latent semantic analysis optimization of your deep learning models. All of this can be achieved through linear algebra. So it is a very important aspect of machine learning. Once we are done with all of this, let's start our coding for PCA. We will now be coding for principal component analysis. Let me show you how it really works. So I am having all the programs already prepared for you guys. So we do not extend this big tutorial even more further. Let me go to the presentation mode mode. So what happens over here is I am having these important libraries which are import numpy as NP. Then I have the pi plot as PLT and then from SQLearn or decomposition import the PCA. So principal component analysis is already present. I'm just going to import it from SQLearn. So I'm going to get a range of around you know 200 300 how much ever it is. After I'm getting that particular range, I'm going to get data. I'm going to get all of that data and then I'm going to put it into my particular list. So what happens over here? I have np dot dot and in the range of 2 comma 2 and it is in the range of 2 comma 200. So in the range of 2 comma 200, whatever numbers that you can randomly generate, please give it to me and then dot t. Why is it dot t? It's because all of this which I'm going to get is basically in the form of a column. I do not want it in the form of a column. I want it in the form of a row. So that is the reason I'm using dot t. t. Dot t is used to transform it. So I'm just going to scatter that on the plot and then show it to you guys. That is what this particular function does. And then I am doing PCA is equal to PCA of n components is equal to 2. And then I'm going to fit the data into it. And then I have a function which is to draw the vector. So I'm going to do arrow props dictionary style all of that. I've just given the styling over here and then I'm going to annotate and draw it accordingly. So this is my draw vector function and then I'm just going to scatter plot everything that I had. So I have the vector. So how am I going to get a vector? It's using this particular formula which is the vector and three and NP dot SQRT. So what is PCA explained variance and components? Okay. So if you remember I had fit PCA with the data that I have generated, right? So explain variance is basically going to tell me how much is the variance between my data points and what are the components that are really required that I look at and perform my analysis on them. So these are what the required components are for me. And after I do all of that, I'm going to get another vector. I'll show that to you guys. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to find one component only over here and I'm going to fit the data. Okay, and I'm going to transform and perform the inverse transform so that I am going to get a particular linear line which I can just look at and find all the important aspects of the data that I wanted to from it. Let me run the program and let me show you all the outputs. So as you can see here, this is all the data that I had generated using the dot function of the random generating thing. So this is all the random data that I have generated. Then what I did, I had to find out two components, right? Then what I had to do, I had to find out two components. What can I understand from this particular information? This one is a small vector. So this small vector means that this is the only amount of information that it can give. 
whereas this vector is so long. What this means is that the longer the length of the vector is the more information that it can pass to me. Simple enough, right? Longer the length of the vector, the more information that it can pass to me. So what all information I have through this particular vector, all of this is going to give me the best for my analysis. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get all the data points that are according to this vector. So as you can see here, all of these data points are very, very important for my analysis. So this is how I converted such a big, huge data set into one particular line. And if I follow all these points, I'm going to get almost the same amount of information. The whole data set is going to give it to me. As you can see, this was such a huge data set, but it's just come up to just one line. It's so easy. Think if you're working with tons and tons of data, it becomes really, really difficult when you're working with it. That's the reason use PCA and it's just not use PCA. Make sure that you're able to reduce the data as much as you can so that you can get at least all the amount of information that you can from that particular data. You do not need all the data, but you need the information from that data. That is basically how PCA works. I hope it was clear to you guys. So basically that was all we needed to learn from linear algebra and I hope it was clear to you guys. So now that we know all about vectors, let's move over to multivariate calculus. Multivariate calculus is one of the most important parts of the mathematics in machine learning. It helps us solve the second most important problem that we were facing in developing machine learning models. The first problem is obviously the pre-processing of the data. The next is the optimization of the model. Multivariate calculus helps us to optimize and increase the performance of a model and give us the most reliable results. So how does something that almost half the class hated help us solve such a problem? So let's break all the eyes that's surrounding this. But before that, we need to understand the basics. So let's calculus. So the first topic in calculus is a differentiation. Differentiation is basically breaking down the function into several parts so that you can understand every element and analyze it in depth. They are very helpful in finding the sensitivity of a function to the varying inputs. A good function gives you a good output, which can be described using a rather easy equation. The same cannot be said for a bad function. So for example, right here I have y is equal to e par x. It is really easy to tell that, okay, if it is e par x, this is going to be the graph for it. But look at y is equal to 1 by x. It is a, such a horrendous graph that I cannot explain it using a particular equation. Those are the types of equations. Those are the good functions and the bad functions. We know all of this, but what are we really after? So let's do all of that right now. Okay, so most of us already know all of this, but what are we really after? So let's understand that with a really simple example. So let's assume that we have a car moving in a single direction only and is already in motion. So if we plot a graph of its speed versus time, it communicates to us how the speed varies as the time keeps increasing and it halts after a certain point. Now, if we want to know the rate at which the speed varies with respect to the time, it turns out to be that we are actually finding the acceleration. The acceleration of the car can be plotted as follows. So what this means is that acceleration is actually a derivative of speed because the speed we have here is just the magnitude and does not hold any more factors just for simplifying everything. So if there was no speed, there would be no acceleration. It's as simple as that. Now that we have the acceleration, we can justify whether the car had a varying or a constant change in its speed, whether it was moving or not and much more. But in this case, that is all we need. Now think that you want to find the change in acceleration between a certain range in a time span. Okay. We mark two points X and some variable, which is a small portion more than X. We can denote this using X plus Delta X. So let's denote this on the graph so you can see it as it's shown over here. Now we know that this range has many values in between, but what if we want to know the rate of change only between one point and the next? We know that this is really kind of impossible because between a range, there are countless numbers as the function is continuous. Thus we approximate that the limit or the step between two input variables is zero. Remember that this zero that we are assuming is only the smallest possible value that we can make up and it is not the absolute zero. 
if we ever work with absolute zero, we would never have had any functions at all. So if you are still confused, this number is basically some value of 0 0.00000. It just keeps going and then some numbers ahead, but it is never really zero. That is the only way that we can put this as okay. So now that we have understood what we are really trying to find, let's make it a general equation. So let's derive the derivation formula. So the derivation formula is f dash of x is equal to limit delta x tends to zero, which is not exactly zero, but we are assuming it to be zero point something. So we are just going to write zero and then we have f of x plus delta x minus f of x divided by delta x. That is how the formula comes into existence. This helps us find the rate of change between one point to the other. It is such an important concept as it plays a huge role in the optimization of machine learning models. You need to understand that this is the first order of derivation only. If we differentiate the output of the first differentiation, it becomes the second order differentiation and so on. But that is all the introduction we need from differentiation. So now that we have the basic idea and formula of derivation, let's move over and understand some of the important rules that we need in differentiation. So the first rule that we will be talking about is the power rule. So whenever you have a function which has a variable with some power, you can basically use this formula and solve the equation much more faster. So for example, let's say that I had a equation called as f is equal to 3x square. So let me put this into the formula. So I have f dash of x is equal to limit x tends to zero. 3 of x plus delta x the whole square minus 3 x whole square divided by delta x. So x plus delta x the whole square becomes a formula. Let me expand it and then this is what I actually get plus x square and minus x square get cancelled and then I have delta x which is being removed out of there. So delta x and delta x also get cancelled. Then I have 3 into delta x plus 2 x. So I'm going to put the value of delta x is equal to zero into the equation, which is not exactly zero, but it is so small that I can ignore it. So I have three into two x, which becomes six x. So that's how I had to solve the whole entire equation, right? So what about the power rule? Power rule is just three and whatever number I had, right? So if it is a three x square, let me take out three because three, I am going to treat it as a constant. So x square. So x to the power of two. So then what I do, I bring two down, which is n and then I have x of n minus one. So it is two minus one. So it becomes three into two x, which is equal to six x. So I get the entire same answer, but I just had to do it in three steps. I can actually do it either in one step, but just for simplification, I've done it like this. The next rule that we are going to be studying is the rule of sum. So if you have a particular function, which is the sum of two variables, their differentiations sum also is the differentiation of the whole function. So if you have f of x1 plus x2, it will be x1 dash plus x2 dash. A simple example will be 3x square plus 5x. Okay, so I'm going to solve the equation right now. 3x square, I hope you remember, I just showed it to you before. And the same thing goes for 5x also. So so 5x plus 5 delta x minus 5 and then I'm going to just you know cancel out 5x's and then I have delta x being cancelled out and then I have x square minus x square being cancelled out. So the whole same process goes on then delta x gets cancelled then I have 6x plus 5. So I'm going to use the same rule that we learned earlier that was the power rule and then I have 3 into 2x plus 5. So I get 6x plus 5. This is basically how the sum rule works. Next, I have something called as the product rule rule. So if I have a function which is in the form of x into 2x or something like that, the differentiation is a very simple. This is how the differentiation looks. If it is f dash of x1 into x2, that is equal to x1 dash into x2 plus x2 dash into x1. That is how you're going to find out the differentiation. And the next rule that we are going to look at is the chain rule. So basically if I have f dash of g dash of x, it will be f dash of g into x dot g dash of x. This is a very simple example and it's really easy to understand. So if you want to learn more about the common functions, I have my blog which is also put up in the description and you can go ahead click over there and learn more about the common functions. Okay. 
So now that we have understood all the basics that we really needed from differentiation, we'll now be moving over to partial differentiation. Partial differentiation is an important concept that most of us have ignored throughout our academy. What has partial differentiation helped us achieve might be the question that most of you may be having right now. So let me give you an example so that you can understand its importance. Okay. Suppose you are a car designer who deals with the exterior of the car only. You have been given the task to maximize the performance of the car. So how do you do that? You do not go into the car. You do not take out the engine. You do not tune the engine. You are not supposed to do any of that. You just are going to change the particular exterior of the car. So what's happening over here? You know that even the engine and all the other tires and all that. All those are variables also that you know come to making the car better in its performance. But you are not going to do that. You're not supposed to do that because you are only going to deal with the exterior of the car. Those variables of the engine and all of that. Those are kept constant. If those are kept constant, that means that those variables will be performed by somebody else. You are just going to look at your particular variable that you have to change. That is the exterior of the car. So this is how partial differentiation comes into play. You are just going to change one particular variable. All the other variables become a constant. Okay, it's that simple. So what do you do? You would change the windshields, change the body if necessary, air vents and many many more. I've just given whatever I could find. You are just changing what is necessary. That is basically what is partial differentiation. So what are the equations that partial differentiation goes according with? Now if you can see it is the F dash of X, Y and Z. If you remember the previous slides, we were just working on one variable that is X, which is X1, X2, which may be X squared, 3X, 5X. It was all all on X. Partial differentiation is not like that. It is X, Y, Z, whatever variables it can find. So that is what makes partial differentiation much more realistic, much more easier to understand because you are just going to change your factors, your variables. You're going to keep everything else constant. So let's say for example, you have to find it with respect to Y. So Y and Z become a constant F dash of X. If you want to find it with respect to Y, X and Z become a constant F dash of Y. With respect to Z, X and Y become a constant F dash of Z. So what is the complete differentiation? It is the addition of all the three differentiations that we've just found out. So this is how partial differentiation works. Let's show you an example. So if I have a function which is x square plus 3y plus 4x z square. How am I going to find the differentiation of this? So with respect to x, y becomes a constant. So it is 0 and then you have a 2x plus 4z square. So with respect to y, x square plus 4x z square become a constant. So I will just have 3. So with respect to Z, it will become X square becomes a constant 3Y becomes a constant and then 4X Z square is what I am going to differentiate. So I will have 8X Z. So what is the total differentiation? It is a 2X plus 4Z square plus 8X Z plus 3. So I hope you've understood this really simple example of it. So this is how partial differentiation works. So what are the applications that multivariate calculus comes into play? We have something called as the Jacobian vector. Now, what is the Jacobian vector? It is basically differentiating the vector once. Jacobian is basically differentiating the vector once and then putting it into the form of a matrix that becomes the Jacobian vector. It helps in finding the global maximum of the data set. It is pointing to the maximum data that is there in the data set. And it also helps in linearizing a non linear function to a linear at a particular point. So that's how the Jacobian helps. So differentiating the Jacobian or differentiating the actual vector twice gives us the Hessian and it is used in minimizing the errors. It is used in deep learning models gradient descent for optimizing all the weights and all of that. So that is how multivariate calculus helps us in real life. Let me show you how the gradient descent works. I already have code ready for you guys. Let me go back to the presentation mode. I have a particular import which is the numpy and then I have the sigmoid function which is basically 1 divided by 1 minus e to the power of minus SOP. 
so this is what I am going to return back to it and then I have the arrow that is a predicted minus target whole square or x to the power of 2 this is what the error is basically and then I have the errors a derivation which I'm going to use over here so that is basically 2x or 2 into predicted minus the target part and then I have the actual function over here which is sigmoid into 1 minus sigmoid which is the activation function which is basically trying to find if my particular model is working or not and then I have the derivation of it which is just basically x and then I have the updating function of the weight so I'm just going to get the weight I'm going to get the gradient and I'm going to get learning rate and I'm going to basically keep trying to you know find out the best way that I can find my weight so here's my function I have x is equal to 0 0.1 which is my input and then I have the target which is 0 0.3 and I'm going to have a learning rate of 0 0.01 and then I'm going to get a random number which is the weight of it and then this is the initial weight what I'm going to do then is I'm going to find the value of y and x and I'm going to find the errors also and then I'm going to find all the gradients and then I'm going to pass the gradient into it and then update the weight. Let me show you an example now how increasing the number of steps is going to make me reach my target much more better. So as you can see my initial weight was 0 0.50 thing and all that and I have just run this for 10 times right. Let me change this to 1000. My input is 0 0.1 and this is 0 0.3. I have to make 0 0.1 as 0 0.3, right? So let me run this again. It is still at 0 0.50. Let me add another 0, which is 10,000 times. Let me run this. So as you can see, it has now become 0 0.47, which is much more better than what we were actually doing. Let me add another 0 over here. So this is going to take a lot of time because the amount of you know steps to be performed are more. But as you can see over there, which was 0 0.5 previously has now come up to 0 0.36, which is much much better than what we were actually getting. Let me add another zero. Let me run it again. You know, 4.6, 4.4, 4, 4.0. As you can see, it is reducing. It's just reducing the input and our output is almost almost close enough. What we really needed the target was 0 0.3 and as you can see here we've already read 0 0.30 and all the numbers that are succeeding it right. If you remember we had 10 steps which would just give us 0 0.50 or 51 something. Now for the amount of times it has learned it has become much 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 better than what we were previously getting. So now it is 0 0.300002 something. It's still reducing it is still reducing. So this is how the gradient design works. It keeps repeating learning learning. This is the final output that we've achieved 0 0.300577 and it is much 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 better than what we were already getting from the output. So this is how the gradient descent works. It uses uh, differentiation. Where is the derivation over here? This is my derivation function. This is my derivation function. So these derivation functions are what are helping me to get my new error. Get my new error and then put that into the gradient descent function and then basically find and make my weight much more better so that I can get the output which is from my input 0 0.1 I have to get the target of 0 0.3. So I hope you've understood how the gradient descent works. It keeps going in and in and it uses a differentiation lot. So I hope that was very easy for you guys to understand. So with that we have come to the end of all that was required from multivariate calculus. Let's move over to the next topic which is probability. So what is probability? Probability is measuring how likely an event will occur. What this means is that how much are you sure or how much quantity that you can give to your sureness that this particular event is going to happen. So that is what is probability. It is the ratio of the desired outcomes by the total outcomes, right? So with that particular formula, you will be able to understand what is the probability. It is the desired outcomes by the total outcomes. 
so always remember that probabilities always come up to one so if you have 0.6 that means you have a 60 percent probability that this particular thing will happen if you have 0.6 of something happening and 0.4 of something not happening they always sum up to one remember probabilities always sum up to one so some examples that i've given over here are rolling a dice there are six possibilities right so every possibility has one outcome out of the six outcomes so for example the probability of getting a number two is one by six so that is the probability of getting a number two two this is basically what is probability so what are the terminologies that you need to understand when it comes to probability there are three things okay you need to understand what is a random experiment what is a sample space and what are the events let's understand all of these terminologies one by one now so what is a random experiment it is an experiment or a process for which the outcome cannot be predicted with certainty so for example if i give you a dice okay and i tell you to roll it and tell me the number that you're going to get it you are not sure because that's a random experiment you have this uncertainty whether this particular event will happen or not okay so that process where you roll a dice and all of that that is a random experiment so what is the sample space the entire possible set of outcomes of a random experiment is the sample space of that experiment it's really simple right i tell you to roll a dice there are six outcomes so it can be either one two three four five six that particular range of one two three four five six is the sample space it is all the possible outcomes for the random experiment that you've been doing simple enough so what is an event an event is one or more outcomes of the experiment so if i told you roll the dice you get a number one that is an event you roll the dice again you get a number six that is an event so what outcome you get from your random experiment is called the event there are two types of events there are joint events and disjoint events let's understand both of these so joint events have common outcomes right joint events can be together that is what is a joint event for example you have a student who can get 100 marks in statistics and 100 marks in probability the outcome of a ball that can be delivered can be a no ball also and it can be a six also and it can be possible are called joint events disjoint events do not have common outcomes so the outcome of a ball that is to be delivered cannot be a six and a hit wicket or something like that okay so a single card cannot be a king and a queen together and a man cannot be alive and dead at the same time so those are disjoint events those are not at all possible to happen now that we've understood all the types of events we need to understand the distributions so now we have three distributions that come under probability we have the probability density function we have the normal distribution and central limit theorem so let's understand all of these distributions one by one so the first one is pdf probability distribution function so the probability now can be described using an equation the equation that describes a continuous probability distribution is called the probability density function i hope it's very clear to you if it is not let me just simplify it even more you have a function which is going to describe the probability of something happening in the form of a graph it's that simple enough to understand you have a function which will give you the probability which you can plot a graph on on so that is the reason it is a continuous probability distribution okay as you can see here you have a and b between the range of a and b is the most likely that something is going to happen so now that you've understood what a pdf is let's understand the properties of the pdf the graph of the pdf will always be continuous it's simple enough to understand that then the area bounded by the curve of the density function and the x axis is always going to be one and the probability that a random variable assumes a value between a and b is equal to the area under the pdf bounded by a and b what this means is basically if you have any particular value or any particular probability that is between a and b it is going to be equal to the area that is bounded by a and b the probability value so that is basically what a probability density function is so next we have the normal distribution so what is a normal distribution it is a probability distribution that associates the normal random variable x with a cumulative probability so how do you find this particular cumulative probability it is using this formula which is y is equal to 1 by sigma into the square root of 2 pi 
into e to the power of minus x minus mu into 2 divided by 2 sigma 2 where x is the normal random variable that we have just taken up then mu is the mean and sigma is the standard deviation and this is how the normal distribution looks like the graph of the normal distribution depends on basically two factors which is the mean and the standard deviation so the mean determines the location of the center of the graph and the standard deviation determines the height of the graph so if you have a very big deviation between you know your variables it becomes a very short graph and very wide graph whereas if you have a good deviation which is you know very less you will have a tall graph that is basically what's going to happen over here that is all we have from normal distribution then the central limit theorem so this is basically a theorem which is stating that the probability is always going to be in the center of the graph let me tell you the statement of this the central limit theorem states that the sampling distribution of the mean of any independent random variable will be normal or nearly normal if the sample size is large enough so what this basically means is that the distribution of your mean or your samples are always going to be near the center or always going to be near the mean of your graph if your sample size is much much large enough so what this means is that if your sample size is very very big it is going to be a normal distribution it is as simple as that so as you can see if I have n is equal to one component you can see the graph as it increases to 3 as it increases to 10 as it increases to 50 so as you can see it almost becomes nearly identical to a normal distribution so that is what the central limit theorem is so once we are done with that we will look at the types of probability we have marginal probability joint probability and conditional probability let's understand each of this so what is marginal probability marginal probability is the probability of occurrence of a single event if I flip a coin it is going to be either a head or a tail that occurrence of that single event is called as a marginal probability so for example I have a deck of cards here and I randomly take out a card from there and I want it to be a hard card right so that will be the probability which is 13 by 2 and it can be expressed by this particular formula so once we are done with marginal probability let's go to joint probability what is joint probability it is the measure of two events happening at the same time so the same example over here I have a deck of cards out of which I want to take out the ace which is a hearts so it has to be a ace card and it has to be a hard card which will be the probability giving me 1 by 52 so now that we've understood what is joint probability let's understand what is conditional probability so the probability that depends on something already happened is called as the conditional probability it is basically the outcome of the event is based on the occurrence of a previous event or an outcome conditional probability of an event B is the probability that an event will occur given that a event has already occurred what are the two types of formula that we have in conditional probability if a and b are dependent events then the expression for the conditional probability is given by p of b by a is equal to p of a and b divided by p of a if a and b are independent events that means the expression will be p of b only so it is just the probability of b occurring whereas if they are dependent events means that if you want to find the probability of b a already has to be occurred so it is a probability of a and b divided by the probability of a so that is basically all the introduction that was required from probability we now have a base theorem so what is base theorem it shows the relationship of one conditional probability and its inverse what is base theorem it shows the relation between one conditional probability and its inverse so this is the formula that is p of a by b is equal to p of b by a into p of a divided by the p of b so what does this particular thing mean so what we are trying to find out is the probability of the occurrence of a given that b has already occurred is equal to the probability of b occurring when a is already there and the p of a which is the prior probability which is something that we already think of and then the probability of b occurring so this is basically what the base theorem is let me give you an example for it okay suppose you are a doctor and you are running a clinic where you test if a patient has a liver problem or not all the previous patients that had come to you out of them 10 percent of your patients had liver problems okay so all the patients that had come before they had around 15 percent probability that they were drinking so now we have found out the probability of a and probability of b the prior probability and the probability of b 
So what was the probability that out of all of those patients, even though they had a liver problem, they were drinking? It is 5%, which is P of A by B. Hence, the Bayes theorem says that the probability that a new patient, whoever is entering, will have a particular liver disease is calculated by 0.05 into 0.10 divided by 0.15 is equal to 3.33%. What this means is that if a new patient is going into the clinic, there is a chance of 3.33% that that particular person is also having a liver problem. This is basically how the Bayes theorem works. So what are the applications of probability? Probability helps you to optimize your model. Classification of our algorithms also requires probability. The loss can also be calculated using a probability then models are built on probability. So let me show you how the naive base classifier works over here. So let me go to naive base. This is the naive base classifier. So let me tell you what I have done over here. I have imported the data sets, the metrics and all the required naive base classifier and I've imported the Gaussian naive base classifier. The Gaussian is also another name for the normal distribution. Okay, so normal distributions are called, also called as the Gaussian naive base classifiers and why I have done this is because I had visualized it and I came to know that it was a normal distribution. Okay, so I load the iris that is the load iris data set and I load a model and then I'm just going to fit the model. Okay, then I'm going to get the predicted model of it and then I'm just going to you know basically find all the metrics of it. So basically, let me show it to you. What is the precision recall of all of that? So this is all the accuracy. Then my model has an accuracy of 96% and this is the confusion matrix, which means that out of 50, it was able to classify all the 50 correctly. Then out of 50, it classified 47 correctly and three were wrong. And then out of 50 again over here, three were classified wrong and 47 were classified correct. So this is the naive base classifier. So as you can see, probability is actually being used in all of this. The Gaussian naive base classifier already does all of that. So we do not need to, you know, worry about it much more. So now that we have finished up everything that we needed to do from probability, let's move over to the last topic for today, statistics. What is statistics? Statistics is an area of applied mathematics concerned with data collection, analysis, interpretation and presentation. What this means is that you are going to analyze, understand all the data that you've collected and how you're going to present it. So for example, your company has created a new drug that may cure cancer. How would you conduct a test to confirm the drug's effectiveness? What are you going to do? You are basically going to collect a large amount of people around. You're going to take all of those people. You're going to, you know, give them the basically the new drug that you have created and then you're going to interpret all the results that you get from it. And then you're going to present that out of, let's say, 1000 people around 900 of them were cured or 950 were cured. So all of those parts come under statistics. Okay, so I hope you've understood that. What are the terminologies that you need to understand when you work with statistics? There is population and there is sample. So what is population? It is the collection or a set of individuals or objects whose properties are to be analyzed. All the data that you have collected is called as the population. So out of all the data that you've collected, you take out a set of data for your analysis. That set of data is called a sample. So what is a sample? A subset of the population is called as a sample. So a well chosen sample will contain most of the information about the population parameter. So how do you choose the sample? The sample needs to be chosen such that all the data that the population is trying to convey can be conveyed through the sample itself. So that is what is population and sample. Now that we've understood the basic terminologies, let's look at some of the sampling techniques that we have in statistics. So sampling can be classified as probabilistic and non probabilistic type of approaches. So in probabilistic sampling, we have random sampling, systematic sampling and stratified sampling. In non probabilistic one, we have snowball, quota, judgment, convenience and all of that. Okay, so but for machine learning, we do not need to take a look at the non probabilistic approach. We just need the probabilistic approach. So we will be now covering about random sampling, systematic sampling and stratified sampling. So let's go ahead with that. So what is random sampling? 
you take out a sample randomly out of the population. That is basically what is random sampling. Each member of the population has an equal chance of being selected in the sample. So that is what is random sampling. So what is systematic sampling? Systematic sampling is basically you follow a particular order out of which how the sample has to be taken. taken. As you can see here, I have six particular groups. Now from this six particular groups, I'm going to take all the even ones, right? So that will be two, four and six. That is basically how the systematic sampling works. I follow a system. I follow an order of how I'm going to take the sample. So once we are done with that, what is stratified sampling? What is a stratum? First of all, a stratum is basically a subset of the population that shares at least one common characteristic, which is the gender, which I have taken over here. here. So as you can see here, I have the whole population out of which I have found out one property that is common between all of them. That is gender. They are either male or female. So I'm going to break the whole population based on that. I'm going to break my population into the male subset and the female subset. So after that, I'm going to apply the random sampling and I'm going to take out all the samples that I am going to be needing. Okay. So once I have now broken down my particular subsets, now I'm just going to be using random sampling and take out all the samples that are required by me. So this is what is stratified sampling. So what are the types of statistics that we need to infer from from? We have descriptive statistics and inferential statistics. So let's understand each of these right now. Okay. So what is descriptive statistics? Descriptive statistics is mainly used to focus upon the main characteristics of the data. It provides the graphical summary of the data. So as you can see over there, descriptive statistics uses the data to provide descriptions of the population either through numbers or calculations or graphs or tables. Okay. So as you can see here, I have my shirt and there can be either three particular sizes. There can be the most minimum one, the most average one and the most maximum one. And all of that is based on the weight of the person. Suppose for example, if a person weighs 60, he's going to get the maximum one. If the person weighs 40, he's going to get the average one. The person weighs 20, he's going to get the minimum one. So that is how I am describing my data and I'm going to infer data from it. So that is descriptive statistics. So what is inferential statistics? Inferential statistics makes inferences and predictions about a population based on the sample that is being taken from it. So what this means is basically I'm going to generalize a large data set and apply probability and draw a conclusion to it. So it allows me to, you know, infer data parameters based on the statistical models, which is using the sample data. I have a whole bunch of population out of which they can tell me they have either the large size or the medium size or the small size. So according to their sizes, I'm going to supply them the t-shirts. So this is basically what are the two types of statistics. There are descriptive statistics and inferential statistics. Descriptive statistics, what does it do? It describes the data. Whereas inferential statistics takes information from the data and then analyzes accordingly to however we want it to. So these are the two types of statistics. Let's go in depth with descriptive statistics. What is descriptive statistics? It is used to describe and understand the features of a specific set of data. So what is descriptive statistics? It is a method used to describe and understand the features of a specific data set by giving short summaries about the samples and measures of the data. In descriptive statistics, it is broken down into the measures of center and the measures of variability. So what does measures of center have? Measures of center has the mean, median and the mode. Whereas the measures of center have the range, interquartile range, variance and standard deviation. So let's understand all of this right now. So for example, here you can see that I have a data set of a car which contains the variables, the car, the mileage, the cylinder type, the displacement, the horsepower and the real axle ratio. So I'm going to find out the mean. So what is a mean? Mean is the average of all the samples. So for example, if I want to find the mean of the horsepower, I'm going to just add the values and divide it by the number of values. So I get 103.625. This is the mean of the horsepower. So what is the median? It is the measure of the central value of the sample set. That is what is a median. So let me show you how to find it for the miles per gallon. 
to find the order of the center value you have to basically arrange it in the ascending order okay so you have 21 21 21.3 22.8 23 and accordingly now i have to take the two middle values okay okay so that will be 22.8 plus 23 divided by 2 that becomes 22.9 so that is the median of my sample next let's move over to mode the value which is most recurrent in the sample set is called as the mode so let me find the mode for the cylinder type what is most recurring the six stroke or the four stroke I can see here that there are one two three four five so there are five times that the cylinders type of six stroke has been repeated and three times cylinder type four stroke has been repeated so six becomes the mode of the data okay so now that we have understood all that is required from measures of center let's move over to the measures of spread right so a measure of spread is also called as a measure of dispersion is used to describe the variability in the sample or the population okay so the first one is a range range is the given measure of how spread apart the values are in a data set so it is the maximum value minus the minimum value which gives us the range so what is an interquartile range quartiles tell us about the spread of the data by breaking the data into many many quarters just like the median breaks itself so for example if i have eight data over here I can break it down into three quarters where I have a one two then I have three four five six and seven eight which become different different samples accordingly okay how do I find what is the interquartile range so how will I find the interquartile range of this okay so the first quartile q1 comes between the 25th and the 26th so it'll be 45 plus 45 divided by 2 that becomes 45 the second one comes under 50 and 51st and that will be 58 plus 59 by 2 that will be 58.5 and the next one comes at 75 and 76 that is 71 plus 71 divided by 2 which is always 71 so that is basically what is an interquartile range it is the measure of variability based on the dividing set into the quartiles so that is basically how you break down the interquartile range and it is the measure of variability based on dividing the set into quartiles so quartiles divide a rank order data set into four equal parts which would be q1 q2 and q3 respectively and the interquartile range is measured by q3 minus q1 so if you can see this you have the whole data which is 100 percent and you have broken down the data into 25 percent each so the quartiles come in between the first q1 q2 and q3 so those are the interquartile ranges so now that we've understood that let's move over to variance so variance describes how much a random variable differs from its expected value it entails the computing squares of the deviations so that is how you find the variance which is s square is equal to the summation of 1 to n is equal to 1 x i minus x bar the whole square divided by n so x i is the value and x bar is the mean i hope that's simple for you to understand what does a variance mean it means the difference between the data which it should have actually been so what does the variance actually try to tell you okay it basically means that the data which should have been something and what it really is what is the difference between them how much it differs from each other so that is what is the variance so what is a standard deviation deviation is the difference between each element from the mean so i have xi and i have the mean what is the difference between each of them is the deviation so what is the population variance the population variance is given by this particular formula that is sigma square is equal to 1 by n the whole summation of i is equal to 1 to n is equal to xi minus mu the whole square once we have found out the population variance what is the sample variance so it is s square is equal to 1 divided by n minus 1 the summation of i equal to 1 to n and xi minus x bar the whole square that is the sample variance so what is the standard deviation standard deviation is the measure of the dispersion of a set of data from its mean what the standard deviation is trying to tell you is basically that how much this data is trying to disperse from its actual data so how is that given by it is given by 1 divided by n summation of i equal to 1 to n xi minus mu the whole square which is basically the variance is square root so that is standard deviation so how do you find the standard deviation i'm just going to give you an example over here so say for example denarius has 20 dragons 
and they have the numbers accordingly. So how do you work out the standard deviation? So the mean is given by adding all the numbers dividing it by 20. So mu is equal to 7 and then what is the standard deviation? So it will be xi minus mu the whole square. So it will be 9 minus 7 the whole square is equal to 2 square is equal to 4 Then you have 2 minus 7 you know all accordingly you keep on going and you get the following results which is 4 25 4 9 25 0 accordingly. Once you have done that put that into the formula. So you have this formula accordingly. So we get the variance square is equal to 8.99 and the standard deviation will just be the square root of 8.9 which will be 2.983. What this means is that with a value of 2.983 the values are differing from the mean. So if you are trying to add 2.983 to all the other values you will be getting something which is much more similar and much more realistic and much more you know closer to the mean of the. So that is how standard deviation works. Now that we've understood all of that we have a very classic example of information gain. So what does information gain help us with? This is an ideology that comes into picture for decision trees. So let's understand the basic concepts of what we require in information gain. So the first topic that we need to understand is entropy. So what is entropy? Entropy measures the impurity or uncertainty that is present in a data and it is given by the formula HFS is equal to minus summation of minus 1 to the power of n P of phi log base 2 P of phi. Where s is all the instances in the data set, n is the number of the distinct class values and p of i is the event probability. Because entropy is the impurity that a data has. So what is information gain? Information gain is how much information a particular feature will give to the final outcome. So that is given by gain of a of s is equal to h of s which is the entropy minus summation of j is equal to 1 to v s of j divided by j into h of s of j is equal to h of s minus h of a by s. h of s is the entropy of the whole data set. s of j is the number of instances with j and a value of attribute a. s is the total number of data sets. b is the distinct value of attribute a. h is the entropy of the data set with value a and entropy of attribute a. So these are all the requirements. So let me give you an example of information gain. You can see the data set over here which is for 14 days and the particular you know attributes that are given to it. So the forecast is to find out whether the match will be played or not according to the weather conditions. So this is what we are trying to find. Here we have five no's and nine yeses. So we have the outlook and then we have sunny overcast and rainy. So in sunny we have three no's and two yeses. In overcast we have a four yeses and zero no's and in rainy we have three yes and two no's. So how are we going to find out which particular node is going to you know attribute the most to it. So let's find out the entropy first for the whole data which is nine instances say yes and five instances say no. So we have a minus nine by 14 log base two of nine by 14 minus five by 14 log two of five by 14 is equal to 0 0.940. So what this means is that the data that we have has 0 0.940 times bad data it means it cannot give us much information There is much more impurity in the data. So let's move over. The first step in information gain is to find the root variable. So how are we going to find the root variable? We are going to take all of the attributes and find the information gain from them. We have outlook. We have windy humidity and temperature. So let's find out the information gain. So for information gain of windy we have six instances true and eight instances false right. So h of s is equal to 0 0.940 minus 8 into 14 and as you can see all the other variables. So the gain that we have achieved from windy is 0 0.048 which is really really less. So for outlook the same thing happens over here. We have the information gain that is being passed by it is 0 0.247. Then we have the information gain from humidity that is 0.15 which is also really good and then we have temperature which is 0.029. You can pause and look at the steps if you want to. Out of all the gains that we have the variable with the highest information gain is used to split the data. So outlook has 0.247, windy has 0.048, 
gain has 0.151 and gain of temperature is equal to 0.029 so what are we going to choose we are going to choose outlook look why is that that it's because it has the highest information gain so that becomes our root node that is a simple example of how statistics is used in the information gain next let's move over to the confusion matrix so what is a confusion matrix confusion matrix is a table that is often used to describe the performance of a classification model so it is a table that is used to describe the performance of a classification model on the set of test data so how are you going to calculate the accuracy of this it will be true positives plus true negatives divided by true positive true negative false positive false negatives so if you are confused with what is true positive true negative false positives false negatives let me explain that to you right now let's say for example there are two possible predictor classes which are yes or no the classifier made a total of 165 predictions that means 165 predictions were total so out of the 165 cases the classifier predicted yes 110 times and no 55 times so in reality 105 patients only had the disease and 60 patients did not so how are we going to put this into the table so as you can see here in the table we have n is equal to 165 then we have predicted no and predicted yes actual no and actual yes so if our classifier predicted it no and it was actually no that is the correct output but if it predicted yes and it was actually yes that is also the correct output but it predicted it as yes and it was actually no that means it has made a mistake and it predicted no but it was actually yes it has still made a mistake what are the correct values over here which is a 50 and 100 so 50 and 100 are the correct values and 10 and 5 are the wrong values what is a true positive true positive are which it was predicted as yes and they actually have the disease true negatives are predicted no and they did not have the disease false positives are classifier predicted it as yes but they did not have the disease and false negatives we predicted no but they also had the disease so this is basically what a confusion matrix is and it is helpful in finding out the performance of the classifier that you are working with so that is what is a confusion matrix next comes inferential statistics it is a method where we infer and understand what the data is trying to communicate with us so it is broken down into two points it is a point estimation and interval estimation so let's understand about point estimation point estimation is concerned with the use of a sample data to measure a single value which serves as an approximate value or the best estimate of an unknown population parameter so we have such a huge population of india right out of that you're just going to randomly take out some sample of it you're going to find out the sample mean and this sample should be so good enough that it is going to estimate the whole mean of the population so this is how you use point estimation and try to approximate it for the whole you know population so what are the different methods we have methods of moment methods of likelihood base estimator and best unbiased estimators so estimates are found out by equating the first k sample moments to the corresponding k population moments which is the method of moments and then we have the maximum of likelihood which uses a model to maximize a likelihood function base estimator minimizes the average risk and it is an expectation of all the random variables and then we have the best unbiased estimators which is used to find out the best depending parameter so that is all that we require from point estimation let's move over to interval estimates so an interval or a range of values is used to estimate the population parameters so we have a point estimate and we have an interval which gives us the low confidence and the high confidence limit how is this going to happen there are three things that you need to remember there is something called as the confidence interval and it is the measure of your confidence that the interval estimate contains the population mean mu so statisticians use a confidence interval to describe the amount of uncertainty associated with a sample technically a range of values are so constructed that it is specified probability of including the true value of a parameter within it so for example let's take a sample where we have 10000 so let's say that we have something called as a supermarket so out in that supermarket we have collected a lot of data and in that data i am seeing that this particular items okay so item 1 and item 2 2 
if they both are kept together they are going to be sold together and i say that with 90 percent confidence so that 90 percent confidence okay is what is my confidence interval it can be in between this range it can be between 90 to 95 percent and between 90 to 95 percent it is highly likely that that particular thing is going to happen so that is my confidence interval so what is the sampling error it is the difference between the point estimate and the actual population parameter which is the sampling error okay so when mu is estimated the sampling error is mu minus x bar it is mean minus the point what is the margin of error so for a given level of confidence it is the greatest possible distance between the point estimate and the value of the parameter it is estimating what this basically means is that it is the greatest possible distance between what you have predicted and what it actually is and what level of confidence you are giving to it okay so that is the margin of error how much error you can allow for the predicted model is what is the margin of error so i hope you have understood that so the level of confidence is the probability that the interval estimate contains the population parameter so as you can see here all the parameters that come under c right are what we are allowing okay that is the margin of error that is allowed but whatever comes in minus zc and plus zc we are not going to take that those are the interval estimates so finding these intervals is what is our probability so finding these interval estimates is what is our work over here okay so for example if the level of confidence is 90 percent this means that you are 90 percent confident that the interval contains the population mean 0.05 and 0.05 of minus zc and plus zc is equal to plus 1.645 and minus 1.645 those are the z scores anything minus or plus of 1.605 is not allowed so those are the values that we are concerned with when we are working with interval estimates so now that we have understood everything we needed to from inferential statistics and descriptive statistics let's move over to hypothesis testing so what is a hypothesis first of all it is some event that you have made up which may have the probability of happening or not happening testing that hypothesis is what is hypothesis testing is you know formally checking whether this hypothesis is accepted or rejected so how is the hypothesis testing conducted you first state the hypothesis and then you formulate an analysis plan of how you are going to you know test this particular hypothesis then you get all the output you analyze the data that you've got from all of it so then you understand whether this particular hypothesis has failed or it is a good hypothesis okay suppose i have four boys over here which are nick john bob and harry so they were caught doing mischief in the class and they have to now serve detention for almost two months okay the detention is is basically they have to clean the classrooms so john over here comes up with an idea saying that i'm going to write all the names of arts into chits and then put them into a bowl whosever name comes out has to clean the classroom so what happens here that we are going to assume that the event is free of bias so our hypothesis is what is the probability of john not cheating let's find out what happens actually the probability of john not being picked up for a day is three by four now the probability just keeps increasing on and on if he is not picked up for three days okay so it is three by four into three by four into three by four is equal to 0 0.42 approximately and what is the probability of john not being picked up for 12 days it is 3 by 4 into 12 is equal to 0 0.0322 which is equal to 3.2 percent which is less than 0 0.05 which is 5 percent so what this means is that our hypothesis was that john is not cheating but actually john is cheating over here because it has come down and it has come below the threshold value of 5 percent which is 3.2 percent so now all of us have come to know that john is cheating because he has not even written his name in the chits so this is how the hypothesis works so what is the null hypothesis is the hypothesis that we have created in the beginning okay that john was not cheating that was a null hypothesis it has no result which is different from the assumption and we have an alternate hypothesis which means that our results disapprove the assumption we had a hypothesis that john is not cheating but actually through our results we found out that john is cheating so this is what is the hypothesis testing and we have a threshold value 
if the probability that we are testing goes below this threshold value it means that the particular hypothesis has failed so this is what is the hypothesis testing so now we need to know something about the p and t values okay what is the p and t values the p value and the t value help us in our hypothesis testing okay we want to find the height of students who are greater than 5 feet and 7 inches okay so we take a sample of 100 students and find that the mean height was 5 feet and 9 inches okay we make a hypothesis that out of all the 100 students there is going to be at least 6 students who are greater than 5 feet and 9 inches so this is our p value it is the probability value that we are saying that this particular hypothesis is going to be correct we say that at least out of 100 times 6 students will at least have a height which is greater than 5 feet and 9 inches okay so this is the p value this is the probability value that we have given to a hypothesis the t value is testing this particular hypothesis and finding the difference that we have found out from our assumption and what we have actually calculated from our results so this is how the p value and the t value help in making the null and alternate hypothesis you know you find the result of the null hypothesis and the alternate hypothesis so this is how the p and the t values help in making and observing the results from the null and alternate hypothesis okay let me show you a code where we are going to find the mean median mode accordingly and how that becomes helpful to us okay so let me go back to the presentation mode i have my data over here which is this particular data so i am going to import statistics as s and i am going to just find the mean median mode of it so let me just run this program for now so as you can see here the mean is 33.43 and the median is 3 and the mode is 2 2 has been repeated the most number of times so that is the reason it is the mode and the variance is 5124 and the standard deviation is 73 that is how the mean median mode is calculated let me run the program now so that you can understand what we are trying to do so let me close this out what's happening over here is i have the iris data which is the load iris and then i am creating it into a data frame okay simple enough after that i am seeing that the species is the target and the data of species is equal to i am going to just apply all the lambda parts of it okay and then i am going to get the description of the data and after that what i'm going to do is i'm going to take this data and i'm going to pair plot it and then i'm going to show the plot to you so let me run the program let me show you the figure first so i had four features over here right so that was the petal length petal width sepal length and sepal width so if you can take a look at this data you can see that there is a normal distribution here there's a normal distribution here also there's a normal distribution over here with some exclusions over here and there is a normal distribution here too but with some exclusions here so looking at this i will be able to understand if i want to you know apply the gaussian nape based classifier or accordingly to however i wanted to so this is how statistics has helped me to understand what is my data looking like now let me go back over here so as you can see this is the count of 150 right simple enough then what is the mean what is the standard deviation what is the maximum length and maximum width that you can find over here all of this is done using the describe part of it okay and describe is a function that is already available in pandas so that was a very simple example of how i was able to understand how i have to use the gaussian nave based classifier for my iris data which i showed in the probability part right now we are done with this so what exactly is predictive analysis Predictive analysis is the branch of data analysis which is mainly used to predict future events or outcomes. It is solely based on data driven approaches and techniques to reach to conclusions or solutions. The analysis mainly makes use of analytical techniques and predictive modeling in order to find relevant patterns in large data sets. In turn, these patterns can be used 
to make various opportunities in the businesses by identifying risk and benefit points, etc. Predictive analysis is an anticipatory technique for forward looking solutions and insights to assess any situation. Most of the processes in the predictive analysis incorporates the machine learning terminologies and algorithms for model building, especially to train the models. So it is significantly important to understand how to choose these predictive techniques for model building. And as a beginner, it can help you a lot along the way. So let us quickly take a look at why we do predictive analysis and I'm sure most of us are aware of the significant increase in the generation of data all around us. It has seemingly become quite clear since we are seeing a lot of data driven approaches. But humankind has been storing data since a very long time. Documenting every detail has been a prevalent practice. With the digital age, it has become to process the data a lot more easier as well. But it has also opened a lot of opportunities for the years and years of long and unprocessed data. To understand the relationship between various aspects of the data and make use of it in real life as well. We can use this data for you know various purposes. We have like risk and fraud detection, then there is market analysis, operational movements, operational improvements, campaigning, etc. And one simple example is to use the weather data to study the patterns and use predictive analysis based on the insights to predict the future events. So let's take a look at a few predictive analysis techniques as well. First of all, we have regression guys. So the main goal of regression is the construction of an efficient model to predict the dependent attributes from a bunch of attribute variables. A regression problem is when the output variable is either real or a continuous variable that can be weight or area or salary, etc. We can also define regression as a statistical means that is used in applications like housing, investing, etc. It is basically used to predict the relationship between a dependent variable and a bunch of independent variables. And simple linear regression is a regression technique in which the independent variable has a linear relationship with the dependent variable. It is basically a technique to analyze data set which has a dependent variable and one or more independent variables to predict the outcome in a binary variable, meaning it will have only two outcomes. And the dependent variable is categorical in nature. Dependent variable is also referred as target variable and the independent variables are called as the predictors. Logistic regression is basically a special case of linear regression where we only predict the outcome in a categorical variable. It predicts the probability of the event using the log function. Next up we have classification guys. So classification is a process of categorizing a given set of data into classes and it can be performed on both structured or unstructured data. The process starts with predicting the class of given data points and the classes are often referred to as target label or categories. The classification predictive modeling is the task of approximating the mapping function from input variables to discrete output variables. And the main goal is to identify which class or the category the new data will fit into. Now let us try to understand this with a simple example guys. So a heart disease detection can be identified as a classification problem and it's a binary classification since there can only be two classes which is basically has a heart disease or does not have a heart disease. So the classifier in this case needs training data to understand how the given input variables are related to the class. And once the classifier is trained accurately, it can be used to detect whether heart disease is there or not for a particular patient. Since classification is also a type of supervised learning, even the targets are also provided with the input data. And then we have clustering guys. So clustering is basically, you know, dividing data points into homogeneous classes or clusters. So the points in the same group are as similar as possible. And then the points in different groups are as dissimilar as possible. So when a collection of objects is given, we put the objects into group based on similarity. So that is what clustering is all about. And then we have another technique which is time series guys. So the time series model comprises a sequence of data points captured using time as the input parameter. It uses the last year of data or you know the previous data to develop a numerical metric and predicts the data using that metric. It's basically a means of understanding a singular metric is developing over time with a level of accuracy beyond simple averages. So it also takes account uh, seasons of the year or events that could impact the metric as well. And next up we have forecasting. 
So forecasting is nothing but using the historical data to make predictions or numeric predictions on a new data based on the learning from the previous data. Now that we know what these various techniques are, let us understand how to choose which one would be the best one for us while working on any data. So there are a few factors that you should consider while choosing a model. But before that, before talking about the deciding factors, let us go through the processes before a predictive analysis before you start building the model. First off, we have the problem statement guys. So problem statement tells a lot of things about the project or how you should approach it. If you're looking at the problem statement, you'll be able to know what kind of target you're looking at. So in a heart disease condition guys, let's say for an example, we have a problem statement to decide or to analyze or predict if a patient has a heart condition or not. So with that said, we have already figured out the target variable, which is going to be categorical in nature, which means it basically will have only two values. That is one has a heart disease or does not have a heart disease. So it becomes quite clear to us in the problem statement only. We're going to use the classification technique in this particular example. But then there are a few problems where you will not be able to figure out which kind of target variable you will be choosing or what are all the independent factors will be involved in your analysis. So you move on to the next one, which is extraction and loading and you basically analyze all your data, you know, and, and transform it and try to make use of all the information that you get from visualization and all these processes to understand what kind of variables you're looking at and then comes the factors to consider before going for the model, which is what is the target variable. So if the target variable is continuous, you should go for the regression analysis. And if the target variable is categorical, you can go for the classification analysis. And if you're not able to find a target variable, don't worry guys, you can probably go for a clustering analysis. So you'll know which points are similar, which points are not similar, making it a classification or, you know, making clusters. And then you can perform classification on those clusters as well. The next question you should be asking is, is your data linearly separable? And there is no direct way to actually determine it. So we can go ahead by choosing different models. I mean, you can compare different models to see if your data is actually linearly separable or not. Then the next factor would be the size of the data. You have to look for factors like the size of data to determine the possibility of overfitting and underfitting the model. Also, some models may not work efficiently with small data. So these are some deciding factors for choosing a model before you train the model with the training data. And let us take a look at a few machine learning models so that we can use for predictive analysis. The first one is linear regression. So linear regression is to be used when the target variable is continuous and the dependent variable or variables is continuous or a mixture of continuous and categorical. And the relationship between the independent variable and the dependent variable has to be linear. So that is when you know when you can use a linear regression. After that, we have logistic regression. So logistic regression does not require a linear relationship between the target variable and the dependent variables. The target variable is binary, assuming a value of either one or zero or maybe, you know, true or false or something or dichotomous as well. Then we have the K means clustering model guys. So K means involves placing unlabeled data points in separate groups based on similarities and this algorithm is used for the clustering model as well. After that we have neural networks. So neural networks help to understand or help to cluster and classify the data guys. So these algorithms are modeled loosely after the human brain and are designed to recognize patterns. Then we have decision tree. So a decision tree is a map of the possible outcomes of a series of related choices. It allows an individual or organization to weigh possible actions against one another based on their costs, probabilities and benefits. As the name goes, it uses a tree like model of decisions and they can be used either to drive informal discussion or to map out an algorithm that predicts the best choice mathematically. After that, we have time series guys. So the time series regression analysis is a method for predicting future responses based on response history. And the data for a time series should be a set of observations on the values that a variable takes at different points in time. So these are a few models that we have for predictive analysis and these are only a few models and there are other models also that we can use for predictive analysis. And with that said, uh, let's also see a few applications of predictive analysis so we can use it for finance guys. 
so predictive analysis in finance can help in uh, identifying the risk detection or the risk detection model to identify any fraudulent transactions or uh, loans that you can detect using the predictive analysis then there is stock prediction as well you can gather a lot of data in time and forecast a prediction that can be taken into account for different stocks and there goes a lot of process behind this but for as far as the application goes stock prediction is a pretty good uh, application of predictive analysis in uh, finance then we have governments guys so governments are using predictive analysis for campaigning they're using it for weather detection weather uh, prediction there is disaster management they're using predictive analysis for you know predicting the impact of policies different policies that they are making and they're making surveys etc we can use the predictive analysis in healthcare for early detection of diseases such as cancer any heart ailments that may or may not be a part of your life several years later so it helps in predicting all those diseases or you know conditions at an early stage and we can also use a predictive analysis in manufacturing we can actually identify production failures and work on it using the prediction analysis then there is sport franchises using a uh, predictive analysis to you know predict the outcome of uh, certain events in the leagues or something like that they are trying to make sense of what kind of match they have the best probability or the best prediction of winning the chances of winning they have or if they don't have any winning chances what are the you know the basic points or basic insights that they are getting from the data that they should work on to win that particular game or a match or a league and then they, we have uh, telecom industries using predictive analysis for customer support you know they're trying to segregate or segment the customers into groups that they are able to work on them based on their prediction now i would like to brief you through the process of how machine learning works actually and this is pretty much common for most of the algorithms that you are going to implement first and foremost you would be needing data now i've already talked about the point that data is centric to machine learning if you do not have data you cannot make any predictions and more the data the better it is for you so the first part is having data and once you have the data the next point you need to confirm or make sure is the data is appropriate for machine learning and this is where pre processing steps in what pre processing does is it helps you process the data that you have and prepare it for machine learning i mean your data might not always be clean there might be some missing values some repetitive values which you do not want in your data when it is getting processed right so in this case we filter out this data we clean it we fill in certain values we predict certain values and we put in those values there and once this data is up and ready for working then we pass it on further and then we provide a particular machine learning algorithm to it now this again is a trial and error kind of method where it seems simple at times because we have discussed all those machine learning algorithms right so to naked eye or to naked mind basically we might think in this direction where we would think that okay this is the kind of problem i'm dealing with so this is the algorithm i might use but that is not the case at times the data is misleading we are not sure what kind of algorithm i want to use what kind of data i want to pass and how much data i want to pass in that case what we do is we first allot a particular algorithm use it implement it then we test the values then we try out some other algorithms as well and then we come to a conclusion as in okay this is the best algorithm and using which i have generated a model which is best to meet my needs and while doing that there are quite a few processes that happen processes like training testing validating where you pass in certain amount of data you build the model you train the model and then again you pass or keep some data behind which you later pass to test these models as in are they working properly or not so this is an iterative process and this might take in more than one iterations to actually go ahead and jot down or settle down onto a particular point so once your algorithm is selected once your machine learning model is built you can actually go ahead and deploy this model into your environment or real time working where it would be able to predict the real time data or the data you provide your so called algorithm right so this is how the whole process of machine learning works now the processes which i talked about pre processing then implementing various algorithms training testing your data now this again they look simple or when you listen to them they seem pretty easy as in training the data and all those things but once you start implementing these things it is fairly difficult ask any data scientist and that person would tell you that pre processing is something that is very difficult to deal with and most is 60 to 70% of the work is done in these phases only so what if we had something that could actually help us here wouldn't that be easy i mean if we could just speed up this process of pre processing algorithm selection training and testing data instead of doing these manually can we do all these things automatically the answer is yes 
Now this is where your Azure machine learning steps in. What Azure machine learning does is it helps you carry out the whole process. But as you can see, we have something called as ML Studio and it focuses on your pre-processing application of algorithms and deployment processes. So bulk of the task where which can be repetitive or which can require you to put in more efforts to implement manually it actually helps you automate or speed up that process so that is what ml studio is basically it is a studio or a service in a very popular cloud service provider that is microsoft azure which lets you implement various machine learning algorithms and it carries out the bulk of task or the bulk processes which you would otherwise not want to do now this is not something that actually is used to replace data scientists you cannot do that so no offense to any data scientist who is listening to this video or going through this video. It is more or less complementary to data scientists. You would be needing statistical knowledge and hence we talked about machine learning a little because even if you build models using Azure or any platform you would be required to have proper statistical acumen or knowledge about data science something that would help you understand the output of the models that you've built. So yes, some statistical knowledge would always help and you cannot replace that. But definitely if you are working on machine learning and you need to speed up this process or make it more efficient then Microsoft Azure and ML Studio in particular is a very important resource for you to have. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to switch into the demo part and we would be building a model so that we can discuss some of this stuff that I've already talked about and we also get to see how Microsoft Azure works in real time, right? So let me just switch to the Azure portal or console that we have at our disposal. So guys what I've done is I've gone ahead and I've switched into my Microsoft Azure portal for people who are completely new to Microsoft Azure. You can actually avail certain services that Microsoft Azure offers you for free for one month. Now during this period you can avail certain credit for US citizens or people who have an account in US region. They can actually avail up to $200 of usage where you can use certain services. Now these services are chargeable. That is why the free credit that is made available to you. So which I believe is more than enough for one month's practice. So if you're somebody who's new to these platforms, I would suggest that you go through or sign up for Microsoft Azure and you can avail those services. Now since I am from India, we have Indian rupees as our currency. And for our usage, we are given somewhere around 13,300 INR or Indian rupees, which is a very big amount if you talk about using a service for a month's time. So it actually serves my purpose. I have been using it for a long time. That is this particular account. I've had a couple of accounts, but this one is something I created some 15 days back. And as you can see, I still have like 12,400 something something, which I can use. And we would be not needing this much today somewhere maybe 10 20 rupees to the max so yes you can go ahead and create this account once you do have this account then you'd be having access to all the services that microsoft azure has to offer to you you can go ahead and create all the resources you can have or utilize its compute services storage services database services and all the services that it has to provide to you but since we are talking about machine learning we would be sticking to those applications as well so in order to use your azure machine learning you need to create a workspace where you can actually go ahead and put in all your data and once you create your workspace you actually need to go ahead and sign into the microsoft azure ml studio which is an interface or ide where you can actually go ahead and create all those models so in order to go ahead and create a workspace you just need to come here and type machine learning and you might be having that thing in the suggestion. It was already typed, I believe. Machine learning. And you have this place where it says machine learning studio workspace or service workspace. You can click on these. The studio workspace is something I've clicked on. And you need to put in some details, as in what is the name of your workspace? What subscription are you using? Resource group. You can use the one if you already have one. If not, you can create one. Just give in some name. Now, resource group is something that holds in details about your resources that you're using and then what kind of storage account you are using. You can create a storage account as well. It's not a big deal. It is nothing but think of it as a storage place where you can store in your data. That's it. So you do go ahead and put in these details and then you say create. Before that, you have to put in what pricing tier are you using and you'd be entering the region where you want your workspace to reside now what cloud does is it stores your data in particular locations on the globe right so you can choose the location that is closer to you or closer to your business depending upon your needs for now i'm gonna stick to the basic one that is here because we are just creating a simple demo 
in fact i'm not going to go ahead and create a workspace because i already have my own workspace but you i would suggest that you put in these details and create one once this workspace is created you can actually just open it and at the bottom you would be seeing an option called as machine learning studio else what you can do is you can type in this url and you would be redirected to this page where you have to sign in with your microsoft azure portal account and once you do that you would be redirected to the ml studio that i'm talking about so the workspace would be created once the workspace is there you log into your azure ml studio and once you do that this is what you'd be having at your disposal now these are some of the experiments that i might have worked out or worked on in last week or so some of them are finished some are still in drafts so you can actually go ahead and create these workflows or these kind of workflows now you have so many options here what are the projects that you create experiments which we just saw different web services that are made available to you you can actually go ahead and create web services as well you have your notebooks now you might not always go ahead and start from the scratch right you might have your code written in maybe r or some other language like python so you want to import that code you can do that as well or you can use the existing notebooks which microsoft azure has offered to you where you have ready to use codes or ready to use models as well and then we have data sets now again you can import your data sets that you have there was one financial sample data set which i imported recently you can actually go ahead and use sample data sets as well now you can see there are quite a few data sets that are made available here which you can use and implement your own algorithms or implement the algorithms that microsoft azure has to offer to you right so you can do that as well so it pretty much depends upon what do you want to do and what kind of processing do you want to do as you can see if you come here you have some this is somewhere you can see your trained models as well as in the work you've done or some models that you've implemented so you can have that here in this case we are going to go ahead and implement one of the algorithms or algorithms that are implemented by microsoft azure so if i come here to experiments and i go to samples you can see that we have so many implementations so we would be taking a look at one of these and then we would be implementing that on our own do not worry we won't be copying it right away so we have quite a few options here as you can see okay let's just go ahead and do one thing let's build our own model here so for that we need to go to experiments or rather we can come down here and say new and i say add a blank experiment let's just go ahead and try to build a recommender system or something like that so to do that uh, let's call it say my recommender there you go and save it okay there are no modules so you cannot save it so first let's get started now in order to create a recommender for people who do not know what a recommender is it is nothing but you pass in certain data and it might suggest or the model might suggest to you as in what you might like or what you might want to do say for example when you shop on amazon or any other website that is there you normally have some suggestions right i mean you may like this you may like that same as with youtube you go through certain videos and it gives you suggestions as in you preferably might like these videos as well so that is a recommender system so let's go ahead and create one recommender system let's create one for movies so let's just go ahead and practice or play with the data that we have for that we would be needing a data set first right now if you talk about ml studio it is very simple you just drag and drop stuff just like creating workflows it is as simple as that now in order to use a particular data set we have these saved data sets here samples let's make a recommender systems for movie movies movie yep so movies do i have something in movie yeah there you go movie ratings so we would be using this data set now once you put in this data set it is available you can just go ahead and take a look at it so let's just visualize this data and as you can see the information is here it has certain values like user id movie id ratings and timestamp timestamp is something that people do not use frequently but yeah these are things that are important to us we have factors like your id that is your movie id user id and rating it's somewhere around up to 10 so i believe it has started from 0 or 1 maybe so we have ratings from 1 to 10 which we would be using so this is the data that we've just visualized but at times this data is not as simple and as managed it might have some missing values and you might be required to play with it or make some changes to it you can actually go ahead and put in some factors here as well now here you have so many options that are made available to you right so you can actually go ahead and process your data a little manipulate your data a little like you can take a look at statistical analysis and all those things but this being a clean data we do not need to do that so we're just going to stick to the recommender system part here so we have the data set now i need to select the columns that i want to use so i'm going to project certain columns out of it so 
so for that we have a module here called as project columns okay i don't see it here i believe they've changed the name select columns to, okay so this is the one they've changed the name it's called as select columns in data set so we drag it and paste it here and we hold on to the circle that is there on the previous module or the tab we had and we pull it down so we can connect these two now they are connected and but since i've connected them there's an error here it says value required now i need to pass in some values as in what are the columns i need to focus on right so i would be clicking on this icon here or tab which says launch column selector and it gives me options so i'm going to put in certain rules now what are the columns that i want first i would say that get in all columns and just exclude the ones that i don't want so what are the columns that i do not want timestamp was something that won't be very handy so i'm going to remove that so i would be excluding that and i would be seeing okay once you do that the error is gone so we have the data set we've selected the columns now next phase is i need to go ahead and pre-process the data but data is already pre-processed so i don't need to do that either so in this case i would be going ahead and splitting my data into two parts my training data and my testing data training data is something that we would be passing on to the model and we would be training a model based on the data and test data is something that we would be holding back and then we would be using that testing data to test our models or to predict the outcome or to see whether the model is working fine or not so to do that we need to split our data so come here this process is easy just go ahead and type in the words that you need to do and it gives you modules to do that so split data i just pass in the data so i've gone ahead and i've created or i've pulled this split data module or tab into my workflow so yes the data would be split and it would be split in this fraction 0.5 that is we would be using 0.5 percent data to test that is half of the data to test and half of the data to train our models so there you go i won't be tinkering with these factors those are good enough for me so let's just move further now there's an option here where you can zoom in or zoom out your model to fit in the screen so the data is split now next job is to train your data so train your recommender system uh, do we have option to yeah train matchbox recommender so we select this and pull it here now what we do is we pass in one of these branches here first one and the split data is passed on to this training module or tab now i'm not too good with the nomenclature that is why this confusion let's call it tab so yes so i've pulled in this data into the tab so this is something that would get trained here and i need to score it as well so once i come here i select this first and it shows me the details as in okay how many traits uh, of the data that I have that I want to use to build this recommender system. Let's just say 10. Okay, 10 is fine. I don't see too many problems with it. Maybe let's do it 20. Number of recommendations I want. Okay, no, this can also stay to 5. No problem. Training batches 4 is fine. So we just move further and next what we do is we just go ahead and score the data that we have. So I say score and I pick in this thing. So again, to this I would be passing in my training data here. And I would also be passing in my split data. That is the testing data. There you go. So the data that has been trained that would come here and also the testing data would be here. So I have this score where I need to give in the details as in what are the predictions that I'm looking for. Now I basically want prediction where I would be wanting related items, right? If I watch this movie, what kind of movie I need to watch, right? So this is what I would be entering here. So once I enter related items, it says what are the maximum number of related items to find from an item that you have? Let's say I want just one item. There you go. And so it would give me one related item to the movie. So if I pass in a particular movie to this recommender, it should suggest one movie that I might like watching. So that is what I'm talking about here. So one related movie, you can have more than one as well. So that is up to you. So we've done this now next is I build a model or I've actually gone ahead and put in a tab for training and scoring next. I need to evaluate this data, right? So I say evaluate or test rather. So it says evaluate your recommender you get in here and this time you take in this value that is your score and you put it here in this column. We passed in one of these threads here next is we take in the split data and we enter it here there you go this is fine i would be saving it here just to be safe once you save this data okay guys so the connections that we pass in these are important in which port are you passing in what value so this might hold and this is more or less an experimental kind of a stuff where you might actually go ahead and put in some wrong connections and you might get in some errors so you actually need to go ahead and troubleshoot some of those at times not always 
so we've actually gone ahead and we've almost built a model now we need one more table here or one more data set that is movie imdb titles let's place it here okay it has gone somewhere yeah so i place it here there you go and whenever we have a new data set we always visualize it to understand what it has okay this should not take this long but for some reason it is so i have this data set where i have movie id and movie name so i would be using this data set for my recommender where it has some imdb titles which is not the actual imdb that website which we have it is a sample data set that is created so we have this data set here now that we've seen the data i'm gonna go ahead and use a command called as edit metadata and i'm gonna place it here and as usual i'm gonna go ahead and put this thing in here now if i come here as you can see there's this column here which says select certain columns which you want to use so what are the columns that i want to pass to my metadata basically or what is the metadata that i want to use so i'm going to go ahead and click on launch column selector and in this case with rules i would start with no columns and i would say include so what are the columns i need first is i need item so you have to hit the enter button you won't be given a suggestion here okay for some reason it is not taking in this value let me see what is wrong Okay, we need to pass in first values to this so-called metadata before that we won't be able to deal with items because we just took a look at this data set and it does not have item value that is why we are not able to pass in that value so let's pass in other values to it the values that are more relevant to this data set so we would be coming here and we would be selecting some other values now you can see that we have these values that are available so let's just go ahead and select those there you go and i say okay so the error is gone now now we have a metadata which is made available to us and i have a model which is up and running here now i need to put in joins here now if you all know what joins do is they basically help you select data from one table to the other so we have two tables here or two data sets so i want to combine the data that these two tables have now i won't be getting into the details of joins and all those things but we would be using them here for the general reference sake so i have these two data sets here and i want to predict or compare the table with the table that is here so what i'm going to do is i'm going to build a model or create a join that lets me compare the movie names from one data set with the other or give me recommendations from one of the two data sets right so for that i would be needing a join here so let's just come here and say join okay before we get into this thing there is one more important point my edit metadata data type it has to be string there you go now i need to pass in values to this tab as well so for that i would be needing a score from here so i would be taking this and i would be placing it here there you go and one from the metadata to this joint now what are the values that i want to pass in here now it should be item i believe so as i've said hit the enter button there you go and you say okay and columns from r or the other table what do you want from here i would be saying maybe movie id there you go i say okay what kind of join do i want i want left out a join now again i won't be getting into the details of these joins don't keep the right key columns because that is the reason i'm using this join there you go i would be needing one more join here and i would be pulling it here because the first join would just give me the movie id but i just don't want the id i want the movie name as well right so i'd come here i'd pull in this thing and i would pass it to this data set and edit metadata there you go again if i come here it would ask me for values i would say give me related items if you have any and here i want the movie name we would say save if you missed out on one thing we need to come here first and remove this left auto join and now save we are bound to have some errors guys so stay tuned now this thing runs it would run it tab by tab or module by module and then everything would be executed so this might take a couple of minutes once the module or the tab is executed it shows a green tick on it as you can see here we have ticks here and here this might take a longer because we have increased the number of iterations to 20 in the slide or in the tab when we were working on it so the whole processing might take a little longer than normal 
Okay, it says related item not found. Let's see why is that happening? Launch recommender selector. Yeah, this is the one that is the related item one. Probably there is no related item variable in the data set that we generated. Now, as I've told you in the first model, I'll show you where. First, let me select this for now and let me say, okay. Here in the score match box, I had passed in number of related items, right? It was one. So by default, it was given a name called as related items one. So that is something which we are passing in here or something that we would be displaying. So there you go. So what we've done is we've actually gone ahead and put in all the stuff that we wanted to. Let's just see whether it runs and once it runs, I would be explaining this again to you people. So do not worry. First, let's run it. Now this time around it should happen quicker because most of the stuff is done. We just have the error in the last tab or the last module. So the other parts should be done quicker as you can see and now the last one would be implemented and it is done already. So guys our model is up and running. Let's just go ahead and check. So when I click on this icon and I say visualize it should give me some values. See how relevant values these are. Let's just verify it now this being a model. It might not be that accurate, but let's hope it gives some values. It is not giving me the movie name and movie ID for the other section or the related item. Let's see why is that the case, but it says if you have seen this movie, you might like this movie, but we do not have that movie. So let us see where we have gone wrong first. So there is some error here or here. We have a movie ID here, so let's just come here and see. Okay, so we can just match ID to ID or map ID to ID. So let's remove this for now and say movie ID and then see whether we get the output. So I say save not save as I would say save and I would run this. So again, it should run quicker than the last time. There you go. Now let's just see what is the output that we get. So I say visualize. And there you go guys. It's as simple as this. I mean we put in or pulled in some values and we've edited certain values and we have the result here. Now this is an Indian movie called as Talash and it says that if you like this you might like this Oblivion probably Jack Reacher. I haven't seen either of this Iron Man. You might like stand by me. So I don't think this recommender is that accurate, but probably I'm sure that there would be some movies in it which are more relatable. So and for people who are big movie fans, they probably would be able to relate a lot more to the movies that I hear. So Again, you can actually go ahead and select the number of related items that you want to select and you might actually go ahead and tinker and tailor your algorithm a little more for that. You have to play with the values that are there you have in this algorithm. You can just come here and switch in these details and probably the answer might vary depending upon the inputs that you pass to this algorithm. So this was my basic aim. I wanted you to get some hands on on Azure Machine Learning Studio and nothing more than that. But as far as this model goes or this particular session goes, we've actually gone ahead and taken in two data sets. We've actually gone ahead and built a model trained it tested it and then we've used a joint to actually go ahead and see what would be the possible movie that you might want to watch if you liked one of those movies. So again as I've already mentioned it might not be that accurate. You are free to go ahead and play a little more with it. You can pass in your own data sets as well. Now what is exactly a chatbot is a chatbot as you know is a complete conversational we can say toolkit, right? Which is basically written in natural language. Like we have the concept of NLP, natural language processing. Now, the main purpose of this one is again where it simply understands the intent of the user. That means the context, right? Because again, if we talk about NLP, natural language processing, it simply revolves around the idea of different context because the same thing can be can be said in different manner. The same thing can be said in different manner when we are talking about the context here, right? So different users they can they can simply say things in different contexts, and that is exactly what we have to focus on here, correct? Because then we have because again just like we have Alexa, we have uh, we have Google Assistant, we have Siri. Now for performing the same task, we can uh, we can order these assistants in different manner, right? And again, it doesn't matter in which context we say them. We say we we give them the order. They will perform the activities, right? Because again, they are able to judge on the context, right? They are able to evaluate in which context that particular thing has been said and how they have to process it, and that is what a complete concept for natural language processing is, right? And basically, it is simply used for 
for understanding the intent of the user and sending a response back on based on the business rules of the organization that's the main concept of chatbots running on nlp natural language processing here all right and for the, now the first chatbot the first chatbot called as eliza was built in 1966 to mimic the human conversation altogether that was when the well, the first chatbot eliza was built right and in terms of chatbot applications here we have, uh, they are extensively used in online shopping in booking tickets in news reports in ordering foods right so there are multiple use cases available for chatbot application that we can think of right and again basically in terms of types of chatbots we basically we have command bots and then we have learning bots so command bots works on the concepts of predefined text that has been defined inside these inside these chatbots again and based on those predefined responders they can respond accordingly or here we have learning bots so based on the users how they are interacting they can learn their pattern they can learn their language and then only they can get started right depending upon the context in which they have been said here you can simply start understanding the users languages in which in which context they are saying things and then only they can get started all right and and amazon lex here is basically a service for building conversational interfaces into applications using voice and text based support right so basically now here it simply uses nlp natural language processing along with the asr call us automatic speech recognition so these are all diff two different components that we have we have these amazon lex based on nlp as a natural language processing and then we have asr call us automatic speech recognition as a part of asr itself right so basically this is used for building the conversation interfaces into any application using voice and text based results altogether that exactly we have lex for Right, we have Amazon. Lex all together as a part of the entire discussion here. Now, the main purpose of of Lex, as we have discussed, is it is basically used for building the chatbots for handling the customer support, or we can say customer contacts. Bank. Now, for example, if we are implementing this on top of any banks, right? So, we, so in here, customers can contact the banks for a for the account balance, right? They can simply send the message, or they can simply use the 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 chat based system that the bank has been or that bank has opted in for bank customers they have opted in for right and then they, now we can use lex we can use aws lex as a part of amazon web services right and then we can allow lex to understand the context of the user based on the request the, what they have generated right mm -hmm. and after this request here now after this request here we have amazon poly right so again here and here we can what they can do is they can simply respond to user in speech right uh, poly is again a service offered by amazon where we can deliver the results as a part of speech as well we can deliver the results as a part of speech as well right so again they can simply revert back okay savings account or checking account balance again they can simply revert using the amazon poly service as well right and for sending the, the notification we can simply use lambda service now lambda is a serverless computing services offered by aws so basically we do have the force for launching the the full fledged server we have ec2 right the concept for which we have discussed so far and aws lambda is basically a serverless a serverless computing platform offered by aws right that we can use to get to get started right so using so using lambda so using lambda here we can simply connect our application with dynamo db now dynamo db is also something that we will be discussing in detail as we move further so it's basically dynamo db is a no sql database dynamo db is a no sql database then we have amazon sns sns is simple notification service used for delivering the notifications that has been generated by any service and then we have amazon ses ses is simple email service. that means if we want the emails to be to be sent right we want the emails to be sent here then we can simply use ses for that right and at last we have all the other services that we can use suppose if we have data also stored as a part of rds we have data also stored as a part of rds with, with any engine right then we can connect it lambda using your two these two or you can say these multiple engines as well as a part of 
as a part of AWS Lambda services integration. And once they have got the data, then again, they can send the data back to Lex, right? And again, these now, whatever is happening here, the logs for these will be stored and events are also kept a track of. Now, this is also done using a service called as CloudTrail. Now, CloudTrail is also a service offered by AWS through which it simply maintains the logs for different kind of activities happening in the entire system altogether, right? So that any kind of activity happening here, this can be reported. This can be uh, this can be reported back, and we can say, well, here as a part of as a part of AWS, right? And once the entire processing has been done here, now the customer is provided with the accurate, or we can say, account balance, either through voice or either through text-based system. And as a part of our hands-on here, we'll be focusing on how we can create one chatbot as well using AWS Lex. And in here we can now here we can use it to build powerful interfaces to use it to use to be used with both mobile applications, right? Like we have the customer, like we have OYO Health, right? So basically, it is also used for building high interactive and conversational user experiences for for IoT itself, because again, it is highly useful for IoT platform as well. IoT as, as in Internet of Things, where different devices are connected to a single network altogether as a part of IoT platforms. And this is being used by NASA, right? Again, these are basically used for building the enterprise chat, uh, the chat boards to check sales data, marketing performances, and much more, right? So again, there are multiple use cases that we can have that we can observe on top of these automated chat boards, right? And this will be really useful when we are deploying the applications for our own company as well, right? When we are building applications for our own company, and then we can simply deploy these as a part of our as a part of our entire integration as well. Now, again, even though when we are, even though we, if we are not the actual de actual developer, still we can have the entire team. Still we can have the entire team delivered for us, right? As a part of use case for Lex, as a part of use case for Lex here. And basically, the main benefits of using Amazon Lex is it offers an easy to use console, and we have predefined bots. So here, even though when we don't have that much of technical expertise here. We can simply define the logic and then we can get the entire chatbot up and running by using the predefined services offered by AWS, by offered by AWS here. Right? And again, it simply employs advanced deep learning functionalities that we can offer here. Correct? And again, it simply provides us complete seamless deployment and scaling. And again, there are multiple integration with built in with AWS platform and offering a cost effective platform here. So basically, in order to understand the Lex here, first of all, chatbot receives the user input, and then it can simply process, it can simply reply with the answers and perform the actions, or we can also ask for other inputs as well, right? If the uh, if the entire output has, if the entire input has been received here, right? If the entire input has been received by chatbots, then you can simply process it first, right? And using the Lambda, using the Lambda services here, it can simply connect now chatbot will simply trigger AWS Lambda service and Lambda function, whatever we have defined here, it will simply be integrated by some other with some other services that like we have DynamoDB, SNS, SES, and for any other services as per the requirement or as per the structure that have we have defined for chatbots, right? And then here we can and then in order to get it started, first of all, here we can create a, create a chatbot, then we can test the board on a window side. Then we can simply publish a version and create an alias, and then we can deploy it on top of a suitable platform here, right? And before we get started on seeing the hands-on on top of of Amazon Lex here, we have first of all we have certain terminologies that we have to be acquainted with. First of all, we have Amazon Bot, so it's simply an artificial program that is useful for simulating an interactive conversation, right? Then we have intent. Now intent simply represents an action that users want to perform. For example, we want to we want the user to send an image. We want the chatbot to send an image, right? Or we want the chatbot to send the users to a link all together. So these are what these are the intent, right? That means the action that the user wants to perform. Correct. And then we have the attributes as name, upper other cases, and then we have intent fulfill. Right? We'll be discussing these parts step by step. As we continue further, and then we have slots. So slots are simple parameters 
that an intent might require right suppose this is again we have intent right we want the we want the user to suppose open up a, spe a specific web page right again and there are multiple parameters that means which page it has to report it at which page which time slot here what are different other parameters that needs to be specified here as a part of intent right then we have slot type so again each and each and each and every slot has a type and again here we can use built-in or we can also define our own custom slot type as altogether right once the intent has been completed again it will simply build a function to fulfill the intent and it will simply be deployed on top of client application as well so here there are two ways that through which we can fulfill our intent we can use our inbuilt lambda function or in case it has been some other functions defined by the companies itself or the client for which we are building it they can use those and then we can define the lambda function as a part of a code hook as a part of a code hook here right where the customer where the customize where the, the users can customize the entire we can customize the entire user interaction or we can have we can simply initiate and validate the user input suppose if they have entered a wrong input then that cannot trigger the entire ai system as well correct and that's why we have to make sure we are validating the entire input of the users as well and then at last we have to simply execute the entire input altogether right all right so now let's get right back to our console so that we can log into our console and then we can have a quick access on top of flex services okay here we have to enter the mfa code let's fetch our mfa code as well just a moment So here we can enter the MFA code 879104. Okay, it hasn't changed. 169996. So once we log in into our console here, we would be able to see here we would be able to see the same. Portal for which we have signed up. Now, once we are not as as always, guys. So again, here we simply have to look for the service that we are focusing on, right? Like we have been looking for S3 for EC2 for IM services. The same way here. First of all, here we have to search for a service called as Lex, right? So here we can simply so use the search bar. We can simply go and use the search bar here, and here we can simply search for a service called as Lex. Now here we'll be finding. Uh, now here we'll be finding Lex. Here, here we have Lake Business. So here we have to open up Lex. Let's open this up. Now currently by default we are into Mumbai. So now remember, now remember guys, Lex is not available for every region here. So currently we are in Mumbai. So now let's do one thing. Let's simply switch to North Virginia as we had discussed. Not every service is available in every region here, right? So here we can switch to our service for North Virginia. Now, once we are into Amazon Lex here, we can simply click on get started. First of all, we have to look for the service call as Lex and then here we can simply click on get started here, right? Now in here we can choose. Now in here we can choose, we can create our own custom bot or we can choose any of these predefined samples here so just like we have now we will be looking at samples for almost every service that we will be discussing here for example we have other services like we have beanstalk we have cloud formation right where we get multiple predefined samples suppose we are just simply a beginner right and we want to see how exactly the chatbots work and we want to see a simple or we can say simple base here right then we can simply choose these samples as well for example, here we want to to try our hands on for booking trip, right? For order flowers, for schedule appointment, right? For example, here we're looking for book trip, so we can choose book trip. We want to look for order flowers, right? We can see a sample for order flowers. We can look for schedule schedule appointment as well, right? So based on our now, as we as you can see, as soon as we are making changes here, the responses and the questions are also being changed here, as you can as you can observe. 
so if we go to, to order flowers again if we go for booking trip here if we go for for booking trip you can see first of all here we have i would like to book a hotel sure which city new york city then what date do you want to check in and then we are simply checking for it right so basically first of all it starts it simply starts with the intent that means that the user means intent is to book a trip to book a hotel altogether right that's the main intent of the users correct then they have started with the other cases now then we have started with the other cases that means spoken or type phrases right that invokes our event now currently our main intent is to book hotel right and for booking the hotel as a user we have received okay i would like to book a hotel right and then we have slots now that means again based on the based on the parameters here then we have asked which city and then they are giving us slots slots as in the required data pointers to fulfill the intent correct that is a part of city at all together right and then we have prompts and then we have prompts here so prompts will simply ask question how the user how the user or okay, say any additional data that needs to be that needs to be defined and then once they have defined this then they have to end the assembly fulfilling it as well right and then it will simply process it okay are you sure you want to book a seat or book the hotel in your city once the user confirms then the entire confirmation will be done here right same way for ordering flowers as well same way for schedule appointment right so in here we can simply create our own chat boards using these systems right and in here we can simply click on custom board to get started we can simply click on custom board and in here we can define the bot name in here we can define the bot name here exactly what exactly we are trying to create here we can define the entire bot name now under bot name we can simply let's suppose let's say we here we are trying to create any bot right in here we are trying to create any bot here mm, okay so for what purpose shall we create this bot here so we can go for movie booking as well because movie booking sounds good so let's book a movie because again we don't want to make anyone hungry by ordering food right let's go for movie booking here now in here we can define the bot name suppose say we want to call this as book movie here we can call this bot as book movie altogether so let's say we make it as book movie and then we can define the language then here we have we have to choose the output voice itself right now these are the output voice as in now in case you have been using in case you have been using the we can say uh, the different voice based system like we have alexa we have siri right so in here we can define in here we can define the voice as well right hello my name is sally as you can see suppose if we go for sally here right so basically it will simply showcase you a sample of the voice in which we, we want the chatbots to respond here for example Let's say we want to hear some other voice. For example, suppose for Matthew. Hello, my name is Matthew. Right. So depending upon our context here, we have different use cases. Hello, my name is Kendra. Sounds interesting. So that's it. So just like we have our own voices here, we can simply go for the current voices here. Now, for example, let's say let's hear for Ivy as well. Hello, my name is Ivy. Okay, this sounds like a school girl. So now here, let's say we stick with Salad. Hello, my name is Sally. And here we can simply define the text that we want to do we uh, to hear. Right? For example, suppose we how or suppose uh, which movie do you want to book or suppose which movie as simple as which movie right let's suppose we simply type which movie itself so this will simply talk this loud aloud which movie which movie as you can see now we have the entire sentence being repeated in our own voice or in that in that particular voice altogether 
Uh, yes, Sajid, we can have our own. Now we don't. We can have our own voice, but again, we can choose a voice that we want to use as an output voice here. We can choose the output voice here, right? Now, once we define that part here, then we have session timeout, right? So here we can define this as a session timeout. For example, that means after a given time period, it should be how much time it should be opted out for. Because again, now as you can see, now Siri has an Indian version, right? Siri do have an Indian version. So currently it is being developed as a part of the entire development for every possible assistant because they have already known that this is going to be a big market and that's why they are customizing this. All right. Now, once we define this part here, now next is we can simply find the IM role. We can keep it to by default. We can choose the default IM role for this entire service. Now here, depending upon a rule here, we can simply make it yes, or we can simply define the no as well, right? Suppose here we don't want to, now here, we are, we are not following the entire COP API rule, which is mostly applicable for Europe. Or if we are, again, we can simply keep it to yes, and then we can simply have to define the rule altogether, right? So in here, we define the timeout as opposed to two minutes. We define, we define the session time timeout to be two minutes as a part of standing timeout. And then we have create. Once we are defined here, we can click on create. And this may take a second. Okay, let's refresh. Now, once we have, now once we define the intent here, now once we have the bot created, then we have to define then we have to start by defining the user in, uh, we can say user intent altogether right so here we have to click on this option which says create intent now once you click on create intent here here we have to simply define okay if you already have the intent created from the past then we can simply work on importing the intent or we can simply click on create intent here we can click on create intent and then we can define the intent for example let's say here our main intent is to book movie ticket here our main intent is to book movie ticket we can define book movie ticket right that is our main intent book movie ticket and once we add this here now here we have to define the utterances that means now for example suppose the first attempt here that means the first component that will be that the user will be typing here as a part of utterance here, right? The first thing that, that user will be typing in. So here we can simply define, suppose say here, we get ask the user, suppose as I would like to, I would like to book a movie ticket. We can define, I would like to book a movie ticket, right? Now in here we have to define multiple slots as well. In here we can define multiple slots as well, right? Now slots are basically we can see the variables. Now these are the variables for the Lex itself, right? Suppose let's say when we are now in case suppose let's say we are when we are ordering pizza, right? The slot will be like for example size. Or again, or for example in here we have to define that means the options, right? So slots are simply like option itself. Slots are simply like options, right? So here what we can do is we can simply add the slot itself, right? So here we can define the name as well. For example, here we can define the name. Suppose what can be the what can be the slots or we can say for movies itself, what can be the option for movies? So for example, suppose if we are talking about hotel, by hotel booking, right? Then slots can be location. That means in which location we are we are trying to book a, book a hotel, right? Same way for movies, what kind of slots can be there? So first of all, it can be location, right? Then we have to choose a slot type as well, right? That means this is what now, this is just like we have data type, just like we have data type itself, right? For example, here we have multiple things defined here, right? For example, here we have region, book, we have book series, we have civil, colors, country, course, right? So there are multiple slot type that we can define here. There are multiple slot type that we can define here, right? So for example, here, as we define location, suppose we are asking the users as location itself, right? Then we can choose from different 
slot type here. Right? For example, here we are defined simply go now. Here we want to go for location itself, right? Or suppose I say here we simply want the user to type in their city name. Now, since this is basically focused only on for US itself, so here we can search for city. Suppose I say here we are going for US city itself. Right? And then we have to define the message. Suppose here we choose the US city here. Then we have to define the message as well. That means in which city or suppose what city or which city we are looking for. Right? So here we can define what city as a location. Right? And then suppose if you want to keep on adding more prompts here as a part of more slots here, we can simply click on add and then we can add ask for more options here. For example, next is we can also ask for timing as well, right? Timing or we can say we can ask for show time for show time, right? And then we can define the again. We can choose between the slot itself. We can choose from the slot itself, right? Suppose here that we want the user to enter time itself right so what we have done we have, we have chosen show time and now we are asking the users to the slot, the slot type is basically focused on time altogether right we can choose time and then here we can ask the user as show time as a part of preference here as a part of preference here right so here we can simply define as show time and then we can simply define these step by step now, in here, once we have defined the slots here, then we have the confirmation prompt as well, right? So here and here, we can simply configure the confirmation prompt as well. Suppose once the user have entered anything, they'll be prompted with the confirmation as well. Next is again, we can define now in terms of fulfillment here, we can simply return the parameters to the client itself. Now, next is in terms of any kind of responses here, right? Again, if we want to, if we want to add a specific and customized message here as a part of response. We can simply define these, right? Now let's keep this by default. We don't want to change this, right? So here we can keep this by default here. Uh, no, see, drama. We haven't defined anything under confirmation prompt, right? But again, we if we want, we can define a confirmation prompt as well. For example, suppose if we want to define a confirmation prompt, right? So okay, suppose are you sure you want to order a drink? For example, let's say if the user has selected, suppose are you sure? You want to book a table, right? Here we can define the name itself, right? Suppose here we have, are you sure you want to book? Now in here we have to define the parameters. Now in here we have to define the parameters itself. For example, if we type in as, are you sure you want to? You want to book? Now currently we have to define, now this should be replaced with the movie name, right? Suppose let's say here we have the here we they have here they are asking for show time for location now. Okay, we haven't asked for movie, right? Or suppose any kind of movie name itself. So again, if you want, we can add another slot as well. If you want to ask the users for movies as well, right? For which movie they are they're trying to book here. Suppose if this is what movie itself. So here we can name this as movie. And in here now, whether we want this to be treated like a name itself, or suppose we already have a option available for movie in this in this slot type like we have movie we can search for movie right here we can choose a movie here as a, as a part of slot just a moment right and again here we can choose okay which movie or suppose which movie or what city show time okay we can here we can go for what movie itself right or we can say for which movie here we can define the prompt as well right uh, here we can choose okay how exactly we want it to be added here for example we want to keep on adding multiple prompts here we can simply go on and on one by one we can define that and then and in here we can define the order as well right we define the movie then we have chosen the movie name here we can go for which movie like we had defined as a question right and in here we can define the orders as well as suppose we want first of all to we want the, the bot to ask for location and then we want the bot to ask for movie and then we want the bot to ask for show time because that should be the order correct because we want to ask for the location the movie and and the show time suppose we, we do we no longer want the show time to be mandatory here right we can simply market these two for being the most important components here location and movie altogether right 
we can define those and then we have the confirmation prompt here we can choose okay are you want to are you sure you want to book now suppose we had defined the name as movie right then in here in parameters now remember this is, has to be made as a part of double code as a part of uh, parenthesis itself right so here we did here we had to define movie right i suppose if the user does not define as confirm suppose if the user does not define as confirm then again if the user simply says no then again here we can simply uh, make sure okay okay your your movie is your movie tickets are or not your your movie tickets are not booked are not booked we can simply showcase them a um, complete message like this one right okay your movie tickets are not booked right so in here we can now uh, here we can have a complete control of how exactly we want to create the bots here right this is how we can customize the entire bot as well here we can customize the entire bots exactly as per our requirement right now next is we can define the response as well now by default we can simply return the parameters to a client itself or, or we can simply send it to a lambda function right now currently as we have not discussed on lambda function yet here we can simply keep it to return to parameters to client for now then we'll be coming back to the lambda function in a while all right now in terms of response we can keep it to blank as of now because again here we can keep this option blank altogether we don't want this one right now in here we can simply click on save intent once we are done we can simply click on save intent now once we are done here now what we can do is now to see this in live action here we can simply click on build okay i think we missed on on the hook url i think this will generate a simple error as we have missed the hook url Now, depending upon the upon the parameters here guys so again here we can simply it will it may take some time for this one to be executed here all right so now once we have the bot created here now once the now, once the bot has been successfully created here now here in the in the right section of the screen here we can see a sample test bot right absolutely now here we can simply go ahead and test it as well right so for example here we simply test okay i want to or suppose here we can simply define as i would like to book movie ticket as you can see now even though we suppose to say we simply type book movie ticket now we have defined i would like to book movie ticket As you can see, can you all see this? We have the watch city here, right? So now in here we can simply define. Suppose we want to define this as suppose in we want to book this up in New York. We want to book a ticket in New York altogether, right? Then it will automatically ask which movie. Suppose if we name the movie as any name here, for example, like Shawshank Redemption. Again, then it is asking us for show time. For example, let's say for 8 p.m. Right? And again, since we have defined for the confirmation as well, this will ask, okay, are you sure you want to book for Shawshank? As you can, as you can see, can you, can you all see this? All three slots have been filled here, correct? So we had defined location, we had defined show time, and then we had defined movie name itself, right? So all these slot details has been completely booked. And as you can see, all of, all of these three details has been booked here, right? So suppose if we simply revert this with yes, as you can see now intent movie ticket is ready for fulfillment that means now we can simply define the fulfillment right so currently we have defined okay we want this to be returned to the user itself right and suppose we want to run a lambda function that means we want the actual booking to be done right then we do have to integrate this as a part of lambda function as well so i hope you all are enjoying this you all did enjoy this entire discussion on machine learning using like how we can create this using the chatbot guys
And now as a continuation here, suppose let's say we want to create a lambda function. We want to create a simple lambda function here, right? So lambda, as you know, is simply a serverless computing platform. Lambda is what? A serverless computing platform, right? And now if we want to indicate lambda here, what we can do is first of all, we do have to go ahead and create a lambda service, right? We do have to go ahead and create a lambda service. Now for doing that, we can simply search for a service called as lambda. Now we haven't discussed this part yet and we will be discussing this part going forward step by step. For example, in here, if you want to process it by Lambda function, we can process it. In case we want to store the data into Amazon Aurora database or suppose DynamoDB, right? Depending upon where we want the data, the, the, the suppose if we have already have a list of show times with us, right? How we can refer to those show timings, how we can store data. So that means suppose whatever is being entered by the user, how we can store it as well, right? We can all do this exactly as per our requirement, right? We can do this all exactly as per a requirement here. So now in here, what we can do is first of all, in order to add a Lambda function, we have to create a Lambda function as well. We have to create one Lambda function as well, right? And for doing that, what we have to do is we simply can search for service call as Lambda in services. We can simply open up Lambda service. Here we can open up Lambda. Now, when we open up Lambda here, we simply have to create one service. We have to create one function here, right? Now in here, what we can do is now in here, if you don't want now, if for the first time be for being the for the first time user here now lambda as you know is a serverless computing platform right so basically the main purpose of lambda now we will discuss lambda going forward as well but again to have a quick understanding of what exactly lambda is first of all let's go back to a picasso board to have a quick understanding here right now to understand Lambda in a much better way here. So basically when we are launching any application like we discussed on the concept of EC2 as well, right? When we are launching any particular application altogether, we have to deploy, we have to create one server. We have to create one server on top of, on top of EC2, right? As a Elastic Cloud Compute server itself, right? Now if we now, we can use this server for, a, we can use this EC2 server, right? As we have been discussing so far, if we want to deploy any application on our or for our website, suppose we are deploying a website, right? Then we can deploy the website on top of EC2, right? And again, now suppose if we want now, suppose we want to test the application altogether. For example, if we only want to test the application, we don't want to deploy a full-scale application. We don't we don't want to deploy a full-scale server. Then what we can do? We can simply use a service called as Lambda, right? So that suppose if you want to simply execute and test our code here, right? That means we are looking only looking for testing the code. Then we can use this Lambda function to simply uh, now using this Lambda service. We can upload a code to Lambda and suppose the code took 3.2 second seconds, suppose 3.6 seconds in order to in order to, to, to be executed complete, right? That means here we have to pay only for these 3.6 seconds. Nothing less, nothing more because as we have discussed in EC2, we there's a pricing for an hourly basis. That means we have to pay for every hour, correct? But here in Lambda service, the pricing is for every hundred milliseconds. The pricing here is for every hundred milliseconds here, right? That means here we have to pay only for the exact duration of time for which the code has been executed, right? And that's I suppose if we have any kind of event trigger system, for example, we have any kind of notification systems where we need to use the processing power only when there is a change or only when there is a trigger in the event correct then we can use the services for lambda so let's have a look at the top 10 skills which are required to become a successful machine learning engineer so starting with programming languages python is the lingua franca of machine learning you may have had exposure to Python even if you weren't previously in programming or in a computer science related field. However, it is important to have a solid understanding of classes and data structures. Sometimes Python won't be enough. Often, you'll encounter projects that need to leverage hardware for speed improvements. Now make sure you're familiar with the basic algorithms as well as the classes, memory management, and linking. Now if you want a job in machine learning, you will probably have to learn all of these languages at some point. 
C++ can help in speeding code up, whereas R works great in statistics and plots. And Hadoop is Java based, so you probably need to implement mappers and reducers in Java. Now next we have linear algebra. You'll need to be intimately familiar with matrices, vectors, and matrix multiplication. If you have an understanding of derivatives and integrals, you should be in the clear. Otherwise, even simple concepts like gradient descents will elude you. Statistic is going to come up a lot. At least make sure you are familiar with the Gaussian distributions, means, standard deviation, and much more. Every bit of statistical understanding beyond this helps. Now, theory is help in learning about algorithms. Great samples are naive bias, Gaussian mixture models, and hidden Markov models. You need to have a firm understanding of probability and stats to understand these models. Just go nuts and study measure theory. And next we have advanced signal processing techniques. Now feature extraction is one of the most important parts of machine learning. Different types of problems need various solutions. You may be able to utilize really cool advanced signal processing algorithms such as wavelets, shearlets, curvelets, and bandlets. You need to learn about the time frequency analysis and try to apply it in your problems. Now this skill will give you an edge over all the other skills. Now this skill will give you an edge while you are applying for a machine learning engineer job over others. Now next we have applied maths. A lot of machine learning techniques out there are just fancy types of functional approximation. Now these often get developed by theoretical mathematicians and then get applied by people who do not understand the theory at all. Now the result is that many developers might have a hard time finding the best techniques for the problem. So even a basic understanding of numerical analysis will give you a huge edge. Having a firm understanding of algorithm theory and knowing how the algorithm works, you can also discriminate models such as SVMs. Now you will need to understand subjects such as gradient descent, convex optimization, lag range, quadratic programming, partial differentiation equations, and much more. Now all this math might seem intimidating at first if you have been away from it for a while. Yes, machine learning is much more math intensive than something like front-end development. Just like any other skill, getting better at math is a matter of focus practice. The next skill in our list is the neural network architectures. We need machine learning for tasks that are too complex for humans to code directly. That is, tasks that are so complex that it is impractical. Now, neural networks are a class of models within the general machine learning literature. Now, neural networks are a specific set of algorithms that have revolutionized machine learning. They are inspired by biological neural networks and the current so-called deep neural networks have proven to work quite well. The neural networks are themselves general function approximations, which is why they can be applied to almost any machine learning problem about learning a complex mapping from the input to the output space. Of course, there are still good reasons for the surge in the popularity of neural networks, but neural networks have been by far the most accurate way of approaching many problems like translation, speech recognition, and image classification. Now coming to our next point, which is the natural language processing. Now since it combines computer science and linguistics, there are a bunch of libraries like the NLTK, Jansism, and the techniques such as sentimental analysis and summarization that are unique to NLP. Now audio and video processing has a frequent overlap with the natural language processing. However, natural language processing can be applied to non-audio data like text, Voice and audio analysis involves extracting useful information from the audio signals themselves. Being well versed in math will get you far in this one. And you should also be familiar with the concepts such as the fast Fourier transforms. Now these were the technical skills that are required to become a successful machine learning engineer. So next I'm going to discuss some of the non-technical skills or the soft skills which are required to become a machine learning engineer. So first of all we have the industry knowledge. Now, the most successful machine learning projects out there are going to be those that address real pain points. Whichever industry you are working for, you should know how that industry works and what will be beneficial for the business. If a machine learning engineer does not have business acumen and the know-how of the elements that make up a successful business model or any particular algorithm, then all those technical skills cannot be channeled productively. You won't be able to discern the problems and potential challenges that need solving for the business to sustain and grow. You won't really be able to help your organization explore new business opportunities. So this is a must have skill. Now next we have effective communication. You'll need to explain the machine learning concepts to the people with little to no expertise in the field. 
chances are you will need to work with a team of engineers as well as many other teams so communication is going to make all of this much more easier companies searching for a strong machine learning engineer are looking for someone who can clearly and fluently translate their technical findings to a non-technical team such as marketing or sales department now next on our list we have rapid prototyping so iterating on ideas as quickly as possible is mandatory for finding one that works in machine learning this applies to everything from picking up the right model to working on projects such as a b testing you need to do a group of techniques used to quickly fabricate a scale model of a physical part or assembly using the three-dimensional computer aided design which is the cad so last but not the least we have the final skill and that is to keep updated you must stay up to date with any upcoming changes every month new neural network models come out that outperform the previous architecture it also means being aware of the news regarding the development of the tools the change log the conferences and much more you need to know about the theories and algorithms now this you can achieve by reading the research papers blogs the conferences videos and also you need to focus on the online community which changes very quickly so expect and cultivate this change now this is not the end here we have certain skills the bonus skills which will give you an edge over other competitors or the other persons who are applying for a machine learning engineer position on the bonus point we have physics now you might be in a situation where you would like to apply machine learning techniques to a system that will interact with the real world having some knowledge of physics will take you far now next we have reinforcement learning so this reinforcement learning has been a driver behind many of the most exciting developments in the deep learning and the AI community from the alpha go zero to the open AI's Dota 2 bot. This will be a critical to understand if you want to go into robotics, self-driving cars or other AI related areas. And finally, we have computer vision out of all the disciplines out there. There are by far the most resources available for learning computer vision. This field appears to have the lowest barriers to entry, but of course this likely means you'll face slightly more competition. So having a good knowledge of computer vision, how it works will give you an edge over other competitors. The first tool which I'm going to talk about is scikit-learn. It's not exactly a tool. It's a library, but it's the initial steps which one should follow. So scikit-learn is a free software machine learning library for the Python programming language. It is a simple and efficient tool for data mining and data analysis. It is built on NumPy, SciPy and Matplotlib. It provides a range of supervised, unsupervised machine learning algorithms in Python like classification, regression, clustering, dimensionality reduction and much more. So this is one of the basic steps or the basic building block of any machine learning project or application out there so you need to know scikit-learn this is one of the most important tool next i'm going to talk about is knm which is constants information miner it is a free and open source data analytics reporting and integration platform which is built for powerful analytics on a gui based workflow this means you do not have to know how to code to be able to work using the k9 and derive the insights what you can do is you can work all the way from gathering the data and creating models to deployment as well as production it consolidates all the functions of the entire process into a single workflow you can gather and wrangle the data you can model and visualize you can deploy and manage and you can consume and optimize as well so it's an all-in-one package and the most important aspect is you do not need to know how to code so the next library which i'm going to talk about is one of the best library out there for machine learning which is tensorflow it is created by google brain team and tensorflow it's an open source library for numerical computation and large-scale machine learning when it comes to artificial intelligence framework showdown you will find tensorflow emerging as a clear winner most of the time now what makes it so special so tensorflow provides an accessible and readable syntax which is essential for making these programming resources easier to use and being a low level library provides more flexibility and with the new version of 2.0 it is just going to be on the top of any machine learning or deep learning purposes it is one of the best machine learning tools available 
and it also uses Keras and other high-level APIs to make things a little smoother. And the most important thing is it can run on both CPU as well as GPU and it really helps in graphical purposes like if you are dealing with images, videos, TensorFlow is the way to go. Now, Vika, which is the Waikato environment for knowledge analysis, it is an open source Java software that has a collection of machine learning algorithms for data mining and data exploration tasks. It is one of the most powerful machine learning tools for understanding and visualizing machine learning algorithms on your local machine. It has both a graphical interface and a command line interface. Now, the only downside to this is that there is not much documentation or online support available. But all in all, it's a very good software and it's based on Java. It also provides predictive modeling and visualization and it's an environment for comparing learning algorithms. And the graphical user interface includes data visualization as well. Now next, we have a library which is one of the biggest rival of TensorFlow which is PyTorch or Torch. So PyTorch is a Python based library built to provide flexibility as a deep learning deployment platform. The workflow of PyTorch is as close as you can get to the Python scientific computing library NumPy. It is actively used by Facebook for all of its machine learning or deep learning work and the dynamic computation graphs are a major highlight of PyTorch. The support for CUDA ensures that the code can run on the GPU thereby decreasing the time needed to run the code and increasing the overall performance of the system. Now this framework is embedded with ports to iOS and Android backends. RapidMiner, the next tool which I'm going to talk about, is a data science platform for teams that unite data preparation, machine learning, and predictive model deployment. It has a powerful and robust graphical user interface that enables users to create, deliver, and maintain predictive analytics. With rapid minor, uncluttered, disorganized, and seemingly useless data becomes very valuable as it simplifies data access and lets you structure them in a way that is easy for you and your team to comprehend. Now, few of the features are that it results in visualization a lot. Through GUI, it helps in designing and implementing analytical workflows. One of the downside is that the tool is very costly. Now, Google is not very far behind. Apart from TensorFlow, we have the Google Cloud Auto ML. Now, Google Cloud Auto ML makes the power of machine learning available to you even if you have limited knowledge of machine learning. The Google's human labeling service can put a team of people to work annotating or cleaning your labels to make sure your models are being trained on high quality data. Now, how cool is that? They have various products for different purposes, which makes it a very good machine learning tools. For example, we have Auto ML Vision, which is used for images. We have the Auto ML Video Intelligence, which is specifically designed for video. We have the Auto ML Natural Language, which is used to structure and get the meaning of text. We have the Auto ML Translation, which dynamically detects and translates between different languages. And we have the AutoML tables, which builds the models on your structured data. Now we have the Azure Machine Learning Studio as well. Now Microsoft Azure Machine Learning Studio is a collaborative drag and drop machine learning tool you can use to build, test, and deploy predictive analytics solution on your data. You drag and drop data sets and analysis modules into an interactive canvas and connecting them together to form an experiment which you run in the machine learning studio and there is no programming required just visually connecting data sets and modules to construct your predictive analytic model and finally you just have to publish it as a web service now accord.net is a .net machine learning framework combined with audio and image processing libraries which is completely written in c sharp now the tagline being machine learning made in a minute that's an amazing tagline guys and it is a complete framework for building production grade computer vision computer audition signal processing and statistics application libraries are made available from the source code and through executable installer and the NuGet packet manager the only drawback is that 
it supports dotnet that it only supports the dotnet supported languages it provides algorithm for numeric linear algebra numeric optimization statistics artificial neural network it also provides supports for graph plotting and visual libraries as well and it has more than 38 kernel function it contains more than 35 hypotheses test including one way and the two way ANOVA test non parametric tests like Kolmogorov's Mirnov test and many more now this is rather an interesting product by Google which is the core laboratory it is a free Jupyter notebook environment that requires no setup and runs entirely on the cloud it is a Google research project created to help decimate machine learning education and research that's a good step forward by Google it is by far one of the top machine learning tools especially for data scientists because you don't have to manually install any of the package and libraries just import them directly by calling them you can directly save your project on the Google Drive github or any location in various formats as well and it also supports libraries of PyTorch Keras tensorflow as well as OpenCV these are pre-installed now this is a major step forward in the machine learning education department by Google so hats off to them now NLTK is another tool which I'm going to talk about which is the natural language toolkit and it's an extensive library for natural language tasks it is a go-to package for all your text processing needs from word tokenization to limitization stemming dependency parsing chunking chinking removing the stop words and many more text processing is an extremely important part for any NLP task like language modeling neural machine translation or name entity recognition and it also provides a synonym bank called the wordnet now these are few of the tools basically the libraries and the frameworks which are really really necessary if you are going for machine learning or if you're going for deep learning as a matter of fact and these list of tools are enough for anyone to get started in the machine learning world well it's finally time to lift up the curtain on roadmap okay, so why don't we get started here's the roadmap first programming languages and libraries well, there are many programming languages to choose from, but we highly recommend Python because it's very useful when it comes to machine learning and the whole world is using Python. But regardless of the programming languages that you choose, you should be able to understand how to do file operations like read and write and how to load files into memory. You should know how to work with functions and object ori oriented programming. You should know how to use modules for reusability of the code so you don't end up writing the same code again and again. You should know how to handle exceptions. And if you're using Python, you should know Python libraries like NumPy, Pandas, Matplotlib, SkyKit-Learn, TensorFlow, and so on. So there are so many useful resources. If you want to get started with the first step, we actually have a certification in Python just specifically for this so that you can learn it for machine learning. Or you can even check out our YouTube videos that will give you some of the tutorials. If you need more help, then again, go down in the description and find the link to that certification. It's going to be Python certification for machine learning. Moving on. Second, mathematics for machine learning. Let's get into what kind of math do you actually need for machine learning. So these are the areas that you need to work on. Linear algebra, calculus, probability, and statistics. So diving a little deeper in each of the areas, starting with linear algebra, you should know what a scalar is, a vector is, a matrix is, and you should know how to perform different operations on each one of them. And of course, you need to know what the application of linear algebra is in machine learning. Then moving on, calculus, you should know what differentiation rules are what partial differentiation is and how does it work and of course you should know the application of calculus in machine learning probability so you should know all the terminologies in probability you should know what distribution in probability is and how it works the types of probability Bayes theorem and application of probability in machine learning lastly for statistics you should know all the terminologies of course you should know what the different sampling techniques are types of statistics 
and hypothesis testing. So that was all about what to learn. But what about where to go to find all of this? We have excellent blogs on our Edureka website that you can access for free. It covers end to end of what we just discussed and more. We have a collection of full length YouTube videos to help you learn this math. But if you do need more help with this stuff, as it happens, people could be coming from various educational backgrounds where math was not taught to them. Then we do have statistics courses on our websites and we will be happy to leave the links to them in the description. Okay, moving on. Step number three, data science and machine learning fundamentals. In data science, you should know stuff like what is data science, data analysis pipeline, data extraction, types of data, techniques like data wrangling, exploratory data analysis, data visualization, and so on. And when it comes to machine learning, you should know what are the types of machine learning models. For example, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, reinforcement learning, and what are the different types of algorithms that are used within these different types of models. And you should know concepts like dimensionality reduction, time series analysis, and finally, after you learn all of these, you should know how to do model selection and boosting. So this is where most of the people start to have trouble because they don't have a set path. And so I recommend to go for a certification. And we have an amazing certification. It's called Python Machine Learning Certification, which dwells into the basics of data science and machine learning and talks all about the various techniques and algorithms that we just discussed. And it prepares learners with the help of a dozen or more case studies. And with many hands-on projects, you'll be building machine learning models yourself in no time. So I'll be happy to leave the link to that certification in the description. Do check it out. You can thank me later. Moving on. Step number four, natural text processing. So after you're done with data science and machine learning fundamentals, algorithm techniques, and you build a couple of hands-on projects so you get a good grasp on the basics of machine learning and you can actually build practical models out of it. Next step is to start learning about natural language processing. Here you should learn about text mining and what natural language processing is. You should learn how to extract, clean, and pre-process text. You should also learn how to analyze sentence structures using various tools and models and then also learn text classification using different models. We have amazing certification for this one as well, which is called NLP with Python certification, where you learn all these concepts and you actually get to do practical labs and you can build projects. And this is a lot of fun because you're gonna be able to do that with other learners. So I'm gonna leave the link to that certification in the description. You can also check out our YouTube videos on this and you can also check out our blogs that can help you out in this regard as well. Moving on. So fifth and final step for this roadmap is big data and tools like PySpark, Hadoop, etc. So let's take a look at them. So in terms of big data technology, you should understand the concepts of big data, Hadoop and Spark, and you should be very good with Apache Spark framework. You should be able to have enough knowledge to play with Spark or DDS. You should properly know the data frames and Spark SQL. And you should be able to use Spark MLlib to do machine learning. And you can understand the basics of Apache Kafka and Apache Flume. And you should absolutely know Apache Spark Streaming, processing multiple batches of data and data sources. And you should uh, know a little bit of uh, Spark GraphX as well. Now I know all of this is gonna sound very complex, but I'm gonna give you a link to a certification and then there's so many useful resources that we have on YouTube channel uh, in terms of tutorial for each of these topics that you can explore and you can learn for yourself. But if you do need a little bit of help, don't be afraid, you know, like we have great certifications, we have great blogs and we will leave the links to them down below. And if you have any questions ever, don't be threatened by all of this. You can always come to us and ask us. And so before we actually move on to the last section of the video, let's quickly recap. So the first step is to just learn some of the programming languages. We recommend Pythons and they're great libraries for machine learning. 
and then learn the math needed for machine learning. We went over that as well. The third step is to learn the data science and machine learning fundamentals, algorithms, techniques, and do some hands-on projects. We have amazing certifications for that as well. After that, it is very essential to learn natural text processing and how to do that using different models. And then finally, you should understand big data and tools like PySpark and Hadoop because they are very necessary in today's world because of the amount of data that we're producing every day. And so if you follow all of these steps properly and if you need any help, just let us know. But we want you to become a machine learning wizard. And so we hope through this video that you are able to follow all of these steps and you can get to where you want to go. So the last session is useful resources to help you get started. Obviously throughout the video I kind of gave you a glimpse of what are the kind of resources that you can refer back to if you need help during the whole process, during the whole roadmap. But one of the most useful resources that you can find is our YouTube channel. You can find all sorts of tutorials and especially the stuff that we took a look at. All of the skills that we discussed are going to be on our YouTube Edureka channel so please go check that out as well. If you want to get started, if you have any questions, you can obviously let us know. Another rich source for educational content is our blogs. If you haven't checked out our blogs, I do recommend that you do it right after this video because they're amazing. And for the people who need a little bit of help, don't worry, we got you. We have so many certifications. We're going to leave the links to each of these in the description below. But everything that we went through, there's certification for each one of them. And our master programs covers all of the five skills that we spoke about. And it can take you from zero to hero in machine learning. And I just want to point out before I share parting words with you in this video that our master's programs alumni work for amazing companies like Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Cisco, Dell, KPMG and many more. Let's start with the core interview questions. First thing, how will you explain machine learning to a school going kid? So in this case, the interviewer is interested to see how you can explain the concepts in machine learning in a very simple manner so that even a school going kid can understand. You can give an example to a kid saying that, okay, your friend has invited you to a party and you meet completely strangers there. So you have not seen them previously. They are just completely strangers to and you're going to meet them. Since you have no idea about them previously, so you will try to classify them based on the available things that you can visualize. That is like, what is the gender? What is the age group? So how are they dressed? How do they behave with you? Like, what is their attitude? So he will try to classify them based on those features. So this is a pure example of unsupervised learning. So in this case, we don't have any prior knowledge. So in this case, they are completely totally strangers. How is it different from the supervised learning? So in supervised learning, the benefit will be you will have some prior knowledge and based on that, you will try to go. So you can explain to the kid that as you already got identified to those kids, in future, you know their names. So you will try to classify them when you see them. So that will be the example of supervised learning. So let's move on to the next thing. What are various types of machine learning? So first of all, you have to say that the machine learning is categorized into majorly three components. So first is the supervised learning. Second is the unsupervised learning. And third is the reinforcement learning. So in the supervised learning, it is like learning with a teacher. So training data set is like a teacher is giving you like training the machine. So teacher is trying to train based on the whatever teacher knows. So model is like trained on this predefined data which you have and it start to make decisions based on the again based on this rule that it has identified from the existing data it will try to make some predictions and decisions on the new data you can give some examples as we have here in this case when we have apples and bananas we feed machine apples and bananas with the label saying that okay this is the apple this is how it looks this is the set of bananas and this is how they look so when you feed it to the machine learning supervised algorithm so what it does is it tries to identify the patterns which are there with each category. So it will say it set the rule that okay, apple looks like this, banana looks like this. 
So this is the training data that we have provided based on which our supervised learning learns it. And we use this model on the new data set. So for example, in this case, we are using this green apple and based on the structure which is already there, the green apple is still going to be predicted as an apple based on the shape it has. Okay, so that is the example of supervised learning. Let's move to the next thing, which is unsupervised learning. So in this case, it is like learning without a teacher. So model learns through the observations which are there and it tries to identify some patterns and structure which will be hidden within the data. So in this case, we are not labeling the data. So model is given a data and model is left on itself to learn the patterns and relationships out of the data by creating cluster. So clustering is one of the major techniques which are used in the unsupervised learning. There are many, but this is the most popularly used within the unsupervised. So for example, when we feed the apples, bananas and the mangoes here again, but in this case, we are not labeling them. We are not telling the machine that, okay, these are the apples, these are the bananas. We're just giving it the data saying, okay, this is what it is. We don't know anything about it. So when we feed it to the algorithm, algorithm tries to learn the patterns out of it and tries to classify them. It won't say this is apple, this is banana, but it will say, okay, these are similar. So apples are similar and they will try to cluster them together. Bananas are similar. It will try to separate them in a different cluster and mangoes are similar. It will try to cluster them in a separate cluster. So it will try to understand the patterns which are there within the data and give you the clusters out of it. So that is the unsupervised learning. Third part is reinforcement learning. So in this case, model learns with hit and trial method. So assume that we are playing the Mario game and in the Mario game, the player is called as the agent in the reinforcement learning. We have an environment which is nothing but a game. There will be some predefined actions which agent can take. For example, in the game of Mario, it will be he can move forward, he can jump, he can go into the tunnels, he can fire the bombs. So those are the steps. And based on the steps, your environment will try to reward you. Either it will reward you or it will penalize you. Based on that, your model will get created, which will say, okay, these are the best actions where when you do these actions, you will get your score more, which is like a reward. And when you don't, you do this kind of action, your score will get penalized. So based on this environment, your reinforcement learning will try to learn those things. So that is one example. And you can also give some examples related to the AlphaGo, which is a Go playing game, which recently was developed by a google based company and you can also say that chess based games can be automated with the reinforcement learning so there is one more category within machine learning which is not much talked about which is the semi-supervised algorithm so which are basically combination of supervised plus unsupervised so in this case what happens is you have a data set which is half of it is labeled and half of it is not labeled so in this case, both supervised plus semi-supervised are used to create your models. So you can also give this so that it will be more confident on you. Okay, so let's move on to the next thing. What's your favorite algorithm and can you explain it in a minute? In this case, interview is trying to understand as how you can explain some complicated techniques and technologies in a very simple and simplistic manner to some higher up people or the clients or those kind of things. So make sure you have some choice and you can explain different algorithms in a simple manner. You keep for every example, try to keep some simple examples so that you can effectively and you can easily explain it so that even a small kid can understand as how you are explaining those things. So how deep learning is different from machine learning in this case. First thing is you have to know that deep learning is not completely different from machine learning. You have to say that okay deep learning is a small part of machine learning and uh, in the core machine learning based on the input first you have to do the feature extractions you have to classify the features which are the good which are trying to uh, explain your model better based on some exploratory data analysis and based on that you will feed it to the algorithms and those algorithms will try to identify the patterns within those and give you the output in deep learning it is a bit simplified what happens is based on the input the model will try to extract the features on itself and will try to create a model based on those. So it is trying to combine both the things of feature extraction and classification into a single thing and 
it will give you the output so that's why it is recently being very popular so that is one thing and deep learning is basically if you know the deep learning is constructed most of the neural networks so a neural networks are basically borrowed from the idea of the human brain so how the human brain works and how the neurons within the brain really works in a very complicated and effective manner so those are the things which have been taken and being implemented in the deep learning and machine learning is about the algorithms that basically parses and learns the data and tries to identify the patterns within the data apply whatever pattern learned from the data to the new data whichever is coming so that is the most of the thing which was related with the machine learning but deep learning has come a bit more advanced to it okay so explain classification and regression so classification and regression is part of supervised learning so you have to say this first that this is part of the supervised learning supervised learning is broadly categorized into this two parts and regression is mostly dealing with the continuous variable so in continuous variable it's like you are trying to predict the sales you are trying to predict the stock market values so wherever there are continuous predictions you are trying to do the regression of your data so classification is like you are trying to predict the different classes which are there within the data so for example the classes could be like uh, is the student going to pass or not is my customer going to buy my product or not and is my salary is within like high medium low so those are the different classes and when we're dealing with the classes we say it is classification and we're dealing with the continuous values we say it is regression so in this case if you see the regression is like size of your house area and the location which are there and classification is like when you're trying to give it a classes so very cheap cheap affordable so you're creating a five classes here and that becomes the classification what do you understand by selection bias in the statistical term sampling is basically trying to sample some data from your population so you are trying to take some portion of the data from the population and when you have some bias to some specific set of data so let's assume we want to take a population of all the data scientists within india when you're talking about india you have to take data from all parts of india but let's assume you just take the sample from the gurgaon so when you just take the sample from the gurgaon you're getting a selection bias you're getting bias to the gurgaon and you're just selecting the data from there so in this case you're getting bias to those conclusions of your inaccurate conclusions of yours and you're not making the accurate decisions based for the population okay so that is the selection bias so what do you understand by precision and recall so in this case let's go on with the example so let's imagine that your girlfriend keep on giving you surprises from last 10 years of your birthdays and one sudden day she comes to you and asks you do you remember all birthday surprises from me and you just get shocked and in this case to extend your life what you do is you try to recall all the 10 surprising events that you had in your previous birthdays and this recall that you're doing is nothing but the number of events you actually correctly trying to recall it and the actual events which have happened so this is the ratio that you're trying to capture of all the recalls that you're doing correctly and the number of the correct events which happened so for example if you are trying to recall out of 10 all the 10 correctly then your recall ratio is nothing but one so which is again a hundred percent but if you're trying to recall only seven events correctly so as per the ratio what will happen is the number of events you can correctly recall is seven and the total number of events which are there is 10 so in this case your ratio will be 0 0.7 which will be 70 percent but let's assume you might be wrong in some answers so for example you answered you remember 15 times but out of this only 10 were correct and five events were actually wrong so you remembered from some another events so in this case so you recall all the events which are there but it's not completely precise so in this case the precision is the ratio that the number of events you are recalling correctly to the number of events you recall so which is like out of 15 you are trying to recall the 10 as a correctly so that is the precision which we have so 10 real events and 15 answers so the ratio is 
is 66 percent in this case which is 10 divided by 15 okay in the formulas you can represent all those things in a simple formula so number of events you can correctly recall are called as the true positive so which you said as true you said as a positive you are able to recall them correctly and they're actually there so number of all correct events so this is also again the true positive which you recall correctly plus the false negative which you didn't recall okay and the next thing is the number of events you recall so which is true positives plus the false positives in this case what is happening is the correct recall that you did all the events that you correctly remembered and some which are not correct so you said okay i recall them so for example when we had it 15 so in that case there were some like 10 were correct and 5 were the false positive which was you didn't recall them correctly so based on all this above the recall is true positive divided by true positive plus false negative so true positive plus false negative is nothing but the number of correct events as we already saw that so number of events you can correctly recall divided by number of correct events and precision is true positive divided by true positive plus false positive which is the number of events you can correctly recall divided by number of all events you recall okay so the next question is explain false negative false positive true negative and true positive with a simple example so previously we just saw the example where we had an example of the birthday surprises so you can also go with the example where it will be more realistic as it will give some impact to it so for example the true positive so in this case we can take some real example where what the model that we are trying to build what it does is based on the fire is there or not it will try to raise an alarm so in the first case it's true positive so in true positive what will happen is you said you have to do the alarm and there is actually a fire so there is actual fire and you try to do it it is the right condition so that is the true positive second is the false positive in this case you raise an alarm but there is no fire so in this case what will happen when you raise the alarm there is no fire but still people are running so that is not a good thing and that is called the false positive third example is false negative so false negative if you're not raising an alarm even when there is a fire this is the worst condition that we have in all the situations so your aim is to raise an alarm when there is actual fire but this condition says when you, there is still a fire you're not raising any alarm so this is the most harmful thing which can be there and where your model is not working so you have to be very careful with this thing one and true negative is something where there is no fire and you have not raised any alarm which is still good okay what is confusion matrix so to explain this confusion matrix to your interview you can take some simple examples such as you want to create a model where what you are trying to look is you have a bank and that bank wants to identify who are the customers i should be giving loan to so that they won't default me so i have a training data where i know that okay these are the customers who were good who didn't default and these are the customers to whom i gave loan but they defaulted so that data is used in making this predictions and you have a model which has done this also so assume that we have 165 people in the training set and after doing the prediction so in the training set what we have got is in actual 105 people can be given loan who didn't defaulted and 60 people who bank gave loan they defaulted so what your model is predicting in this case is it says 110 people can be given loan who will not default and 55 people can be rejected so as they are going to default but this is on a higher level but when you look at the confusion matrix what will happen is you will try to see okay how my model is performing and where are the true positives true negatives and how should i take care uh, not take care but how is it performing at the part of the false positive and the false negative so assume uh, we have a true positive so in actual there are 105 people who the bank's training data says can be given loan who didn't default but out of that model has identified 100 people so which is a good thing and for the no case for the rejection case out of 60 people the model says 50 which is again a good thing but your model says for 10 people 
who are actually defaulters but model says you should give them loan so those are the things which can be looked into the future but confusion matrix will help you to understand how your model is performing based on the predicted the model output and the actual data which you have so what is the difference between inductive and deductive learning so to help this concept you can give some good examples such as a father want to explain his son how the fire can burn him so there are two ways that he can teach his kid as how he can get impacted from the fire so first thing is he will show him some examples like he will show him some videos or he will show some demo as how the fire will get him burned so based on the observations the kid will learn and make some conclusions out of it so that is the example for inductive learning where he will do the observation as see how the things are going to be and make some conclusions out of it and for the deductive learning it is like father is letting the kid play with the fire so the father will wait till kid will get burned and try to make some conclusions out of it and have the observations after it like he will get himself burned and then he will say that okay fire makes us burn so that is the deductive learning where what happens is first you will make some conclusions and then you draw the observations similarly in the field of machine learning it is like out of the data you will try to do some observations and this observations are stored as a model which is like you have observed all the things and kept it as a model and the deductive learning is like you are giving it a data and based on the previous inductive learning that it has already done it will try to deduce the output of it so how is k and different from k means clustering one important thing happens is people are really confused with what is knn or sometimes like is knn clustering or is k means a clustering in this question the clustering is given to you as k means clustering but sometimes the interview will just ask you how is knn different from k means first thing you have to do is you have to understand the difference as k means is a unsupervised technique algorithm and knn is a supervised technique in knn is used as a supervised algorithm knn is used for classification and regression and k means is used for clustering as it's a clustering algorithm it is used to do create the clusters of your data k within knn basically means it tries to observe the k neighbors so in the case of regression it will try to identify the surrounding k neighbors and take the average and give you the output and in the case of classification what it will do is it will try to see the surrounding neighbors k neighbors and whatever the majority of the class is there it will assign the class to that so in this case k is your neighbors based on which your regression and classification will be done in the case of k means it is the k clusters that you are going to create out of your data so k in the both cases is different and you have to give this differences to the interviewer so one thing is you once you know that okay k means is an unsupervised and knn is a supervised you can further go on top of that okay can you explain me what is roc curve and what does it represent so in this case interviewer is interested to know how good you understand the roc curve and how you can use it to understand your models output so interviewer is very much interested as how you are trying to use this in your model performance so as roc is also one of the performance parameters for your model and this is used in the cases of binary classification the full form for the roc is receiver operating characteristics curve and its fundamental use started with the diagnostic test evaluations so in the medical field its application started and it is used in the machine learning field to do the classification related algorithms performance evaluation so in simplistic term it is the plot of true positive rates which is also called as the sensitivity against the false positive rate so what happens is once you get the output in the probabilities you can use the different cutoffs and you can use the cutoffs to distinguish as what is going to be the true cases and what is going to go for a false cases and you can plot the roc curve and roc curve says when your curve is having one your model is good and the plot with the 50% like 0.5 which is nothing but this blue line which is the worst case it's like your model is saying you have a 50% chance in the prediction it's just saying it's just a normal guessing work so you are either guessing one or two with a 50% probability 
the more closer to this and more area this curve is trying to cover the better is the algorithm so better you are trying to predict the true positive rates than the false negative rates your true positive rates should increase faster than the false positive rates in this case so first we saw like what actually roc curve does and we will see like how you can interpret it now so you can give the interviewer some idea about what is really roc curve give some details about it and you can give the technical details like how you can interpret it so first of all it is like trade off there is always a trade off between sensitivity and specificity and one will increase in one will create a decrease in another so it is really important with the roc curve you will see this differences as how it, they are getting impacted the closer the curve follows to the true positive rate line and the more area it covers such as the yellow one as it is covering the highest area that is more better than the pink one and pink one is more better than the blue one the blue one is as we already said is like just a, a random guessing with a 50% of probability and the slope of the tangent line at the cut points gives you the likelihood ratio as how likelihood your model is what's the difference between type 1 and type 2 error so this is one of the very important concepts which you interviewer is trying to understand as how you try to distinguish between the type of errors or do you understand as how this type 1 and type 2 errors are impacting the performance of your model so interview is trying to understand those things so you can give some good examples to say how these are going to impact so first thing is type 1 error is false positives so when something is not true which in actuality is not true but your model is saying it is true so as we have the example if a doctor says to a male person that he is pregnant so it is like something is not true but you are saying it is true so which is the false positive and is an example for the type 1 error and the type 2 is a false negative so when something you are saying is not there but in actuality is there so when you are saying negative so you are saying it is not there but in actuality it is false so that is the false proof. similar example comes to where female is pregnant and the doctor says she is not pregnant so this is like your model says something is not true which is in the negative case but in reality it is there is it better to have too many false positives or too many false negatives this case really depends on the domain and the type of problem that you are solving so based on the different problems and the different business requirements you have to decide on what to have so there is always a trade-off you have to maintain the trade-off between this false positives and false negatives and you have to decide which one we can keep as a more as we already saw in the previous case where you can imagine that where a doctor says a male person that he is a pregnant person so this kind of model is always going to be a problem and you have to decide like how many of these cases you can manage so is it like out of 100 can you say that you can manage 10 false positives or how many you can consider for those and you can move on with the model so similarly there is example when in the sma spam filtering so can you say a good mail as a spam or not so that trade-off you have to manage and based on that it will go so this you have to define beforehand which one you can go on with and you have to create your model as per that so these kind of questions are mostly related with the domain specific questions so you cannot just select any one of it and just give example so beforehand just try to understand what domain you are trying to explain and before that try to first be clear with what is false positives and what is false negatives after that select a specific domains and give the examples so for example in the medical testing negatives may provide a false reassuring messages to the patients and physicians that some disease is absent but you are actually saying it is present so what will happen in this case is you are trying to give inadequate treatments to both the patients and the disease which is not required and these things will cost patients to the medical and uh, the medical agencies and these kind of things has to be managed so it is desirable to have many false positives in this case the other example could be the spam filtering so in this case a false positive occurs when spam filtering is blocking or wrongly classifying the legitimate emails 
so you can't have that as many times so users will get irritated when your actual mails are getting into the spam so in this case we prefer to many false negatives over the many false positives so based on the domain it differs and you have to give the example specific to those domains okay so which is more important to you the model accuracy or the model performance this question the interview is trying to understand how better you know this terms so do you really know the differences between these terms so first thing try to understand what these terms are in actually the model accuracy is part of model performance it is subset of the model performance there are different model performance measures and model accuracy is one of them so for example let's consider the case of fraud detection so in this case what will happen is you will have millions of rows and within those only very less percentage of rows will have actual frauds so in those cases if you look for the model accuracy your model accuracy will mostly be higher and it won't give you a complete picture of your model performance so model accuracy is just a subset of the model performance and there are more metrics that you have to look to understand the model performance so now we are done with the core machine learning so which are mostly related to the theoretical aspects of the machine learning now we will start with the python related questions with the machine learning as machine learning can be done with different languages like r python sas but currently we are more focusing on the python and we will start with our practical questions which are there with the machine learning so first question is name a few libraries in python used for data analysis and scientific computations in this case interview is trying to understand so in the initial level he will try to ask you this questions to gauge you if you really know about the core libraries which are used for the data analysis in the python or not so the core libraries which are there within python are numpy scipy pandas and scikit so first of all numpy numpy is a numerical library to deal with the data so as the name suggests it's a numerical pi so it tries to deal with the numbers so all the core libraries such as the scipy panda skykit uses numpy to store the data so those are the core storage format for all the data in data analysis so scipy its full form is basically scientific python so it basically gives you a library to deal with all the different kind of mathematical functions so you can do fourier transforms for the audio related data you can go with the optimizations you can go with the interpolation so these are just a few examples but all the mathematical related tasks you can go with the scipy and scipy uses as we already discussed in a core numpy to store the data so pandas is a data analysis library again where you can store the data in a tabular manner which is called as a data frames and data frames are very powerful function within pandas so data from gives you a data manipulation access you can access the csv you can load the databases you can load the excel files and you can do your operations on top of it you can do the aggregations merging and all those kind of analysis related to the data you can do with the pandas scikit is purely a machine learning library what it gives you is access to the different machine learning models you can use so it contains a different components it contains a preprocessing component where you can do the preprocessing of your data it provides a library for that and it also provides you a different modeling library where you can access all the core machine learning models so on top of that we have matplotlib which is a purely a data visualization tool so with the matplotlib you can visualize your data in a very efficient manner and in a faster manner and seaborn is something which is built on top of matplotlib and gives you a more better visualization of the data and gives you different new kinds of visualizations which are not there within the matplotlib so you just can give this detail to the interviewer just list them all and give a bit of the description about each of them so that would be enough in this case which library would you prefer for plotting in python language seaborn or matplotlib or bokeh so all these three have their own applications so preference is something would come based on the thing that you are currently performing with the data analysis stage so for example when you are doing a quick analysis within your data so you want to have a quick access to the charts then you can use the matplotlib for example matplotlib provides you a quick access to the bar charts pie charts histogram uh, line charts scatter plot so 
for the quick analysis and the data exploration you can go with the matplotlib seaborn is something which is built on top of the matplotlib and you can use this when you want to do a bit in-depth analysis of your data for example when you want to have a statistical analysis within the data and seaborn gives you a bit more types of graphs which are not there within the matplotlib so for example when you want to have a distribution charts with a more detail so seaborn provides you charts such as the violin plots it gives you a kde plots so for the detailed explanation of your data you can go with the seaborn bouquet is something which is an interactive visualization bouquet you go when you want to present your data to something of the outside world when you want to publish it on a web and you want your user to interact with the data then you use bouquet so when you go to the outside and you want to publish your visualization to the outside public you use bouquet for that purpose so how are numpy and scipy related to each other so this thing you can give a bit of detail as what is really numpy first and what is really scipy and the thing is scipy is a bigger library and numpy is part of it so numpy is a smaller part of scipy numpy helps you to define arrays and you can perform some operations on top of those arrays using the numpy libraries so different types of operations are like indexing sorting you can change the shape of it you can change the matrices you can create a splits within your data you can merge different arrays together so numpy will help you with all those scipy you can go to a next level when you using on top of this numpy arrays when you want to create some mathematical formulation you can go with the scipy so when you want to do the optimization you want to do the fourier transform if you have audio data for those kind of applications you can go with the scipy so what is the main difference between a panda series and a single column data frame in python so interviewer he would like to really understand if you know the core concepts within the python or not and pandas is something which is the core of the data analysis as all your data is stored within pandas and you are dealing with pandas most of the time so in this case interview will try to gauge you as you know the basic terms which are there within the pandas or not so first thing data frame is something which can store multiple columns but a series cannot store multiple columns so series is just a single column but with the data frame even if it's a single column you can go with the multiple columns you can add the columns to it and there are some limited functions which are there with the series and data frame has additional functions on top of series so for example loc is a function which is there on top of this so data frame is the upper level layer on top of series and gives you more control to the data but the basic difference is with the series you just have a single column but with the data frame you still can add more columns to the data how can you handle duplicate values in data set for a variable in python so in this case you may have to write a code and show to the interviewer that how you can really achieve this thing so you can just import the pandas library show that you are just reading a random file using the pd.read_csv and you use the build data frame dot duplicated to get the list of all the duplicate values which are there within the data and just show that you can also drop those columns if sometimes we want to drop those there by some mistake created by the collector so the duplicate values can be removed using the drop underscore duplicate columns so these two functions you can try to show and explain them what they do that would help you in that write a basic machine learning program to check the accuracy of the data set importing any data set using any classifier so in this case you are not limited with what data set you are loading what data classifier the important thing which you have to show is how you are loading your performance parameters and things that the interviewer will gauge is how you are trying to use the performance metrics are you trying to use it on the test set or the training set or you are trying to use it on the trained data or just a test data so you have to be very sure as you don't have the computer to do the output you just want to write it so you have to be sure that you are using a test set to show the accuracy parameter and you have to use both training y and test y in this case so you have to start with the complete program you have to show all the steps which are involved within the accuracy part so you have to start importing your data just take some random data you can just show that you are reading some data and try to separate your data into the x and y the target data and the predictor data and try to create a split within the data of train and test validations 
you can use whatever the issue you want to use you can use 80 percent 70 percent 50 percent as you like but you need to give some justification to that also if your interviewer asks for it once we have split our data into train and test set, the next task is to use the classifiers to train the data and create a model out of it. So you can use any classifiers here, but choose something which you already know better because interviewer will ask you whatever model you're going to use in the next step. So you have to be sure whatever you're using, you know it better. So once you have created an instance, you can use it to fit it on the training data. So use the X train data and the Y train data, create a model. Once you have done that, you use it to make predictions on top of the test data. So you use the X test and create a predictions out of it. And accuracy tries to compare your data like your original data and whatever predictions you have done and give you a score out of it. So you will load the metric accuracy score from the SK learn metrics. Once you have done that, you use the print to use the accuracy score and accuracy score will take two parameters. One is the original matrix, which is the Y test, comma, the predictions which you have currently made. So once you get that, it will create an accuracy measure for that. So accuracy will be nothing but the true positive plus true negative upon the all data. So it will calculate that and give you. The interviewer in the next step may ask you, like, how can you improve the accuracy score? So once you put the accuracy score, the next thing the interviewer may ask you is, how can you improve the accuracy score? So you can go for three simple steps where you can try to increase the accuracy of your model first simple step would be try to see if you can make some tweaking into your probability cutoff so the default probability cutoff is 50 percent so the ones which are above the 50 percent are tagged as one and the ones below the 50 percent probability are tagged as zero so if you are changing it to something like 0 0.8 and then checking the accuracy if it makes changes to your model it is still good if it doesn't the next step would be try to see if you can find out some better features using some feature importance algorithm such as random forest and different tree models are available which will give you the better features as per the target so you can use those features and train a model so that you will have your accuracy increased and next step would be create some new features and see if your model makes any improvement in your accuracy you can make some new features or you can add some more data so that it will help your model to generalize better for this part we have completed with the python related interview questions of the machine learning so this was more of a technical part of it where we saw how we can code how we can show the interviewer that interview is more interested to see how you can code the things and how confident you are with those things Okay, so now we are done with that. We will now move on to the scenario based questions where we will see some puzzle kind of things and the other are real problems where the interview is related to understand as how you try to solve those problems. Let's start with those. So you are given a data set consisting of variables having more than 30% of missing values. Let's say out of 50 variables, eight variables have missing values higher than 30% how will you deal with them so missing values could be of any reasons so something like it's your data got corrupted while storing and you got a missing data the person who collected the data may have done some mistakes and that data is treated as a missing data or it could be like there is nothing for those kind of values so it's like it is supposed to be blank and it's supposed to be missing so there are different conditions for those so let's see how we can try to handle those things first we can create a new feature which will say okay this much of the part is non-missing and this much of the part is missing so we can assign it one and zero we can create a new binary variable it's possible that this thing is trying to give you some idea about the data and there will be some hidden pattern within your data because of this some missing values so it's possible that the creating this new feature will help your model to give the better accuracy and give the better performance second thing we can remove that completely if you have a high count of data so for example if you have a very good amount of data and you can say that okay i can leave with removing this 30 percent of the data then you can blindly remove this if it is not giving any value to you and you can't spend much time on trying to improve it or trying to impute it then you can blindly remove it or you can check the distribution so for example there are different ways to check how your missing values are to the similar cluster so some examples are you can see your missing values are clustered on some other values so can we give this cluster values to those missing values 
So it's like identifying clusters and based on those clusters, we give values to the missing data. Or the second thing is we use the distribution. So if they are continuous in nature, we can use the distribution to assign some data to them. So write an SQL query that makes recommendations using pages that your friends like. So assume you have two tables. First table is a column table of users and their friends. Second table is a column two column table of users and the pages they like. It should not recommend pages you already like. So why would interviewer ask an SQL question in this case? So it is like he's trying to understand how better you know the recommendation engines from the database point of view. So it is like he's trying to understand your knowledge in a different term. So first thing you have these two tables. So first table is including you can assume you have to make some assumptions and draw the picture of this two tables first. So first table will include a user ID and a friend ID. Second table will include a user ID the page ID they have liked and then once you have this structure of these two tables ready. The next step is to merge them together based on the friends. So as we are interested to know as which friends are liking which pages and based on that we want to recommend it to the original user. So first thing is we have to combine these two tables using a unique key which is the friends ID. So we join these two in the SQL using the friends ID that is one condition. Second condition says it should not recommend pages you already like. So what you do you have to have a way where you can exclude the pages which were already liked by that user. So this can be done by an inner query which you can use here to select the pages which that user has already selected and in the where condition you can say the page should not include this. So if you look at the whole query again we are first selecting the first table user ID the friends table user ID and the likes table page ID from friends f join like l. So we are trying to join them together on friend ID and the user ID. Second is as we mentioned that was the first thing and the second thing is we try to remove the recommendations the pages which he has already liked. So which we'll do by page ID not in the pages which he has already liked. So this is the condition which is trying to do this and this is how you can explain this thing to the interviewer. So there is a game where you are asked to roll two fair six sided dice if the sum of the values on the dice equals seven then you win $21. However, you must pay $5 to play each time you roll both dice. Do you play this game? And in follow up, what is the probability of making money from this game if you are playing it for six times? So the first condition says if the sum of the values on the dice equals seven, then you win $21. But for all other cases, you have to pay $5. So in this case if we first assume all the possible cases as we have fair six sided dice and we have two of them. So there is six multiplied by six. We have 36 different cases and out of it having two dices equal to seven is like we have one and six. We have two and five. We have three and four. We have four and three. We have five and two and we have one and six again. So those are nothing but six possible chances are there out of 36. If we take a ratio six by 36 will give us one by six ratio. So this says we have a chance of winning $21 one in six games. So assume that we are playing six games and out of it we win one game of $21 and five games we lose. So in this case for five games we have to pay $5 and this will be $25 and we are winning one time which is $21. In this case if you see there is a loss. So we are paying $25 and we are winning $21 in this case. So for the first question do you play this game? This is no as we are getting a loss as per the probability. The second question says what is the probability of making money from this game when you are playing it for six times? If you assume in this case we are making six games and out of that the winning probability if we just have a win in one case it be a loss. If we win two games out of six we are going to win. If we win three games it will be profitable again. So two, three, four, five, six are the cases where we will see a profit. So this case can be simulated with the binomial distribution. So binomial distribution takes three parameters. First is your probability of winning and losing. 
So that is in our case nothing but 1 by 6. The second is the number of plays which is 6 and the third is the number of cases that we want to identify. So for example in our case we want to have a condition where the number of wins is greater than 2. So we want to identify the first case is a failure where in the first case we are always losing. But in the second, if we win two, three, four, five, six times, we will always be winning. We will have a extra money. We have to find a probability where we will have more than two wins. So that can be simulated with the probability to get the answer for the second question. So the next question, we have two options for serving ads with newsfeed. So first is out of every 25 stories, one will be an ad. Second is every story has a 4% chance of being an ad. The question says for each option, what is the expected number of ads shown in 100 new stories? If we go with the option 2, what is the chance a user will be shown only a single ad in 100 stories? What about no ads at all? So in this question, if we look at the first part which says for each option, what is the expected number of ads shown in 100 new stories? So let's check it for the first one. So for the first one, out of every 25 stories, one will be an ad. So this is like one out of 25. In the second case, every story has 4% chance of being an ad. So this is like four out of 100 and which is again nothing but when we divide four by 100, we will have one by 25. So for the first question, the answer is both are similar. So both the cases have expected number of ads in 100 similar, which is 1 by 25 or 4%. Both are equivalent to each other. For the second question, you have to see is the question asks, what is the chance a user will be shown only a single ad in 100 stories? If you see this question, it is an example of binomial distribution. So as we just saw in the question three, binomial distribution takes three parameters. First is the probability of success and failure, which is in our case is 4%. Second is the number of total cases, which as the question says 100 stories. Last is the case that we want to identify, means a probability that we want to find out. So the question says, what is the chance a user will be shown only a single ad in 100 stories? So we want to have the three parameters as 4%, 100 stories as our n and single add as our probability chance. So if you see the probability can be calculated as 0.96 is basically not getting selected which is 1 minus 0.96 raised to 99. So 99 cases are not going to selected. Multiply the chance of selecting which is 0.04 raised to 1. So we are calculating a probability of not getting selected of 99 samples and getting selected of one sample. So this is the binomial distribution for selecting one ad out of 100 stories. The second question just says what is the probability of no ad at all? So in that case 0 and 99 would become 100. So 100 multiplied by probability of one case. So it will become 7.03%. The only thing is you have to identify like which distribution is highlighted from your question. So sometimes you will see that normal distribution kind of questions will be there where you have mean standard deviation and based on that you have to identify different things. In this case it was binomial so based on the parameters which are there in your question you have to identify which distribution you can use for that and try to solve it. How would you predict who will renew their subscription next month? What data would you need to solve this? What analysis would you do? Would you build predictive models? If so, which algorithms? This question is very generic and interviewer is really trying to understand how you try to approach your problem. So when you are given a problem, how you try to identify different components which are there within your problem, how you try to solve each of those confidently as how much of a knowledge is there within each of it. So what you have to do is let's assume something as first thing. How would you predict who will renew the subscription next month? Let's assume we are trying to predict the subscription for Dish TV subscription. So who is going to renew the subscription next month for the Dish TV? So that is the problem statement first. We define it. What data would you need to solve this? 
So in the case of Dish TV subscription, we would like to identify how many number of hours for that household the channels are active, how many number of kids are there in the home, how many number of adults are there in the home, which are the different channels they use for how much time, and from previous month, how much increase or decrease has happened in this month. So this all variables would help you to understand if in the next month again that customer is going to buy or not. So if there are kids in the home, there are chances that because of kids, whenever there are kids, they will look for the TV and kids will always help you in understanding if there will be subscription or not. And if the subscription has either increased or decreased from the previous month, will also help you to understand if that user usage has increased or decreased. So that will help you to understand the trend and make your prediction better. So what analysis would you do? So we would like to do the classification analysis in this case. We want to identify, okay, this customer is going to subscribe next month. This customer is not going to subscribe. So this is a pure classification related problem. Would you build predictive models? Yes, so before the classification related problem, we would like to build a predictive model. So we would already have a historical data. We will gather the data which is already existing and use that to train our model. So we can use any algorithm. So we can use any classification related algorithms in this case. So we can use random forest, we can use logistic regression, we can use neural networks, whichever we can try different models and see which one performs better. And based on that, we can continue with the model which performs better and tune it further. So you have to start with the step by step and show that, okay, this is the next step. This is the next step till the end of your model. So even in this case, if so, which algorithm would not end the problem? Algorithm you have selected after that you have to validate your algorithm. It will even go that in production and within production, you will also validate again and see in real life how it's working make again changes to the model. So those things may change again as the interviewer may keep on asking you the further things and you have to be ready for those things. Interviewer may start with few questions, but as you keep on solving the problem, interviewer keep on digging further as what would you do next. So you have to be ready for all those things. So be prepared for those things. How do you map nicknames, Pete, Andy, Nick, Rob, etc., to real names? So this is like, understanding how you try to solve a problem where there is not much of data is there. So this example is just you have just a nicknames and you want to identify the real names to them. So this can have different answers. It is not related to a single answer and there is no generic fixed answer, but interview would be interested to know as how you are trying to approach the problem and solve it. So few things could be like as you don't have any data, first you try to gather as to which components these things are related. So for example, if you are trying to understand these nicknames from a Twitter tweet, try to see who is trying to refer to who and based on these nicknames, see the relation as which person is trying to talk with which person and you can try to identify based on the NLP algorithms as what is the real names for those people. So similarly, you can try to identify in the Facebook or if you have some customer feedbacks and within those customer feedbacks, you want to understand this, you can do it that way. But this would be more like you have to understand in the context. So in which context people are talking to whom and based on that, you can try to identify the real names. So this is just one example, but it is not related to just single one. You can create your own as, as I said, there is no single answer to this problem, but it mostly depends on how you are trying to approach that problem and solve it. A jar has 1000 coins of which 999 are fair and one is double headed. Pick a coin at random and toss it 10 times. Given that you see 10 heads, what is the probability that the next toss of that coin is also a head? So, let's first try to split the problem statement that we have so the different components are we have thousand coins of which 999 are fair so for the fair case we can say that okay there is 0.5 percent probability that it could be head or it could be tail and one is double headed so it is not having probability and it is just a hundred percent probability that it's a head we pick a coin at random out of this thousand and 
toss it 10 times so each time we select a coin we toss it we select a coin we toss it so we try to do it 10 times given that you see 10 heads what is the probability that the next toss of that coin is also a head so let's see what we can do in this case so basically we have two types of coin which can be chosen in a two different ways basically and there are probabilities associated with each and they are different so for the first type of coin which is fair we have 999 out of 1000 so which is 0 0.999 and this chances of selecting the second coin which is unfair in nature is one out of 1000 so these are the probabilities that we have got first now as the question says we have already chosen 10 heads we have already done some experiment and we have got 10 heads so what is the probability of selecting those so selecting 10 heads in a row is equal to the chances of selecting fair coin multiplied by getting 10 heads plus selecting an unfair coin so if we see that first thing is selecting 10 coins from the 999 fair coins is we have the probability 0 0.999 multiplied by the fairness is basically probability 0 0.5 raised to 10 which will give us 0 0.999 multiplied by 1 by 1024 so when we multiply this we will get a chance of selecting coin a which is nothing but selecting the 10 coins from the fair coins the second part is the probability of selecting the second coin unfair coin multiply by one which is basically everything is head there as we don't have anything everything is head so it is one so probability of here is 0 0.001 probability of a says selecting the 10 coins from the fair coins probability of b says selecting the 10 coins from the double headed ones now the second question says given probability of fair coins what is the chance of selecting the coin from that it is like a conditional probability and in this conditional probability what we are doing is we are dividing the probability of a given probability of a and b so given both of them what is the probability of selecting the coins from the fair coins this is the probability and the second part basically says given double headed sided coins what is the probability of selecting from that so these are the two individual cases once we have got that we have to create a combined probability which will include the chances of selecting the coin from the fair coins multiply by 0.5 plus the chances of selecting the coin given it is the double headed multiply by 1 and this would create a combined probability and give you the output as 0 0.7531 so for this case we have to go step by step divide the problem into smaller parts and get to the answer of it suppose you are given a data set which has missing values spread along one standard deviation from the median what percentage of data would remain unaffected and why in this case there is not much details about how is the distribution of data it is just said that there is a one standard deviation from the mean which is missing data so we have to make some assumptions so as most of the data follows a norm normal distribution we would assume that this data is also following a normal distribution and we would say that okay a normal distribution has within one standard deviation a 68 percent of the values so as per the normal distribution within one standard deviation around the mean median and mode as for the normal distribution all are equal all mean median mode are at the same location and from the mean around one standard deviation we would have 68 percent of the values and as the question says missing values are spread along one standard deviation so 68 percent of the values are basically missing and question asks what percentage of data would remain unaffected and why so everything left after the 68 percent would remain unaffected so you would say 100 minus 68 that would be 32 so 32 percent of the values would remain unaffected by missing values you are given a cancer detection data set let's suppose when you build a classification model you achieved an accuracy of 96 percentage why shouldn't you be happy with your model performance what can you do about it so first thing is as this thing is mostly related to the domain of cancer detection uh, interview is trying to gauge you as how better you know as so how the accuracy of the models works in a different data distributions 
so if we look at the cancer detection domain in the cancer detection domain very few of your data points would have actual cancer so for example if you have a 1 million patients data out of that you would have like around 1000 of them would be having cancer so it's like a very small set of data is having actual cancer so let's assume we are creating a confusion matrix so when we create a confusion matrix we see that in the true positive which is just 1000 values so even if our model tries to identify like 500 of them so we'll get in the true positive 500 and let's assume in the true negative we are getting all the negative values which is 1 million minus 500 which went into the positives and everything remaining will go into negative so if you create the accuracy it is like 500 divided by whatever is there in the remaining parts so 500 is what you got a true positive values and something you will get in the true negative and when you divide it you will have a bigger accuracy so your model give like 98 percent 96 percent as your true positive is actually very small your true negative would be very large and small components will be there in the false positive and false negative so when you try to divide them you will have a bigger accuracy always so accuracy is not used in those cases where your distribution of positive cases is very less so in this case accuracy won't be helpful for us to evaluate the performance of our model so we have to go with other performance metrics which are available so for example we have recall we have precision recall is again called as the sensitivity again we have another as the specificity and f1 score so this different performance metrics will try to identify the model performance based on different components so accuracy is mostly useful when you have the classes which have some similar count when you have some similar count but not very smaller classes then your accuracy will be helpful but when you have very small positive class such as the cancer detection or the anomaly detection so again anomaly detection is a similar case where fraud detection basically so fraud detection is again a case of this case where we have very small number of values so we can't use accuracy in that case and we have to use the different performance metrics you are working on a time series data set your manager has asked you to build a high accuracy model you start with the decision tree algorithm since you know it works fairly well on all kinds of data later you tried a time series regression model and got higher accuracy than the decision tree model can this happen why so first thing as it is a time series uh, data time series data are mostly linear in nature so as the next value would be related with the previous value so let's assume we want to look at the stock prices so stock prices which are today are related with the yesterday so whatever value was there yesterday it is the either higher or lower as compared to what was there in the yesterday so as compared to this what decision models would do decision models would just try to identify some rules within your data so they would just do some rules which is very non-linear in nature if there is actually some proper patterns within rule the decision tree would really helpful but what the time series related regression should do it they would try to regress it based on the historic value as they are linearly correlated with the previous values the time series regressions would work by regressing it on the historic values so that's why time series regressions would be more accurate than the decision trees because we have a linearity available within the time series data suppose you found that your model is suffering from low bias and high variance which algorithm you think could tackle this situation and why so first thing so low bias and high variance so bias and variance are the term mostly used when so bias basically means you are getting bias to a specific set so when you have a higher bias your model is getting underfit it's not preferring anything and it's just underfitting your data and high variance is something where your model is very much overfitting to your data so in our case it says there is low bias and there is a high variance so our model is doing a overfit so first thing is we can use some kind of bagging algorithms so what these bagging algorithms do is they try to divide your data into multiple samples so those are samples with the replacement and each sample is trained with a decision tree so now what happens we are creating multiple trees which are trying to understand different patterns within the data set whatever data you are feeding whichever sample you are feeding whatever the patterns available within that sample 
each model is learning those things. So now you have a weak learners and when you combine those weak learners, you create a strong learner which will also try to reduce or overfitting and how it reduces the overfitting is as you're creating more and more models if some of them is trying to overfit the others will try to help to get balanced variance in this case the other technique that we have is we can use the regularization technique so regularization there are two types of regularization there is l1 regularization and there is l2 regularization those techniques we can use to penalize the model so what happens those try to penalize whenever your model goes for a higher variance it tries to penalize it by some parameters that we provided so based on those parameters it tries to restrict your model for going beyond the limited threshold of the overfitting so the regularization is the second technique and third is we can use the feature importance so we can use the different tree based techniques like we can use the random forest like feature importance techniques to select top features and we can use those to create a model so that our model will try to fit with those important features so when we try to add all the features some features may make our model very much overfitted and when we have a newer data it may not generalize well so when we try to identify which are the important features then our model will try to generalize well to the actual patterns which are there within the data so it's always better to go with feature importance try to select the features which are important then create our model on top of it so these are the three techniques that we can use to reduce the variance. You are given a data set. The data set contains many variables, some of which are highly correlated and you know about it. Your manager has asked you to run PCA. Would you remove correlated variable first and why? So most of the people would say that, okay, PCA we are using to reduce the multicollinearity. So removing the collinear variables, we won't use the PCA. But what happens is we are with the PCA, we are not just interested with the multicollinearity of the variables. Sometimes we are also interested with the variance which is available within the data. So what happens is PCA tries to explain a complete variance available within your data. So variance is something which says like the distributions within your data. So once you know that, PCA also gives you the eigenvector through this variance and you can use this variance to reduce the features which are available to you even when there is no multicollinearity. Even if you have some thousand features, there is no collinearity within the variables. When you use the PCA, and still in this case also, you will be able to reduce the size of your features to a lesser number. So PCA doesn't just has to be with the correlated variables. We can use it also just to reduce the columns length using the variances which are explained in the model. So you are asked to build a multiple regression model, but your model R square isn't as good as you wanted. For improvement, you remove the intercept term. Now your model R square becomes 0 0.8 from 0 0.3. Is it possible and how? So first thing, what is R square? So R square says how your linear regression model, how much of the variance out of the data it's trying to explain. So your data contains a variance and what percentage of variance your model is trying to explain the more the variance it is trying to explain the better is your model trying to represent your data so the formula if we see for the r square is r square is equal to 1 minus summation of y minus y hat which is the predicted values square upon y minus y mean square so intercept basically refers to the y mean so in actual the intercepts are representing the y mean and they're helping the model to maintain based on the y mean so in the presence of it we are creating a r square which is something different and when we are removing the y mean so when we are removing the intercept we are removing the y mean in our case as a denominator becomes small our r square would become big so as we remove the y mean our denominator would become small and as we are dividing by that our r square would become big but one thing that you have to be very sure in this case is this both the models are different. You cannot compare the model without the intercept and the model with the intercept. So this both the models are different and you have to tune them separately and you have to measure them separately. They cannot be compared as the one with the intercept and without the intercept are completely different in nature. You are asked to build a random forest model with 10,000 trees. So during its training, you got training error 
but on testing the validation error was 34.23 what is going on in this case haven't you trained your model perfectly so this was very good that right uh, got a 0.00 like 100 percent accuracy with the training data but when we try on the validation data set we say that it is there is an error of 34.23 of some metric for this case basically says is you are getting very much good performance on the training data but when you check it on the unseen data this unseen data is showing some different performance so this is a pure example of complete overfitting so what you are doing is your model is trying to learn mimic actual data within the training set it's just learning every pattern every corner of your data and it's trying to make actual and accurate predictions out of it but when we go for a newer data as it has got very much mimicking the training data so newer data may get the outer bounds and may not get a better prediction so we have to reduce the overfitting and try to make a model generalized so we can use these things that we have discussed earlier to reduce the overfitting within the data so we can use a different techniques that we have already discussed such as we can provide more data or we can reduce the number of trees which are there so as we are using more and more trees our model is getting overfitted to the data so in our case we have to use the lesser number of trees and see if our model gets generalized or not so people who brought this also brought recommendations seen on amazon is based on which algorithm so we have all seen on amazon that when we are looking at some product we get that okay people have also brought this kind of product what basically this means is whatever you are currently looking people who have brought that product or who have already viewed that product have also looked at the different products so based on those you are getting recommendations so there are two types of recommendation systems first is the collaborative filtering and second is the content based filtering in content based filtering what happens is whatever you have rated previously so based on that you will get a future recommendation so for example let's take an example of netflix in netflix you have watched some genre movie you have watched romantic movie for two to three times and you have given a better rating so what netflix would do based on whatever you have done whatever the content we have viewed earlier it will create a new recommendation for you so based on whatever you have done previously you will get a newer recommendations so that is the content based recommendation what we are seeing currently for this example it is collaborative filtering in collaborative filtering what happens is whatever you are doing or whatever you have done previously based on that you will be checked with the other users who have done similar activity and it will also check what are all different activities they have done and you have not done that it will try to recommend those things to you so if you see the example which is here it says that the user who's on bicycle has brought pizza and pasta similarly he is trying to be compared with the user who has done similar activity so in our case there is this user who has brought pizza pasta plus a coke so as the user has not brought coke he will be recommended this coke so this is the core of collaborative filtering so this is the technique which all the major e-commerce related companies use to recommend products to the users so even netflix is just uses the content based filtering for recommending the products based on the history that he have done but also he will be recommended based on the collaborative filtering as what all other users have done similarly and what they have done as a additional things so that's how the recommendation systems works just to summarize what we have done today so basically we have started with the three components three types of interview questions we started with the core machine learning components which involved more of a theoretical components in the machine learning the second was we looked into the python related questions on machine learning we saw some practical aspect what are the different components within python how we can write some python code how interviewer will try to gauge you how you can write the code and those things and the last part was scenario based questions so in that case we were trying to understand how based on the scenario which is given how would we choose different models how would we do the machine learning related task based on the scenario which is available to us so i hope you all enjoyed this session and have a good luck i hope you have enjoyed listening to this video please be kind enough to like it and you can comment any of your doubts and queries and we will reply them at the earliest do look out for more videos in our playlist 
and subscribe to Edureka channel to learn more. Happy learning!